The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Are we ready to proceed? Yes, Chair. Commissioners, the evidence you will hear this morning will concern the impact <coughs> of the recent bushfires on health, both acute and chronic. It is part of our insights into the impacts of the 2019-2020 bushfire season on people and communities. That evidence will also issue open issues in relation to natural, I withdraw that word, national coordination arrangements collaboration and standards to improve Australia's resilience to and recovery from the health impacts of natural disasters. These matters are relevant to paragraphs A, B and F of the letters pattern. We will return in depth to these issues at a later date, in particular to hear from the states and territories and the Commonwealth. The impact has been reflected in the almost 200 submissions received by the Commission to date that focused on health and mental wellbeing issues. In particular, they emphasise the compounding effect left by the drought, bushfires and now pandemic. The public submissions highlighted that the major stresses to people and communities during the bushfires were incorrect, outdated and unclear information provided during the emergency and the loss of internet and communication. Additional trauma is also being reported of struggling to access medical services. The Commission has been greatly assisted by the submissions. They have come not only from individuals and community organisations, but also medical professionals, academics and charities. Medical colleges and health bodies have also assisted us with detailed submissions, and we thank, in particular, the Royal Australian College of General Practitioners, the Royal Australasian College of Physicians, the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, the Royal Doctors Association of Australia, the Australian Academy of Health and Medical Sciences, the Pharmacy Guild of Australia, the Australian Healthcare and Hospitals Association and the National Rural Health Alliance. This list is by no means exhaustive. Council have met with representatives from some of these medical colleges and peak health bodies and we are grateful for their insights which have enabled the selection and presentation of today's topics. Commissioners, a note about the limitations of this morning's hearing into the insights of the impacts on people and communities. Those assisting you have not to date sought data or information from state or territory health departments, conscious as we are of their heavy burden in responding to the COVID-19 pandemic. We have only approached the Commonwealth Department of Health in the last fortnight for information, and we have been grateful for the rapidity with which they have engaged with the Royal Commission to enable today's hearing to proceed. We note too that there are concurrent and recent inquiries in relation to mental health in particular. The Productivity Commission's inquiry into mental health is due to report in June, and the Senate's Education and Employment References Committee delivered a report in only in February concerning the mental health of our first responders. These will be made to, available to your commissioners in due course. We understand too that the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare's report on the state of Australia's health, Australia Health 2020, will be published in July. We anticipate presenting relevant findings from these inquiries to inform preparation of your final report. Shortly, parties with leave to appear and others who might assist the Commission will be invited to provide comment on an issues paper which will be published by the Royal Commission on the health and mental health arrangements in the context of natural disasters in Australia. Submissions will be invited with a relatively long lead time for response. This will allow those impacted both by the questions and by COVID-19 to consider and respond while still enabling this Commission to continue its important inquiry work. <coughs> Commissioners, I will shortly call a panel of three witnesses. Before I do that, I, seek to I will tender the relevant evidence and at the conclusion of their evidence, I will read onto the record the relevant document ID codes for the parties granted leave to appear and others following the processes of the Commission. The first is a tender bundle of documents, document 2.1, which is identified in the tender list circulated to all parties with leave to appear, which is Professor Lisa Gibbs's witness statement and associated documents. Those would be numbered documents, uh, exhibits numbered 2.1.1 through to 
2.2.1.1. Oh, so I, sorry, Commissioner. It should be... Documents from 2.1.1 through to documents 2.1.4. So those, those documents will receive Thank you. A second witness today is Associate Professor Faye Johnston. Her document bundle is document bundle 2.2, and those will be exhibits 2.2.1 and 2.2.1.1. And the third witness today is Dr Penelope Burns. Her exhibit bundle is 2.3 and her documents exhibit codes will be documents 2.3.1 through to 2.3.2. Thank you. Commissioners, I call Professor Lisa Gibbs, Associate Professor Faye Johnston and Dr Penelope Burns. Their evidence will be taken concurrently. Commissioners. Good morning, Professor Gibbs, Associate Professor Johnston and Dr Burns. Thank you for joining us this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Doctors, I'll morning. ask... Sorry. Doctors... The first thing we will do is um, I'll ask each of you uh, to take an oath or affirmation in turn. Dr Gibbs, we, oh, sorry, Professor Gibbs, will you take an oath or affirmation? Yes. Oath or affirmation? Uh, I beg your pardon, affirmation. Thank you. Associate. Professor Gibbs, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. And Dr Burns, we take turn to you. You take an oath or affirmation. Affirmation, please. Dr Burns, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And Professor Johnston, will you take an oath or affirmation? Um, an affirmation as well. Professor Johnston. Do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, I do. Thank you. Doctors, what I propose to do is have take you each of you to your statements and then I'll invite each of you to address the commissioners with respect to the work that is detailed in your very detailed written statements. And then I propose um, in respect of each of you to invite the commissioners if they have any questions and then to invite all of you to uh, respond to questions as a group. Professor Gibbs, you provided a written witness statement dated 22 May 2020 under a notice issued by the commission. Yes, that's correct. And are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, they are. Thank you. Dr Burns, you provided a witness statement dated 22 May 2020 under a notice issued by the Commission, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes, that's correct. And Dr Johnston? You provided a witness statement dated 23 May 2020 under a notice issued by the Commission, is that correct? Yes. And are the contents of that document true and correct? Uh, yes, they are. Professor Gibbs, I'll turn to you first because as the Commissioners have been advised, you have another commitment at 11 o'clock and we, wish to, um, we don't wish to deter you from that important work. Could you describe to the Commissioners um, your You've provided a number of submissions, and you've been participate. You've participated in the preparation of a, num of a number of reports. Um, primary of which is the Beyond Bushfires study, which is a longitudinal study of the impact of the 2009 Victorian Black Saturday bushfires. Um, the commissioners will be aware that you're a professor of public health at the University of Melbourne, 
and that your research work into the impact of natural disasters on mental health and wellbeing is a long-term research focus. The commissioners would be uh, have read in detail uh, the material in your statement, but the commissioners would be interested to understand the, um, the scope of the work and the extent to which it's been updated by more recent work, which I understand has been um, submitted for peer review publication. Okay, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to, to address the Commission. I, I guess I, you know, given I can only give a, a very brief overview statement to start with, I'd like to just note that when we're thinking about the recent season of bushfires, that it's still very early days in the recovery. Um, certainly one of the recommendations from our research is that that we always think in at least a five-year recovery framework from a major disaster because that's the reality of, of the, the process it takes. And that's not to, to suggest that, um, not to under, understate people's capacity to be resilient because actually we see extraordinary capacity for people to process very distressing events and major disruptions. But there is no question from our research from the Black Saturday bushfires that if someone has experienced a major hazard event, like the bushfires we've just seen, they are at greater risk of mental health problems in the years afterwards. And when we're reporting on the mental health problems, we're, we're talking about where people have reported symptoms that are consistent with a diagnosable mental illness. But we know from our um, discussions with community that actually there's a whole spectrum of experiences and those mental health um, symptoms that people, mental illness symptoms that people are reporting are at one end of the spectrum. And actually there's a, there's a whole range of, of impacts on wellbeing that happen at a subclinical level as well. So our concern is that they can be, they can be lasting. <coughs> and for years, not just months, so when we think about the original event, uh, the risks of those sort of mental health impacts really arise or are, are amplified if someone feared that they were going to lose their lives, if they lost someone close to them, and if they lost their property, then that places them in a, in a higher risk category. But we also see that what happens after the event is also a really significant risk factor. And this is part of the disruptions that we see in the aftermath of these sort of mass trauma events, where people are dealing with change of income, change of accommodation, relationship breakdown because of the strain of what's going on, potentially exposure to violence. All of these factors undermine people's capacity to, to deal with what's happening. So they may have dealt with the, the bushfire itself, but it's everything that comes afterwards that, that starts to bring them undone. And that's a real concern, but it's also an opportunity because there are ways that we can reduce those impacts, ways that we can support people in dealing with those changes and disruptions. The other opportunity that I would see is in terms of um, the social influences on people's recovery. We found that family and friends were the most important resource that people drew on, but also the, the greatest source of concern for people. And so some support in dealing with caring for self and others would be helpful, understanding how that works in a post-trauma environment. The, the importance of the neighbour networks and the, and the friend networks are really uh, strong, but also belonging to local community groups. We found that that was, a, you know, almost a surprising level of benefit for people. If they belong to a local community group, they tended to have better mental health and wellbeing three to five years later. If they belong to more than one community group, they had additional benefits. And that continued, although it does reach a point that if you belong to many groups, you're probably overdoing it. And that's often the people who are on the committees and running those groups. And so they bear uh, a bit of a burden in keeping the groups running for everybody else. 
But we did also find that in a community where there were lots of people who belonged to local groups, the benefits started to extend to others in the community. And we think that there's something going on there about increased trust and reciprocity, support going on at a community level that is essentially the picture of a resilient community. And so while we, uh, you know, I think it's fantastic that there's increased understanding now of the mental health impacts of these events and absolute importance of the role of mental health professionals in supporting people who need that level of support, let's not forget the important differences that can be made by supporting those natural community networks that are already in place and can be supported to, to keep operating and that can maintain a level of wellness in those communities. I guess the, the other thing I'd like to, to mention in my opening statement is the impacts on children, teenagers and school community. We're all concerned about um, what does this mean for the kids? Um, how can we make a difference? And certainly in our research, we've found that the exposure to the event and the aftermath did undermine children's sense of safety and stability, sometimes at a quite fundamental level of realising that your parents can't keep you safe. Um, and while, like adults, many children are able to, to process what's happened and adapt, we did see patterns of ongoing anxiety, particularly when there are additional demands um, required of children. And that might be a change from primary to secondary school or um, a different joining a different sports club. It, it depends on the, the child what, what that means for them. But I guess of great concern is our research where we tracked the academic impacts on students and we found that um, there was clear impacts on capacity for, for students to learn in the years after the bushfires and then when they got back on track with their ability to retain information and to, to learn at the rate that you would expect, we, we found that they got behind other students, got behind their peers, so that really it, there is a pattern, not for all students in these high impact areas, but certainly an elevated risk that their academic trajectories are, are changed um, on an ongoing basis. And that will clearly have implications in terms of employment as well. So the school communities are really fundamentally impacted by these events and the, the level of support that's required for teachers and students is, is quite significant. The challenge is that we don't yet have evidence about what will make the difference and that's my concern. There's been a, a fabulous emergence of, of resilience programs for schools. Now we need to build evidence about what makes a difference. So I guess there's a lot more there that we can discuss. I'll wrap it up at this point and recognise that the season we've had in many ways is similar to the to the to the scale and intensity of the of the Black Saturday bushfires, but also has its own characteristics where we see different groups affected in different ways and the complexity of recovery within a pandemic context. So more to discuss there. Thank you. Commissioners? No, I thought that was a very good and concise uh, summary there. I think we'll, we'll continue. If other if questions come up, we'll, uh, we'll ask them later on. Commissioner Bennett, have you got one there? I do, um, and I'm not sure whether it's best to ask them now of Professor Gibbs, because some of them may also be matters that mm. um, impact upon, you know, what the other what the other witnesses are saying. Perhaps, perhaps I might just ask... Um, Professor Gibbs in relation to the fourth aspect of the work that she didn't touch on in her opening statement, which links to the reason why she needs to leave by 11. Uh, and that might... And that well, then might I may ask then a couple of questions to Professor Gibbs. But arise um, from after, that. After that, thank you. <laughs> yes. Um, 
Professor Gibbs, you've been involved in a project called the RECAP project um, that builds in part on the data and findings of your work from the Beyond Bushfire study and the related research. Uh, could you just explain or uh, identify what, what that project is and, uh, and what you'll be doing it from 11 today? Oh, yes, absolutely. So um, what we try and do with our research is work really closely with the people in the field and 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 the process there is to to find out what evidence do they need to inform their work and then to generate that evidence and feed it back to them so that they can be engaged in evidence informed practice. Uh, so we were commissioned to do the recap project in partnership with Massey University in New Zealand to map the evidence against the different domains of recovery that need to be considered in the in the community context. And so to recognise that we're often working in silos in supporting people after a disaster, but in their lives, they're having to deal with all of the different aspects of recovery. And this is represented in the recovery capitals by um, social capital, natural capital, financial, built, political and cultural and human capital, all of those things together uh, um, will influence how people fare in the long term. So what we've done is map evidence arising from Australian um, research as well as New Zealand research against those different capitals so that we can, we can with some confidence say well, if you're working with people in relation to social capital, these are some things you may need to consider in the field. And so this is a, you know, an iterative process working with our end user organisations. Okay. okay, thanks. Um, Professor Gibbs, a couple of things. First, I note that you made at the end of your statement some very specific and very helpful um, recommendations arising out of your work. And I'm not going to take you through those now. I found them very helpful. Thank you. I mean, the whole statement was terrific, and thank you for that. But I did, um, I did find that very helpful for, for us, or for me personally, um, where you actually make specific recommendations. But from what you've just said today, I've got a couple of a couple of questions, if I may. Some of them are timing sure. issues that you raised yourself. I note in your statement you refer to the fact that it takes people about two years to start rebuilding. And, you know, I was wondering, I guess, I mean, I'm going to put it all together and then get you to answer um, whether or not that has an impact as a turning point in, you know, that, that going from the negative, you know, maybe living in outside accommodation to that, even though you're still living outside, to that positive moment of at least, you know, turning into it, positively starting to rebuild and that matters such as that, if you've had any observation on that with the timing of the recovery. Um, the, other, the other questions really relate to, um, again, my la the last point you made about the time to get evidence as to what makes a difference, um, especially with children. I'm turning to the children thing now. Um, what do we, I guess my question for that is, what do we do in the meantime? I mean, you know, it'll take time to get these studies, and yet we've got at the moment, we've got still in the um, immediate post-recovery stage and, you know, as new desire, what does one do until one gets those answers? Yeah. Um, so far as children are concerned, and I found that quite, I mean, that, that concept of, of the special effects on children and the concept that, you know, the concern that parents can't keep them safe. I found um, that that is quite profound. But again, now just thinking, I suppose, about COVID, um, is the impact on children of perhaps concurrent or immediately sequential disasters? You know, having, having COVID come on back of the bushfire recovery, a matter such as that, if you've got any observations. And the one other thing, if I may, just to add them all in together so you can do a, a holistic one. Um, the other thing that we've heard about is the impact on people um, after, the, after the disaster of having to retell their story multiple times um, when they're dealing uh, with, with um, access to, to different... Um, opportunities for recovery, and I was wondering if any of your work um, can ad has addressed or can address those factors. I'm sorry to lumber them all in together, but I thought it might help actually if you just think, you know, if you deal with them whichever way you want. Thank you very much. Sure, thank you. 
Um, and I should have said also in talking about the RECAP project that we're actually about to release resources that will help our recovery workers in the communities right now to guide their work. And that was why today's meeting is so important. Um, but um, the first thing you mentioned about was, was the rebuild. And I'm really glad you mentioned that because this is a, a point of tension often between public expectations and the reality within those communities. I think it's a very visible thing that people need to be back in homes. So if they've, if their homes have been damaged or, or destroyed, it's, it feels like a marker of recovery that they're back in, in a, a home again. And obviously it's incredibly difficult to be living in sheds and, and temporary accommodation and all of those things. But it's also incredibly difficult to make really important decisions when you've got bushfire brain, as, as people often refer to it. So the trauma fog is, is not a, a time when it's easy or, or sensible to be making um, serious decisions. I remember hearing the story of a, a family that were, were, you know, a car was donated to them and they were, all they had to do was go to the car yard and pick the colour of the new car. There were two colours available. It was beyond them to choose the colour. That's how, how, you know, the brain goes when, they, when you're in that sort of overwhelming situation. So to, to choose a new home and go through that rebuild process, really difficult. So I should be more concise. My point is that what we found interesting in our data was that regardless of when people started their rebuild, they were typically happy with when they started. And so it is about allowing people to, to move at the time that works for them. Sometimes when people moved quickly and they got into their new home, it didn't feel like home and they realised they still hadn't processed um, what had happened. So. My suggestion is that we need to provide the supports to allow people to move at the pace that works for them. The question about um, student programs and what do we do when we still don't have strong evidence about what makes a difference. What we need to do is have an appraisal criteria to assess what is promising in the programs that are available. And there's different reasons why a program might be considered promising. It may be that they've already done some evaluations that, that indicate that it's it's likely to, to make a difference. It may be that it's just really strongly based on theory and and replicates another a model in another field. It may be that it's a low intensive but can it can it be reached can reach many people. So I think there needs to be a clear appraisal criteria, but there also needs to be dollars to support evaluations of the programs that are rolled out. And it's very rare to have adequate funding for um, rigorous evaluation. So that's a factor. The other thing in terms of, um, you know, students' sense or children's sense of safety being fundamentally um, undermined is that it's very instinctive to want to protect our kids. And so in doing so, sometimes we treat them as passive and vulnerable. But actually to feel safe, we know ourselves, to feel safe means that you understand what's going on and you know how you're supposed to deal with it. So part of restoring a sense of safety is actually making sure our kids understand what's going on and have a role in contributing to recovery, to preparedness. And there are some really great um, disaster resilience programs that can support that process. And, and the other thing to think about with these programs for, for young people is that while many of them should be school-based, makes sense, the school is the community hub, it's where they're spending a lot of their time, our highest risk students are not going to be attending school. They're the ones who will be absent and will start to refuse. They might move around schools um, and they're the ones who will not be getting the benefit of these school-based programs. So we really need to think about community-based programs as well that families can access if their child is not able to attend school in the um, as a result of what they've experienced. Uh, and I'm just checking what else 
you queried. Uh, the complex recovery is something that we're really still learning about. And we, one of the things that I'm really committed to is doing research on the post-disaster impacts for students and comparing our bushfire-affected communities with our general school communities so we can learn about the added risks of um, disaster exposure because all of our students are experiencing school closures from the pandemic. What does that look like for our bushfire-affected students? Um, and we're just in the process at the moment of, of trying to secure extra funding for that. But, you know, I, I'm expecting there'll be diversity within that because I would imagine for some students it's been quite nurturing to be able to be home-based with their schooling in the aftermath of the bushfires, depending on the state of their family and their home. There will be some homes that where there's an increase in family violence, and that's an awful reality. Um, but there'll be other homes where it is comforting for students to, to be at home with their families while they process what's happened from the bushfires. So we need to learn more about that. And the, the final point that you raised about the issue of retelling the trauma experience, I could comment on that from what I'm aware of, but I have to declare that it's not my area of expertise. I'm not a clinician, so I think it's probably best that I don't comment. Thank you very, very much indeed. Okay, thank you, Professor McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you, Professor Gibbs. That was really helpful this morning and through your witness statement. Um, Two quick questions. I just told the chair one, so apologies, Mark. Um, the first one is you mentioned in your submission or statement um, about the idea of creating a communication register. I just wondered if you knew any examples of where that's been done and done well. No, that's a really good point because it would have to be, and I could check with my New Zealand colleagues if they've had something similar. But typically what we find is that um, is that where there are people who have been evacuated, for instance, there's often police will keep a record of, of who was involved or um, where there's been loss of property and people are, are entitled to grants, there'll be a, a government record of that. So it's not that there's no information collected about these people who are affected, it's that it typically can't be shared. And, and it becomes outdated very quickly because people move and, and circumstances change. So it's just because so much happens in the immediate aftermath and, and is relevant to what's happening then, but not with consideration for what is needed in the years afterwards. And it became very clear to us that there's an opportunity to just be able to let people know of what services, programs, et cetera, are available that they may be interested in, but we had no way of reaching them. So it, it just seems a pretty simple thing in today's day and age where we have everything online that people self-register as an interested party so that they can be notified of opportunities. Yeah, thank you. Um, following up on the same topic, for these you know, leavers, these people, either visitors who, who are in there temporarily and then leave afterwards, and, and also people who are permanent residents and then leave subsequent to the event, through your advisory roles, do you know whether these sorts of people have been extended assistance by governments and charities? Particularly the holiday makers, uh, for example, on the south coast or, or down in other places? As far as I, I don't know for the current events, I know that for um, the previous events, there's often special arrangements made. So, for example, I know that the Victorian government um, had a, a support process for people who are affected by the Bali bombing. So they've come back, they've dispersed to their various homes, but there was a system set in place to connect with them and provide support. So. My understanding is that it's event specific. 
Um, and what was particularly notable for us where we had a look at the, the people who stayed living in their community versus those who did relocate and go elsewhere was that um, the, the source of information was seemed to be coming from the original place of residence. So if they were still connected to the town, notifications, rather than it being available elsewhere. If there was very little available for the families of people affected. So if they'd lost a family member in the fires, but they themselves lived out of the community, they often were not aware of what was happening. So there does seem to be um, a gap in the sy systemic approach um, for those who live outside of the affected areas. Thanks, Professor. Professor, just uh, one one question. It came up in the one of the community forums that we had, where a family had been staying with uh, grandparents, I think, and children. And at the end of the uh, the fires, they returned home, but the home was actually a couple of states away, and so they were uh, separate to the community that was uh, attempting to uh, to rebuild and had had issues trying to access support for the the children. Are there mechanisms that you know available for families that might be uh, disconnected like that but, but have truly uh, suffered trauma? Uh, I'm probably not the best person to respond to that, but, but certainly there is this... The, the, the recognition of who and how people are affected is really complex. And there is a sort of a a notion of a hierarchy of loss, which determines who is entitled to particular services and who, who isn't, and that can be problematic. Um, but I couldn't comment on the particular systems that are in place for that. No, and I appreciate that. I didn't want to put you on a, on a spot, but I, I do appreciate you giving us uh, a very good summary of the complexity uh, around recovery. Uh, in particular with children, but it, it actually relates right across the, the community and highlight that the recovery takes time, yet there's always pressures to try and recover quickly and move on. Uh, and many communities mm. uh, are in a recovery when the next disaster hits. And uh, and so that uh, that adds to that, that complexity as well. And I'm sure your studies are bringing those those issues out. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, and there's something that that seems to have emerged with the, the recent season that I think needs attention. And that is, and I cl included it in my statement, that is a, the perception of these disasters has changed. They're no longer perceived as rare events. They're, they're often seen as climate change and they're a part of our new reality. And we don't know how that's going to affect recovery because the sense of hope and sense of self and community efficacy are really important parts of people's ability to deal with what's happened and to get back on track. So if that's undermined by a sense of, well, this is going to keep happening, how are we going to deal with that? I think that's, that's a real concern that requires further understanding. No, thank you for that. Definitely. Commissioner Bennett? Just, just pause my mm. Sorry, we are just having a bit of a, a sidebar there. Um, <laughs> Professor Gibbs, thank you very much for that. Ms hogan -Doran. Commissioners, it may be um, of assistance to you if we go next to Dr Burns, who may be able to respond to some of these questions in, in her opening statement. Dr Burns, you're a general practitioner working in general practice in Sydney, and you're also working in a local respiratory clinic supporting the COVID-19 pandemic response, but you've worked in the field of disaster medicine for over a decade and indeed have a Masters of Public Health and Tropical Medicine majoring in disaster medicine. Um, if you could give some insights to the commissioners about your, your key roles and your involvement in disaster medicine and, and perhaps also take on some of the questions that were put to D Professor Gibbs um, from your own experience in the 2013 uh, bushfires and 2009 bushfires in Victoria. 
Thank you. Yes, yeah, so look, my uh, I guess my experience also includes the fact that I'm um, doing a PhD at ANU at the moment looking at the health consequences of disasters and also um, GP um, capacity and capability in disasters as well. Um, and I guess I, I, I do, um, I echo a lot of what uh, Dr. Professor Gibbs says. I, um, I guess as from a GP perspective, I think the important way that I see this, and I've seen this over the last 10 years, um, has been that that uh, disasters are very much an individual experience and they're a person-centred experience. And so from a general practice perspective, um, what we experience of people going through disasters is that they are um, experiencing these disasters in their own context and it's just part of their um, journey through life, if you like, and through health and well-being. And so I've seen observations from, for example, the Brisbane floods um, where um, the help that some people might need is slightly different to the help that other people might need. So whereas some people might need very practical assistance, getting farms and fences back up, then other people might need um, more sort of support with counselling and things like that. So I guess I'd just like to echo Professor Gibbs' um, statements that disasters happen and continue to happen and personal events in people's lives continue to happen and that, um, that nothing stops. So during the New South, during the Victorian bushfires, for example, in 2009, um, we saw soon after that the, the um, swine flu or the H1N1 pandemic come through. So we have this pattern of repetition. Um, we were um, very much focused on drought before the bushfire came, um, and then we've had flooding. And so in all the communities around Australia, there's this rolling um, experience of disasters. I guess my main um, contribution to this is the general practice perspective. Um, I've been working in this field for a long period of time. Um, and I, um, when I originally started, I, I came with some personal experience of disasters. And what I noticed was that although we have um, about 40,000 GPs scattered around Australia, who work in local communities um, who are there when the actual disaster strikes, they are actually not systematically included into that response. Um, and so over the last decade, I've noticed that there's been very limited ad hoc involvement of GPs and little formal inclusion. And I think the really important thing um, to remember about um, resilience and disaster response is that um, the emphasis is often on building local capacity and supporting local capacity. And I think that um, in terms of addressing some of the questions already made, supporting local community and local healthcare professionals to build their own capacity and have them linked into that, that person's journey. And they, they are trusted people. We, we've got many stories of um, post-2009 um, Victorian bushfires, post-2013 the 2013 bushfires, of people flooding in to a trusted healthcare professional that they know. The waiting rooms were packed with people who were in distress. And so I think it's important to realise that on the ground when that happens, there are already some valuable healthcare professionals who are not yet currently included very well in that response. I want to uh, go to doc, the Dr. Burns, picture. can I just, I'll just uh, interrupt you there. That, that's an interesting yeah. point because we're seeing a variety uh, across the, the country and across uh, regions about uh, where uh, local GPs have been included in the, the planning uh, and response very well and others where it's actually been the exact opposite. Can you comment on what the barriers may be to GPs not being included in the planning up front, please? Yeah, so what's, I'm, I'm hoping that um, what we have seen is over the last decade we've seen um, gradual improvement in that and we have definitely, um, so in my report I talk about the 2013 bushfires and that's where we had, um, we, we had a, actually had a, an, an ad hoc response that sort of developed as it went. And so what happened was um, uh, a GP liaison officer, and that was myself, I was invited into the um, State Health Emergency Operations Centre, and that provided a communication link with the state um, down to the local level. We had a very proactive um, PHN that responded in an intuitive way to involve the GPs, and they also had a good link with the LHD, and so that, that worked well. So they, GPs were actually... Um, spontaneously included in quite a good system for inclusion in that disaster um, response. And so following that, um, plans were developed um, and a document was created that was actually presented at the World Association of Disaster and Emergency Medicine Conference last year. Um, 
and is actually sort of leading the way in this field internationally, if you like, um, about methods in which um, GPs can be included through PHNs. This is only just happening. And so the, the reason it's different around different communities is that it's involved um, a lot of effort and a lot of work in one area that's already experienced disaster and then the sort of the development of systems that might work. So this is still an evolving process and this hasn't happened with all PHNs. I am aware um, in the middle of February there was a meeting of um, New South Wales State, for example, PHNs, and the idea there was to share that information and to continue to help um, PHNs um, you sort of statewide develop their planning. So this is, it's an evolving process as we try and establish ways to include GPs in disasters. Can I just take you up on that? When you say it's an evolving process, so there are discussions going, picking up on the Chair's question of what are the barriers, can I ask you what sort of thing is said as to be the reasons why you would not include GPs in a recovery situation or an immediate post-disaster situation? So I guess what, what are people saying are the reasons? Um, okay, so I've done, um, I've sort of interviewed disaster managers and GPs um, following um, about six different disasters around Australia and including the Christchurch earthquakes. Um, GPs are a, a private organisation. They are not part of the public health structure. And so in the planning, the preparedness, my understanding at the moment is that a lot of that goes through that, that sort of silo, if you like, um, and so it is, it's quite difficult then to reach outside and include more private groups in that. So I, this, is, this, is a, um, this is a discussion that's been going on over the last decade, and I'm, I'm afraid I don't have the correct answer to this. Um, it would require, and I've suggested this in my submission, I think um, including GPs and inviting them to the table at every level of disaster planning. So I would see that would be at the national level, um, at the state level, and at the local level. Uh, thank, Is that answer yeah, I think that's that's good. I, I mean, it's interesting that that's the sort of lens looking down. But if you're a part of the community, you would look at all the providers and, and think that they all should be a, a part of this, and the, and the community wouldn't understand what those uh, those delineations are. So, thank you very much for for clarifying that. So, if I could if I could use the 2013 bushfires as an example, um, or, or the, 2000, the 2013 bushfires um, worked well because there was a close liaison between the LHD and the PHN. It also worked well because we had disaster managers um, in the State Health Emergency Management Unit who were keen to involve disasters. And so stepping in as a GP liaison officer was a new role in that situation. And all of this was being developed as we went. Um, and. Um, I guess policy and, and job descriptions and roles were being developed. But what it created was what we didn't have before, which was we had a really good communication chain between the State Health Emergency Operations Centre down to the local um, PHN and then across to some of the um, GP organisations such as the RACGP and the AMA so that there was a combined group effort to support the GPs. It gave really valuable information at the time as to what GPs were experiencing on the ground, and that was fed up through the PHN to the LHD and also up through the GP liaison officer to the State Health Emergency Management Unit. And that gave extra information such who were more who were the more vulnerable people, did they need assistance, um, what were the GPs seeing on the ground. Um, it provided GPs as eyes and ears, if you like, as to what was happening in the middle of those communities because they are part of the communities. So it also Dr. provided. Dr. Sorry. sorry, sorry, Dr. Burns. I, I, I don't. I do want. To, don't want to interrupt your, you, you. But I know Professor Gibbs is going, and I would. Oh, yes, be, sure. I'd be very grateful if Professor Gibbs could make a comment before she leaves on what we're now discussing from your perspective. Bearing in mind, Professor Gibbs, that you did refer to the importance of local and community um, support and and um, engagement in recovery. I just wondered if you could give us a comment on Dr Burns's description of the of the utilisation of GPs in the um, immediate recovery processes and longer term recovery processes. Uh, I totally support the suggestion that GPs should be contributing to decisions about what's happening locally and feeding that up and, and also having an influence at higher levels. I just, you know, also support the the, the I know from the witness statement that um, that they it needs to be trauma informed 
GPs that are part of that process, that we can't expect GPs without that training to be able to engage meaningfully. I think that's unfair to them and also unfair to the process. So there are some excellent um, training programs around at the moment for, for health professionals, including the ones offered by Phoenix Australia. And um, and that, that I would suggest that needs to be part of that process, but I'm, I'm sure that's, you know, what has been suggested already. Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry, Dr Burns. I just want to catch Professor Gibbs before yeah. she left. No, that's actually really valuable because um, as part of the PHN, the, the Pen Blue Mountains PHN plan that we had, that, that's been um, created um, and is a living document, that has involved um, a group of GPs that have um, provided um, an expression of interest in being involved in, say, um, going, attending evacuation centres. And those GPs, part of that is that they've been strongly supported with training in NIMS. Um, major incident medical management support and that's understanding of disaster systems which you need to have and also with mental health support around uh, and training around psychological first aid um, and other issues um, in that. So I agree. Okay, thank you. Dr Burns, is there anything else you'd like to, to add there before we go to Professor Johnston? Um, no, I, I think that's that's enough. No, that was a good 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 summary. Okay, just one more yeah. Sorry. Sorry, just one more question for Dr. Burns. Um, just you did talk about the fact there are discussions taking place and that there is an you know it's an evolving process. Are you aware yourself of any other areas other than the one that you've been directly involved in that have utilised um, GPs the way um, the way you have either in New South Wales or indeed across across the country? Um, I'm very aware that there are other um, PHNs that are very organised um, and are organising at the moment, and I have had contact with um, uh, one or two um, PHN in Victoria following the bushfires who were were very organised. Um, but I guess um, the in general, um, I think this is a new space. The Medicare locals existed before the PHNs and before that GP divisions. And so PHNs have only been around for a number of years. I'll be, I can't give you the number of years. And they have been really busy trying to work out what their scope of practice is. Um, and I think that's, um, that's now evolving. And so for, for areas that haven't ha experienced disasters, um, there's been less impetus, I guess, to get involved in that area. But I think now with the recent events, um, there's been a strong, um, strong move to include all um, groups. I must say that a lot of our lessons learnt are coming from New Zealand. Um, I, I'm um, co-chair of the World Association of Disaster Emergency Management Special Interest Group um, in primary care, um, which is very newly formed, which also shows how new this idea of including primary care in disasters is. Um, and I, internationally, and I work with a lot of international GPs, my main awareness is um, New Zealand, um, who are um, in Canterbury, um, in Christchurch, they've been very well incorporated into disaster planning and preparedness um, and were very involved during the earthquakes. So there are examples around, um, but um, it's a matter of slowly moving them into process. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms Hogan-Doran. And Professor Gibbs. <coughs> If you need to just dial off in the course of uh, Professor Johnston's, um, we'll we'll uh, we'll just proceed. Professor yes, I need to probably drop out now. Thank you. Thank you so much for your assistance. Professor Johnston, you're a public health physician and environmental epidemiologist, and you're head of the Environmental Health Research Group at the Menzies Institute for Medical Research at the University of Tasmania. Commissioners, we had a substantial number of submissions from members of the community as well as members of the of health organisations and charities directly discussing the impacts of the bushfire smoke on Australians. And many were concerned with the impact of prolonged exposure to bushfire smoke on their health and the health of their families. Uh, Professor Johnson, this is your particular area of expertise and interest, and if you might provide an opening statement to the commissioners that, that captures the work that you're doing and the concerns and issues that you've identified. Um, yes, thank you, and thank you for the opportunity um, to speak and contribute today. 
I've been researching the healthy effects of bushfire smoke and similar hazards for about 20 years now. And um, I guess one point about them is that Australia has, is a very flammable environment. Fires are part of our environment and smoke is a part of our environment. So it's um, something we live with regardless and, um, and regardless of whether there is also an emergency where fires are threatening communities. So it's, it's a hazard that causes harm in a lot of different contexts, in fire emergencies, in planned burning and in fires that don't threaten communities. Um, and it's an unusual hazard in that it transports itself. Smoke can travel hundreds of kilometres and affect communities hundreds, sometimes thousands of kilometres from where the fires are. And by nature of that, it affects numerically far more people than the actual fire. It can, you know, the case in point, of course, was our last season where it was our estimate was 80% of the population of Australia were adversely affected by smoke from these fires. Um, so smoke, just to explain a bit about the nature of the hazard, um, it's made up of, it's a complex mixture. It's combustion and incomplete combustion of hydrocarbons. And there's hundreds of chemicals contained in smoke, gases and very small suspended particles, often um, carbon-based particles. And um, there's health evidence about all of these constituents, but the one that's really important for public health and the public health impacts are the suspended particles, particularly the very tiny particles. And by tiny particles, I'm talking about ones that are less than um, particulates, I should say, just because I might lapse into this terminology, are often known as particulate matter or PM. PM is a very common abbreviation used. Um, so it's a marker for the whole toxic mix of smoke. PM 2.5 is a size class of these suspended particles, and it's particles that are less than 2.5 micrometres in diameter, a micrometre being a one one-thousandth of a millimetre. So tiny particles, not able to see them, go into your lungs, cause problems in the lungs, can go into the bloodstream and cause problems throughout the body. Um, but initially, and to explain how they cause health impacts, um, the kind of responses they produce in the body are relatively small and subtle. And this is one of the um, particular public health issues with smoke. In, in any one individual, it might be a small response. The body will perceive the smoke particles in the same way. It, it will detect a burn or an injury or a virus. It will set off the body's immune responses. It will set off inflammation. It will cause stress responses, and it's all of these responses that do the harm. In a healthy individual, they can be subtle and they'll go away when the smoke goes away. In a person at higher risk, they can precipitate serious illness and death. Um, so what I mean by that is if you already have asthma, if you already have chronic lung disease, and you inhale some smoke, even a modest amount of air pollution that might not bother anyone else, that can make that condition worse, and in some people it will make it bad enough to send them to hospital. Um, similarly, heart disease is very common in our community. If you're already at high risk of a heart attack for whatever reason, then an increase in particles in the air and the changes your body makes in response to that, and those changes include things like abnormalities of your heart rhythm, an increased tendency for your blood to clot, both those things can cause a heart attack or a cardiac arrest and cause deaths. So we've got a lot of people in these higher vulnerable groups in society and the health impacts of smoke are disproportionately um, felt by people in these higher risk groups. And there's other higher risk groups for other reasons, older people be mainly because they've got um, a greater range of chronic diseases um, by the time you get to the final stages of life or even the latter um, stages. And young people. Young people, the risk is slightly different. Unborn babies, babies and young children are developing their systems. And because they're still developing, they're vulnerable to environmental insults. We know this very well from studies of passive smoking, cigarette smoking, urban air pollution. Um, and there's been much less work done with severe smoke events. But the bits of work that have been done 
show fairly consistent results. And um, I've done some of that work myself following babies and children after the smoke event associated with the Hazelwood coal mine fire. Uh, so that's health impacts. Um, I guess how that plays out, so we get measure. The other thing is um, the relationship between the amount of smoke and the health impacts if you measure it at a community level. Um, for many health outcomes, these relationships are quite well established from studies of particulate matter from a whole range of sources. And in, in general, particulate matter that comes from a fire has a very similar size of impact. It's generally worse for lung problems. It's more irritating. But for heart problems or deaths, it's pretty similar. So we know, for example, that a 10-unit rise in PM2.5, it will be associated with an approximate 1% increase in deaths in the community. And we know that it's generally a straight line relationship. You know, that's quite a modest rise. If it rises 100 or 200, you could expect a 10 to 20% increase in the death rate on those days. So although death is a really rare outcome from smoke, if you've got a lot of smoke and a lot of people, then it becomes measurable. And um, what I did want to share with you was with my group, we did make an estimate of the impacts of the summer bushfires. In fact, for the last 20 summer bushfire seasons, um, but this last season in particular, and it's, um, it's early days, the actual studies that need to be done to get the death data and look at the health data um, haven't been done yet. What we did was looked at the amount of pollution over the entire summer period, and we were able to attribute PM to bushfires as their source, as the summer bushfires. And then we were able to work out the size of the population affected by the smoke each day and the amount of smoke each day, and then apply the known relationships between admissions to hospital and increases in PM2.5 from smoke and deaths and also attendances to emergency departments for asthma. And, um, and when we did this for the last season, if we looked at all states of Australia, we, we actually did two analyses, one just the eastern states and one for all states, including West Australia, South Australia and Tasmania, where there were also fires. The results are pretty similar. The vast majority of the impacts were in the eastern states. But uh, we found that there were 445 deaths attributable, excess deaths attributable to smoke from these fires, uh, 3,340 admissions to hospital for heart and lung related problems, and 1,373 additional um, presentations to an emergency department for asthma. So, so these, these are modelled estimates. Uh, they don't include a whole range of other health impacts like symptoms like uh, loss of work time, missing school, needing medications, um, impacts on diabetes, impacts on ambulance call-outs, for example, but these are the ones where there was enough evidence to be able to model the impacts. Um, the other point was that we could attribute a cost, their standard costs associated with value of the statistical life and the cost of an admission for respiratory, excuse me, respiratory illness. Um, so we were able to work out a yearly cost, which I spoke for each summer season, and the costs that we um, calculated, our estimates for the last season, were at $2 billion in health costs associated with premature loss of life and admissions to hospitals. And that's about 10 times higher. There's fluctuation year to year, of course, with fire activity. But that was a major departure from anything we'd seen in the previous um, 20 years. Um, so that's on health impacts and why they can be so important from smoke. Um, moving now, I guess, to how we managed it as a, um, a country and a community and how we looked after people who were at greater risk of um, adverse health effects from smoke. Um, I guess my main comment and the main area, I've got a number of um, suggestions. I think there's a, a lot of issues in terms of addressing climate change, in terms of increasing the evidence base um, for good public health advice. Um, but I think what we can do right now is get better at how we share information about smoke to members of the community um, and health impacts. 
For all sorts of reasons, um, we're a jurisdictionally state and territory based country and responsibility for measuring air quality and reporting air quality. There is a national standard for various air pollutants, but um, how that information gets shared with the public and the advice that goes with this varies state by state and actually varies by a surprising amount. Um, so the units it's reported in vary. Some states will report in the actual units of measurement, which are micrograms per cubic metre of air. Others will report in an index, which is another number about, well, exactly four times higher than the micrograms per cubic metre. Um, some will report that averaged over 24 hours. Some will report it averaged over one hour. So that's a diversity of information. It's complex. It's hard for someone who, say, has asthma to know what they're looking at, particularly if they're looking to a diversity of sources. And we did some research on pe people and where they got information from, and there's 10 or 20 or more websites. There's all the different states and territories. There's international websites. Um, there's an app which our group at the University of Tasmania developed, which gets data from each state and territory and presents that as an hourly average. That's the only actually consistent source where you can look and see something consistent across the entire country. Um, this, and then it varies the health advice that goes with each level and, and when you might choose to elevate your health advice. That's another variation between states. So I think one of my um, strongest recommendations, and I, I should also acknowledge that steps have been taken already by states and territories um, to address this variation that was clear to every state and territory that this was a, a problem and there was a meeting in February uh, with most environment agencies. That's another source of fragmentation, I guess, for air quality. It does require environment agencies who actually measure the air and health agencies. So they're quite different departments. Um, so they need to come together and then all the states need to come together and that did happen in February. And there was agreement to work towards national consistency and a background paper prepared. And I'm not sure where that's up to because I've been working solidly on COVID to assist my health department. And I'm, I think that work is still in progress. Um, the other part, part and parcel, I guess, what we need to work to in the future, in my opinion, is a clear, it's a hazard, it's a hazard that's going to increase. It's a hazard that affects all of us. We, we need to learn to live with fire and smoke. There's no doubt about that. Um, so working towards a national strategy informed by expertise that not only includes consistent measurement and messaging, but evidence based based on the research, but um, a really good public communication and education strategy. Because the um, this is partly results from research I've done as well. The um, the information we tend to give tends to be very simple: stay inside and close the doors. You know who's at higher risk, but the reality is how to protect your health when there's more air pollution in the air. It's actually quite complicated. And how long do you have to stay inside? And what happens if you open the door just to go out once? And and what happens after five or six hours when we know that smoke penetrates fairly quickly? Do you have to keep staying inside? But we also know that smoke can get trapped inside. Nearly every bit of advice we give, don't do exercise. Fair enough, that increases the amount of smoke you breathe. When the smoke's going on for months, Exercise is really protective against heart disease. Like, when do we exercise? How do we exercise? Same with face masks. Work in some work in occupational settings. No good evidence for being useful for members of the public. So there's a lot of evidence, but a lot of education because this is a hazard that often um, is there regardless of an emergency. And the best way for people to protect their health is actually to know what's going on by seeing real time information about air quality, knowing if it's rising and falling and knowing what to do for themselves. So self-management improves health, improves quality of life. And that's what I think we need to be aiming for. So that's, I'll leave it there. And um, yeah. thank, thank you, Professor Johnson. I, I think that was a good summary. And, and towards the end there, you hit on a couple of points that actually is concerning the, the Commission. And I, I noticed in your, your submission to us, there was one one uh, sentence that uh, took me particularly in the fact that there was simultaneous reporting of good and then hazardous air quality in one one particular location and 
I think uh, any system that has that level of discrepancy is, uh, is something that we uh, will be uh, looking at and what steps need to be taken. And we are chasing it up with other, other agencies as well to see what the way ahead is, uh, is here. Uh, and having lived in the ACT over Christmas, I'm acutely aware of the smoke. Uh, and uh, as you said, trying to manage that and keep that out of a house is, uh, is quite, quite difficult. Commissioner Bennett, any questions? Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Um, uh, I have to say I was also struck in your report and it was uh, by the um, way in which you've dealt with the different way the information is dealt with in different parts of the country, which is um, quite extraordinary. And, and I think the example you gave just now about an, a person suffering from asthma who, for example, may move from one state to the other or, or you know, not know where to go for that information. And I, I did know your reference to the app and I did look it up last night myself, actually, when I read your information. So thank you for that. I have, um, I have a, uh, um, uh, and I and I do take, and I understand that there, there is now. You say that there is now a move to um, standardise things um, across the country, and 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 that's something that you've been a part of. So I won't go into that at the moment. Can I ask a really um, basic question? And I, and, and I, it's it's. You raised in your paper also, and you mentioned now masks, and you mentioned portable air filters. Um, is that, I mean, bearing, and I think you said that the um, particulate matter is, is um, less than 2.5 microns. Isn't there um, a, a way in which one can have masks that will actually be, of, you said they're of no utility, or isn't they're not established utility. Um, why not? Why not? Why, as a matter of theory, can't you have a mask that would keep out that size of particulate matter? And would you also comment on the portable air filters? And I'm thinking, A, for example, in the context of uh, people's homes, B, for example, in schools, and, and how that fits in with, let's say, air conditioning, because um, a lot of office blocks are air conditioned when people work. And I think there was a view last last bushfire season, A, that, you know, you were better off if you were in an air-conditioned building, but B, people in air-conditioned buildings so they could walk into the foyers and smell the smoke. So I wonder if you just comment on that that general filtration, if I can call it that, um, issue and, and the ability to deal yeah. with it. Yeah, certainly. I'll, I'll do masks and then I'll move on um, to air filters. Um, so, yes, you're quite right. You can build masks that effectively filter particulate matter and they're used in um, occupational settings very effectively. Um, the issues with using them um, that I'm talking about are use with the general public and not in occupational settings. So, so was um, I. And there's a number of reasons for that. One is that in an occupational setting, um, that goes with um, education about how to fit a mask and it's often a time-limited exposure while welding, while dusting, while fighting a fire, while... Um, I think we've become more and, familiar with that concept with, with the COVID-19 <laughs> outbreak. Indeed, that's right. Um, the, the issue is they need to fit perfectly and it's really hard to get a perfect fit and you need to be taught how to do it. And they're not made in children's sizes. They're no good if you've got a beard. Um, and when there's smoke from bushfires that goes on for days and it penetrates into the house marginal benefit of putting on a mask for going outside for an hour when you're living at 24-7, even if you've got that perfect fit, um, isn't established. So it, if it's leaking around the sides, it's not doing any good. But um, the, I, the, the other point about them is if you actually look at the studies, not so much of how well the material filters the particulate matter, if you look at studies that also look at health endpoints, um, they show two things. One is that there's increased work of breathing. So if you've already got a lung problem where you've got trouble breathing, if, if it's not causing increased work of breathing, it's probably not filtering the particles, but it can, it can make things worse and people can get more fatigued at a time they don't need to be more fatigued. Um, the other is that there hasn't been any good studies that have actually shown a health benefit in terms of those markers of inflammation and other of, of the 11 or oh, 13 studies that have evaluated health endpoints, I think one showed a benefit in otherwise healthy people who had fewer markers of information. About half showed some sort of harm in terms of increased work of breathing and the other half didn't show a benefit or a harm. So the fact that they're quite technical to put on and there's all these other uncertainties um, means that to advise 
entire members of the public to go out and get them for a prolonged episode um, isn't based on great evidence. And maybe we can improve that as we improve the evidence, as we improve the design. But at this point now, um, it, it's not there. Um, when it comes to air filters, there is much more robust evidence and evidence linking um, use of portable air cleaners that filter particles in homes leading to improved health outcomes. Um, so in my mind, that's actually the best buy because it does um, clearly work to remove the particles. There's other components of bushfire smoke that are irritating and toxic that it won't remove, but particles are the main one. Air environment in your own home, it's much easier to seal a child's bedroom or a living room and have that as a clean air area. And then if you open and shut the doors, the cleaners then carry on reducing the particles so they're not trying to... And those have shown a health benefit. The research there for Australia is lacking. Our housing, mostly that research has been done in North America and some in Hong Kong, but air-conditioned or heated, well-sealed housing is where most housing stock tends to be a lot more leaky. And particles are a bit like a gas, they'll leak in relatively quickly. That it does, we do equilibrate to outside air pollution levels relatively quickly. Um, but uh, they're, the, they're the best buy. They're a barrier financially. It's two or $300. We need to do more research on exactly which rooms and how to use them in Australia. But that's the probably the intervention with the best evidence for um, protecting health. Thank you very much. Um, air conditioning, just briefly, probably helps particularly new systems in new buildings. They do have HEPA, high-efficiency particle air filters, known as HEPA filters, but people come in and out of those buildings. So there's partial benefit um, from those as well. That's very helpful. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor. Commissioner McIntosh. Uh, thanks, Chair. Thank you both for your evidence this morning and your statements and all the other help you've given us uh, to date. Um, I just have two questions for Dr Burns. Um, we know that rapid assessments, so rapid damage assessments, are carried out post-disasters in, in a lot of areas. Do you know whether those assessments cover health needs and health impacts? Um, I probably... Um, I do believe that they, they do um, in a broad perspective. I guess if I could talk from a general practice perspective um, and from experience of um, GPs on the ground, is that um, I think um, we don't actually... Um, the health consequences following disasters are things like... We, there's documented um, evidence in the literature um, about increase in blood pressure in large numbers of people immediately following disasters. There's um, increased risk for myocardial infarctions and those sorts of cardiovascular events. There's increased risk from patients' discontinuity of medication. So a lot of people don't have medication continuity. Um, and there's also, we know there's an increase in exacerbations of not only asthma, but other chronic health um, conditions. And all those happen in the first days and, and weeks. Um, there, my my understanding and my knowledge, there's no sort of community rapid health assessment of those events. Any assessment would be more around more higher acuity um, injuries and obvious events. One of the issues um, that I see is that um, the literature review I did, I retrieved originally um, a large number of over 4,000 articles and only 2% of those reflected what was happening in primary care. And I think the issue is that we have a huge amount of um, chronic and lower acuity um, healthcare events that are ser seriously impacting on people um, in the emergency, in the acute aftermath and in the days, weeks and years afterwards that are probably not considered as much as they could be in these assessments post-disaster. So I, to answer your question, I don't know um, the answer to that, but from a primary care perspective, I do know that there's not that sort of um, that assessment done. Great, thank you. Um, does that answer your question? It, it, it does, it does. Um, I'll just take you one other question. In your witness statement, um, I believe it's on page 16, so that's PBU 500 you you say that um, there's a need for permanent integration of GPs into state and territory disaster plans and responses in Australia is needed. That's the statement. Um, and 
Uh, but elsewhere in your, your statement, you focus mo mainly on New South Wales, which I think is the area which you primarily practice and where you study. Um, are you able to give us any information about the extent to which that is happening in other jurisdictions, or is it something that we, we need to explore further elsewhere? Um, I'm afraid I'm not able to comment on that, although um, I have heard news about COVID involvement um, Sorry, in South Australia in the EP News, um, but I'm not able to comment on that. I was involved originally in, well, I am involved still, I guess, in the GP roundtable that used to meet from 2013 on disaster planning and preparedness, but I... I, I understand this is hard to, this is sort of a, a difficult area because we have no systematic inclusion of GPs through all those different levels at the moment. And the, the pieces of inclusion that we do have have been created sort of at a local growth level or a ground up level. Um, and so what I would hope would happen in the future would that there would be systematic inclusion. One of the key issues that this creates is that it means that GPs are not supported and are probably one of the more vulnerable members of the community when these events occur because they are very much on their own. So to put that in my words, what I hear you saying is at the moment it's very much bottom up, so it's um, very hard to tell what's going on and you're calling for a much more top-down system to ensure that we get sort of complete coverage and complete inclusion of GPs in emergency management. Is that a fair summation? Yeah, I think, I think that's a very... Um, it's man, there have been wonderful uh, um, import and creation of um, some um, involvement of GPs at various levels, but it's very um, ad hoc and it's not well systematised. And so one of the things I see, I'm on a lot of different um, committees, and one of the things I see is that um, groups are making decisions about what GPs can do without having a GP at the table, and it, it can be um, inaccurate. So I think it's important to have GPs at the table at the various levels so we can inform planning and we can say how we can contribute um, and hopefully become systematised systematized part of the response and the recovery. And there's many, many um, uh, stories from the five years, six years, seven years, um, as Professor Gibbs was alluding, post-disaster where people um, are still recovering from these effects. And these are also not only mental health effects, these are physical health effects as well. And so one of the things I would like to see, and, you know, as Faye's mentioned, I would like to see um, a more comprehensive examination of what the health needs are. We don't want to silo people into pieces. Um, we need a really strong biosocial approach to health. And we need to connect, connect contextualise this for each different community because the needs are different. Thank you, Dr. Burns, and thank you also, Professor Johnson. Thank, thank you both. Ms. Hogan Dora. There's uh, one matter, Professor Johnston. You referred in your evidence to um, having done an analysis of the 20 consecutive fire seasons since 2000 and estimating a cost of the, of the smoke related health costs. I might just have that pulled up. Operator, it's DFJ501. 001 0001 at page 10, and it's figure two. If that could be zoomed in. Now, that the notation to that figure is that a paper is under review, and you indicated in your evidence that that was an estimate based on an initial review uh, of the 2019-2020 impact, but subject to that review, um, that's a significant disparity when compared to previous seasons. And you said at the commencement of your evidence that uh, the experience, the estimated experience of Australians exposed to bushfire smoke during the most recent season was 80% penetration. What confidence do you have in that estimate and uh, of penetration and in the um, estimated smoke-related health costs? Um, the estimate comes from the... We calculated the exposure to smoke from fires, to PM2.5 specifically from fires, um, using existing monitoring networks of the environment agencies all around Australia. And those monitoring networks have actually um, got better through time. 
um, about every large population centre in Australia uh, is monitored for air quality. And the vast majority of Australia's population does live in our major cities, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth. Those places have all had air quality monitoring for 20 years. So we're able to look back at the daily air quality. Um, if it was above, like in the top 5% of pollution for what you would expect for that month in summer, summer our air quality is generally fantastic. Um, in the absence of a bushfire or in the absence of a dust storm. Um, dust storms are generally documented, so days that were polluted uh, where there was also a dust storm were totally excluded from this. So we only included days where the measured PM uh, during the summer months was in the top 5%. And we'd done previous research and demonstrated that pollution in the top 5% in 95 or more cases is due to bushfires in Australia. So we were confident for all those reasons that it was bushfire-related air pollution and it was taken from monitoring networks. Um, so that's the first step, is working out the population exposed and how much they were exposed. And then the second step is working out the health that's associated with that amount of increased pollution. And that's a very standard method used in global burden of disease estimates by the World Health Organization. So methods for working out excess deaths due to air pollution have been in place for, for years. So we use standard methods for that. And then again, it's fairly standard methods of attributing a, a dollar value to loss of life. It's, it's based on willingness to pay. It's not based on how much longer you have to live. It's based on um, what you might pay to avoid or lower your risk of death. Um, the hospital costs are based on standard cost of a, an admission for the various conditions. So, so we're reasonably confident, but of course it's modelled, it's estimated, it's not truth and reality, but it gives us a ballpark figure. And really the purpose in doing this was to look at the difference across the years. And we used identical methods through this time series. So it was partly to show the enormous departure from what we've experienced in the last 20 years. And also it gives a breakdown by state. So orange, for example, is New South Wales and the, the wider light blue is Victoria um, and the top red is Queensland. So it also gives an idea of the relative smoke impacts and the number of people who got those smoke impacts in, in each of those states. And Professor Johnson, the last matter I wanted to take you to is also annexed to your statement was a recent um, extract, so an extract from a recent publication of the Medical Journal of Australia, um, which you're a co-author, uh, Bushfire Smoke, Urgent Need for a National Health Protection Strategy, uh, operated DFJ 502001001. If you could go to page two and the, uh, the figure at the bottom of the page... One of the matters that you refer to in your statement is that in different states and territories there are 24-hour average uh, in air quality indicators measures and in others there are hourly um, uh, air quality measures. What's the Im importance of an hourly uh, measure being provided? Um, the, as close to real time or hour, hourly is what's available in most places is important to enable people who are at higher risk of smoke to manage themselves, their condition, you know, health condition or their children and decisions about where to go, whether to fill up the house or whether to air the house out. Um, with a 24-hour average, and this happened quite a few times, um, it's the gold standard. It's what our air quality um, standard is based on for very good reasons. It helps us monitor trends over years through time and how we're going reducing traffic and other emissions. It was never designed to help people manage bushfire smoke exposure and bushfire smoke can fluctuate with the change, changing wind. So the 24 hour average, you can have severe impacts overnight, for example. By morning that might have cleared, the standard advice will be that air quality is hazardous um, and all the suite of advice that goes with hazardous air quality will be provided, but it might actually be quite clear um, and people will be confused because they'll look outside and see it's clear um, and not sure what to do. Um, and the opposite can happen. We can be told it's 
good air quality or fair air quality, but smoke can move and rise very quickly, and you can see that from this, this figure, how deeply it rises and falls. Um, then people, the air quality 24-hour average will say good or fair, and then people will feel obliged to work, to go out, to go to school, uh, while experiencing quite considerable health impacts. So it's um, it's just not useful for an individual to manage themselves. And that's um, that's what the real time data presented in a in a way that's interpretable can, can offer. Thanks, Professor Johnston. Commissioners, any questions? No, no, thanks. That was an excellent answer. Uh, in fact, and it showed the you know, different collection requirements for different uh, different needs and the high level of fidelity for medical uh, standards. So thank you very much to, to you, Professor Johnston, for that. Ms hogan -Doran. I know the time commissioners um, propose that that concludes the evidence of uh, Professor Burns, Dr Burns and Professor Johnston. Unless there's any additional questions, uh, we could... I'm not sure of the position of the commissioners, but otherwise we would propose that we take the morning adjournment. The only thing I would be tempted to do would be just to ask each of Dr Burns and Professor Johnson if there was any very short matter that either wish to make a comment on in relation to the evidence they've heard from the other witnesses to date. Professor Burns, perhaps you might um, go first. Yes, no, I, I think um, I really appreciate actually being part of this and listening to the other evidence and um, and both um, both presenters, the information they presented actually is very useful for GPs um, experiencing these um, events. I guess one of my comments would be um, that uh, I, I have been involved very much in um, mental health effects following disasters and I worked with um, Professor Beverly Raphael during the Victorian bushfires in 2009 and we saw a lot of children um, not a lot of children, a lot of uh, teachers um, who were managing children and went through that experience. I guess one of the things I'd like to comment is that um, one of the um, mental mental health is probably one of the key things that GPs see a lot during these events. Um, and regardless um, of what um, where they're directed, people will turn up to the general practitioners, and they, you know, I think from from my research um, interviewing people. You know, 90 to 100 per cent of um, consultations following and during the early days of a bushfire will be related to mental health or will have a, a mental health component. And although these um, these are distressed people, these are not people who have um, diagnosable medical conditions. Um, and so one of the key roles um, is of the GPs is actually to calm people down. Um, and I know that, um, you know, I've spoken to GPs where um, the patients have turned up on the doorsteps covered in smoke, just wanting to touch base and make sure that it's okay. And, and, and you know, with that disaster brain sort of asking for what they need to do. So I guess what I would say is that um, there is a huge mental health impact in disasters and that's documented is huge, but there's an even larger one that's not documented. So the disaster... Um, research um, that includes primary care is minuscule. And so I think that there is still yet a lack of understanding of the true impacts of disaster across all those different areas um, because we are probably need to think more broadly and think um, around um, people's care um, after disasters. So we need to include um, all those different groups, the elderly, the, the young, the families, but we also need to look at things like... Um, effects on people's um, employment and um, the social determinants health, effect on their progression through schooling, all those things. And, and also um, those people that um, might have other um, disasters that then occur, like, um, again, stories of, you know, people have their own ongoing health effects that occur during these events. So I think my, um, my observations of disasters so far would be that I really feel we need to broaden the scope and the um, consideration of conditions that we include when we're making disaster planning and uh, recovery arrangements. Thanks. And Professor Johnston. Um, yeah, thank you. I'll just make a comment in my research on, on bushfires and the public health impacts. Um, smoke, I guess, is just one of many health impacts from bushfire disasters. Um, threats to public health water supplies and catchments is another obvious one. And then there's the health impacts, physical and mental health impacts. Um, physical being injury, you know, immediate 
accidents relating to vehicles, but injuries from fires and radiant heat and so forth, and then mental health impacts. Um, and I'm, I'm not referring to biodiversity or any other impacts. Or, or the other one is, of course, loss of infrastructure and loss of power and the um, health and social impacts that arise from that. Um, and probably, and this is my opinion at this point, um, the, the ones that are most important for ongoing public health at the time and ongoing, I would say, are the mental health impacts and the smoke impacts because they're widespread, they're persistent, and um, and they can last, particularly mental health impacts, can last um, a considerable, like, years. Um, same with smoke if you're talking exposure very early in life at a vulnerable time. So that's... That's like that's my opinion, I guess, and acknowledging the wide spectrum of impacts. No, Thank we you, Professor we Johnson. appreciate your opinion. Thank you, Professor mm. Johnston. Uh, Dr. Burns. Professor Johnston, thank you for uh, for joining us this morning. We we really do appreciate it. It's been very informative for us, and uh, and with that, uh, we'd like to excuse you from the commission. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this would now be a convenient time for a very short adjournment. Short adjournment and then straight back to uh, then, um, Mr. Tender, Mr. Cashmore. Uh, first, uh, junior council assisting. Ms. Spees will deal with the tender of the material from this morning's session, okay. and then and then we've moved to Mr. Cashmore, the principal of Malakuta College, and his pre-recorded evidence straight after that. Okay, well, let's take a short adjournment and uh, return at 11:50. Oh. You want it shorter than that? Ten minutes would be fine. Thank you. Commissioner. Okay, well that was a bit longer than that. okay. So let's. I'll, I'll give you eight minutes, and we'll come back at 11:45. Thank you, Commissioner. Well, all rise.
The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Uh, Ms. Spees will deal with the document tender and then the subsequent video. Ms. Spees. Ms. Spees. I will now identify the documents that are contained within the bundles that were marked earlier this morning. The first bundle, which is marked 2.1, the first document is the witness statement of Professor Lisa Gibbs. The document ID is MDH.500.001.0001. Document 2.1.1.1 is a report by Gibbs et al. Beyond Bushfires, Community Resilience and Recovery Final Report. That is document MDH 500.001.0027. Document 2.1.1.2 is a paper by Bryant et al. Longitudinal study of changing psychological outcomes following the Victorian Black Saturday bushfires. And that is document MDH.500.001.0060. Document 2.1.1.3 is a paper by Gibbs et al. Delayed disaster impacts on academic performance of primary school children and that is document MDH.500.001.0071. Document 2.1.1.4 is a paper by Gallagher et al. The Effect of Group Involvement on Post-Disaster Mental Health, a Longitudinal Multilevel Analysis. And that is document MDH.500.001.0083. Document 2.1.1.5 is a paper by Molino et al, Interpersonal Violence and Mental Health Outcomes Following Disaster, and that is document MDH.500.001.0093. Document 2.1.2 is a document by the University of Melbourne, Phoenix, Australia, and the Australian Red Cross, Helping Children and Young People Cope with Crisis, information for parents and caregivers, and that is document MDH.501.001.0001. Document 2.1.3 is a document by the University of Melbourne, Phoenix, Australia, and the Australian Red Cross, Parenting, Coping with Crisis, and that is document MDH.501.001.0049. And then finally in that bundle, document 2.1.4 is a document by the Australian Red Cross, Resources for Parents and Caregivers, and that is document MDH.503.001.0001. In the bundle that was marked 2.2 this morning, document 2.2.1 is the witness statement of Associate Professor Faye Johnston and that is document DFJ.501.001.0001. And the second document is 2.2.1.1, and that is a paper by Vardulakis et al, Bushfire Smoke, Urgent Need for a National Health Protection Strategy, and that is document DFJ.502.001.0001. And in the third bundle um, that was tendered this morning, bundle 2.3, the first document is 2.3.1, the witness statement of Dr. Penelope Burns, and that is document PBU.500.001.0047. Document 2.3.1.1 is the Nepean Blue Mountains Primary Health Network document planning for disaster management and that is document PBU.500.001.0001. The third document, 2.3.1.2, is uh, the General Practice Roundtable Meeting, 25 June 2013. That is document PBU.500.001.0045. And finally, document 2.3.2, is Australian Disaster Resilience Handbook Collection, Health and Disaster Management. And that is document MDH.502.001.0001. Commissioners, just before um, 
Yes, please deals with the uh, video. Uh, just a notification to parties that um, this afternoon one of the witnesses is uh, John Price, the Ombudsman from the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. Um, uh, the Australian Financial Complaints or AFCA have provided an updated and supplemental response to the notice to give that mm -hmm. has been uploaded or is in the process of being uploaded into the court book and I anticipate that Mr Price may refer to it in the course of his evidence this afternoon. Okay, thank you for that. Ms Spies, thank you. Commissioners, next we're going to hear from Tim Cashmore who is the proud principal of Mallacoota P12 College. Mr Cashmore describes his personal experience of the fires that surrounded Mallacoota around New Year's Eve and also discusses the effect on the Mallacoota community. Mr Cashmore's evidence has been edited to include a map and several photos referred to by Mr Cashmore in his evidence. In addition, the video um, includes two maps as an aide memoir and that they have been inserted in the video to highlight the features of Mallacoota referred to by Tim Cashmore. The original footage of Mr Cashmore's evidence, along with the separate documents referred to by him, are available. Commissioners, I tender the video of Mr Cashmore's evidence, which is document RCN 700.000.0002, and the transcript of Mr Cashmore's evidence, uh, which is document RCN.500.001.2188, and commissioners, that is at tab E2 of uh, the bundle. These will be tendered as bundle 2.4, consisting of documents 2.4.1 and 2.4.2. .2. So that, uh, that bundle with the video and the transcript uh, is received as an exhibit as marked. We will play the video evidence, uh, which runs for 58 minutes and 13 seconds, and it's proposed that we will then adjourn till 2 p.m. Okay, so after the video, we will adjourn until 1400 Canberra time. <laughs> Thank you. How did you come to live in Mallacoota, Mr Cashmore? So, uh, my wife Rebecca, who's now the business manager, we arrived here in October 2011, and well, we were going to stay for a year, but now this is my tenth year, and we love it here. Um, I came from the northeast of Victoria, and I was helping look after about 84 small schools right across the northeast of Victoria, right down to King Lake, mm -hmm. right up to uh, Wodonga and Corriol, and over to uh, Yarrawonga and uh, those places, uh, and Shepparton. So we came here and uh, I'd been a principal for a number of years before that and uh, this is a great place to be. So you've been in quite a few places in Victoria. Have you had experience before the last summer of bushfires and bushfire seasons? Yeah, um, yes we have. Uh, I suppose in a previous life I spent a fair while in Corion, which is a pretty strongly uh, fire prone area in terms of grass and bushfire and farming bushfire and that's probably been reflected in what's happened recently and also involved in, in Black Saturday, we were in the middle of Black Saturday when it broke out yeah. and even getting home, there are a lot of visions of that day and what that looked like from Tuberac, Seymour, uh, Rose White, up, back up to Talangata and uh, yeah we've been we're pretty much involved in that sort of stuff. So you've been in uh, Malakuta now for almost a decade. Mm, yeah. What's your role been here in that time? Okay, so my, my full-time job is a principal here, mm -hmm. um, and it's the privilege and the price of being in a small town, but it's certainly more a privilege for us here to micromanage our students. Uh, I've taken a couple of strong interests in the golf club, so I'm vice-captain of the golf club here mm -hmm. in the... Uh, or vice president of the golf club and was vice captain, uh, which is going through a major change at the moment. And I probably find that I've served on the MDHSS board, um, the local hospital board, for a number of years. Uh, that's probably enough because it's a pretty full time job. How many kids are at the school here? Uh, this year, 141, which is probably an increase in enrolment over the last couple of years. 
I think the peak at Malakuta was 2.22.40, mm-hmm. but there was a sharing of the Abalone licences, which probably decreased some of the town's opportunity. Uh, but we're holding well, and, and we are the only school. There will always be a P12 at Malakuta mm-hmm. because our nearest school is a long way away. And how many kids doing their final year this year? This year we have about 13, which is a fairly big cohort for us. Mm -hmm. And we do VCE, VET and VCAL. So we stretch. um, And a lot of us are, a lot of my staff and teachers are individual faculties. A couple of English teachers, a couple of maths teachers, but certainly our primary structure in in, um, early years and and, and, uh, middle primary and later primary are sort of standalone composite grades and then uh, some pretty great experts in their field in terms of the secondary model too but a lot of that is individual too which is always a challenge and we employ a lot of part-time staff mm-hmm. so EFT here we'd have about 15 1.0 teachers and about five and a bit education support staff but we employ 32 people and that's a bit of a nightmare for my assistant principal trying to do a timetable. Well, I mean, how many kids have you got here who are living under COVID-19 restrictions? Uh, and I imagine that's affecting the day-to-day life of the school. Absolutely. How's it changed things for you? Gee, uh, in many ways, um, we pride ourselves on micromanaging. So we're probably a school that can respond as well as any other in terms of how we present our remote learning with the anxiety and challenge that the students have got around internet connection. Um, right. We're not on NBN. Um, we have kids who live in isolated pockets outside Malakuta. The department are trying to give us that access to dongles and things like that, but it, it is a bit anxious for, and I'll talk to you later about our Year 12 cohort or our final year cohort, like all schools, would be um, in a state of unknown and a state of new ground, and it's all new. Mm. But we've responded, I think, really well. And how many in just their first year of school? No, oh, this year's really good. We have we have about 18, I think, first years, of which we've got, I think, seven first-time families, which is another big, um, big effort. Um, we've had a lot of uh, angst around and... Uh, Oh, we've had a lot of project work around the new kinder. So we've been granted a, um, a, a grant for a new kinder. And uh, the current one, they, they did come to my school, our, our school, and, and, and set up for a while. Now they're back at the old kinder. Whether they stay there or whether that gets relocated, a lot of that's around community consultation and also what the department's shires look like in terms of how that might set up. So the kids... I take it have had a lot to do with this year. Bushfires and now COVID-19. How are they holding up? Oh, look, I think magnificently considered. Um, It is a double whammy for us. And I think, and I might talk later about the context of Malakuta and the fire is quite unique in terms of multi-layered and also having um, COVID-19 is certainly too unbelievable events Mm. that impact greatly on our small community. Um, We're not the only community in Australia too, and I'm sure it impacts many other places, but for Malakura it has been a double whammy. What's what's the community like here? I mean, who are the people that live here? Mm, uh, Well, there'd be better people than me to talk to around this, but uh, the uh, the pride of Malakura is around its um, strong voice around its strong environmental footprint, its very strong artistic footprint, both performing and visual arts, and about the connection to environment. Um, uh, Lots of examples of that. I suppose historically, from what I know, Malakut, as you said before, is a halfway place between Melbourne and Sydney, so we've had a lot of quite well-known performers drop into Malakut and perform, (laughs) and still do, over many years. And we have a really strong arts council, which was run in in a festival-type event through the Easter breaks and things like that. But I think uh, in terms of what we're doing in Malakut, they're strong. There is... um, It's not without its own set, set of conflict. Uh, we have a, a group of people who are independent owners, strong uh, wheel businessmen called the Abalone industry, the mm-hmm. divers, and a strong environmental footprint. And, and people might remember the, the challenge of building Bastion Point. 
and what that would look like as an environmental issue and what that looks like in terms of access to um, ocean access. Yeah. And my job here is not to have an opinion about that um, and to support my community. We run the Malakuta Mouth, which is a really magnificent newspaper. Um, it comes out weekly. It's 40 pages. Yep. It's done brilliantly. Uh, but from my point of view, uh, my school council has asked that I, that I edit that correctly in terms of not publishing things that are too controversial. Um, and that's always a work in progress around me and others making a judgment about what can and can't go into the mouth. But the voice of the people here is really strong and, and it's one of the attractions of Malakuta. As, as diverse as it might be, it's passionate. And because we are so isolated, people need to make their own own fun, their own sense of identity, uh, and it's you go back through the history with a couple of people here, and there are some wonderful stories that go on, and probably I better not tell too many of them here. <laughs> so it sounds like there's there's a number of people, artists, self-employed, um, some small businesses. Yeah. Who are the big employers in this area? Okay, so the co-op would employ a lot of people. Uh, the co-op works on a system now at the moment where it's got its own cannery or had its own cannery and hopefully about to be rebuilt. Uh, so when you say the co-op, you mean the abalone? Yeah, the abalone co-op, yeah, and, and that's exported. Mm -hmm. You can't technically buy abalone in town because okay. it's all canned and sent away. Um, they would probably be a big employer, as would the Malakut District Health Service mm -hmm. and the school. And then we've got what we call our local shopkeepers. Uh, we call it the CBD <laughs> down at Malakuta. Um, and they're, they're, they're a strong group of people too. And we have an enormous amount of volunteer groups. Right. Over, um, I'm going to guess well over 30. And that's not bad for a, for a town of under 1,000 people. So about 1,000 people in ordinary times. About and that. then does it swell over right. the holiday times? Huge. Um, the, the Christmas window is where... Our local businesses make their money, including short-term rentals and holiday rentals and, and, and trade in our main street. Uh, that could swell anywhere between uh, eight and 10,000 people. Um, we have one of the largest caravan parks on the foreshore in the Southern Hemisphere, run by the um, local, local um, Shire, East Gippsland Shire, but there's also a lot of holiday accommodation around Malakuta. And a lot of people um, would watch this and many would have been to Malakuta mm -hmm. uh, in, in, the, in their days. And so the local community, from what you say, sounds like they rely on the income from the Christmas period in particular for the rest of the year. Absolutely. Right. Yeah, and, and of course the double whammy of, of the bushfire and COVID uh, has certainly um, challenged them. So it's pretty quiet here now. Oh, well, yeah, I think you know, I might have mentioned to you there's only the one coffee van in the street selling coffee, so uh, it's, it's a pretty popular thing because I've got all our contractors in clearing at the moment, or yep. starting to clear, and, uh, yeah, most of the things are pretty well shut down. So what do you... I mean, other than the normal school curriculum... Mm -hmm. Do the kids learn about bushfire education? I mean, they live at the end of a end of a, a, a huge sort of park and forest area. We we do a lot of work over the years in connection to. Um, we've had some really great programs run here. Uh, we've joined with Parks Victoria and, and uh, uh, doing uh, camera shots of um, feral animals at night time. Mm -hmm. We've joined Parks Victoria with water quality. Uh, our advanced program, um, absolutely. Uh, we supply here um, a really good program for surf life saving. Mm -hmm. So our students, although we haven't got a pool in Malakuta, we have the pub pool to learn to swim in, and that's probably about the size of this table. <laughs> but we also have a lot of connection with uh, Malakuta Life Saving Club in supplying guards, they do their bronze here and they do their gold mm -hmm. and they drift into volunteering for or working for uh, Royal Life Saving and that's a really great program. We, we patrol the beach at Bastion Point mm -hmm. in the summertime for the welfare of our holiday makers and that's a really great connection. And are many volunteers part of the CFA or part of the Okay, the, the we fire? do have some, including um, one fine young fellow who 
was one of the centre fighters uh, in response to uh, what happened New Year's Eve and, and continues to be part of that CFA union. So there are other people as well. Uh, but he, he's a special boy who um, out at Gabo Island working and doing things for and trying to do his year 12 at the same time, which is always going to be contestable right now. And a number of our students uh, volunteer in all sorts of ways. So in the lead up to Christmas last year and the, and the summer season, what kind of preparations were underway to the, for the potential risk of bushfires? Yeah, it's a good question. I'm probably not that qualified to make the comment. I can make an observation, but um, I think the standard stuff around um, the conflict between lack of resources for some of our instrumentalities um, and trying to manage... Uh, the forest it is really a contestable thing when you've got um, on one side the logging contractors and the other side the environmentalists there's a balance in between and people like Dwelp and uh, CFA and uh, Parks have to respond to that with limited resources and the people I've mentioned there and there are some beautifully wonderful people in that industry, do it straining at the, every inch of what they can do under under enormous pressure. So, Malakut is right in the far east of East Gippsland, sure. and there's one road in and one yeah. road out, yeah. and otherwise it's by sea or from the uh, airfield about eight kilometres to the south. Yeah. So, was. Was there a sense that there was a potential to be cut off with fires? Well, it, again, um, there are probably better qualified people to answer that one, but from my point of view, there was a sense before New Year's Eve that the fire that had started had the potential to get out of control. And did you get any... Did you? Is there a system of messaging or information that you received or monitored? Um... Yes and no. Uh, we go. The school actually goes through a bushfire preparedness. Okay. So Can you we tell me a, a bit about that? We get a grant every year to employ contractors here to make sure our, our school is as fire ready as possible. Right. And that's removing leaf litter, cutting back, uh, making sure we haven't got a lot on the ground, tidying up, um, sealing up, making sure we're ready. Um, that's That's been happening since we've been classed as a bar school, a bushfire school, so um, that's that's part of that thing. But remember that the bushfires probably started and affected areas as late November, mm -hmm. uh, around Swiss Creek and those places. Um, but for us, it was around the fire that started down, down south, southeast. Near and, Wiggins River? Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. near, near, near the Wiggins. Um, and that, as it came... Uh, it was an increasing piece of um, anxiety in the town. Mm -hmm. We had, for instance, where I live on that corner there, and a little D4 and D something um, bulldozer in to just widen the one track again. Mm -hmm. um, the resources that they call upon, um, somewhere between 16 and 20 odd fire trucks came in. And they've come up the line, so they were from as far away as Bendigo, mm -hmm. being shunted up the line. Uh, I think they wanted 50, uh, and that would, I don't know how much that would have mattered um, in terms of what, what came and what was fierce. Uh, but there was some preparation, uh, certainly from our um, professional and volunteer bodies, yep. around what, what looked like could happen. But... Uh, the ferocity of what did happen was extraordinary. So, for yourself, you live on Terranova Drive, which is around near Bastion Point. Um, did you have a bushfire plan for your own home? Yeah, we did. So, Beck and I greened as much as we could, mm -hmm. and that much I do know. Um, so, back in November, looking at the fire season, um, we, we greened as much as we could, and that included part of the this very narrow fire break that this, that this is there um, and locked up the house. Uh, we left the night before because um, Beck had never been in a bushfire mm -hmm. um, and it was just at that 
time and neighbours helped each other and my neighbour helped him and us and across the road tried to help to get prepared and some did stay. Mm-hmm. Um, but we, we evacuated down to the wharf area so they decided to make the resort uh, the place of last resort is the hall. So we'll just look at the map. Yep. So you're over here in Terranova Drive which is just off Bastion Point Road, which is the road that takes it all the way out to yep. the jetty where eventually um, the evacuation mm. was mounted. Absolutely. But over here is the main road, mm-hmm. which is Morris Avenue, is that right? Yeah, Maurice Avenue. Maurice Avenue. Yeah. And you just said about the wharf, which is down at the end. Down the point. So the CFA declared that the hall... And there's Captain Stevens Point, or Stevenson's Point. And that area along there was where people should have sent And so what you're pointing at is this is the foreshore area where there's uh, caravan parks. So just looking at the map, yeah. we've got come down through the main road, down to the foreshore area. Yeah. You talked before about all the caravans and the camping. It's all the way along this foreshore area. Yeah. And there's these small... And sort backs of up a, a, around the back here too. And around yeah. um, to Devil to the lookout and the Devil's Inlet. Yeah. Okay. So on the foreshore, um, there's the wharf, and you were just saying that the um, they've been designated a community hall yeah. as a place of... Yeah, of... of Last, last resort or the place to move to. Um, and that's next to the cinema or near yep, the cinema? Yeah, that is the cinema. It is the cinema. Yeah, known as the cinema too. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a multi-purpose. Sure. <laughs> and that's a concrete structure with a sort of oh, a Oh, not all too much concrete in it, but it certainly has some structure to it. Okay. So you were telling us we were down at the wharf. Mm. Do you want to take us through what you and your wife did? So this is on the 30th. Yeah, so we wife. stayed the night down there with friends and I suppose the first thing that we really realised, you could smell the fire um, but, and you could see the red glow a fair way away but during the very early morning a couple of the fireys came round and said the head's going to come, you need to get, we were just um, I don't know 50 metres, 30 metres from the wharf itself. You need to evacuate right to the wharf. The wharf was a central point which I thought was a good place to be because that's where they were pumping the fire trucks. So they had a pump, a big pump operating, and the trucks would pull in and they'd load up. And it's a bloke you should interview called Barnsey because it's probably every second word is probably an expletive, but he's the local um, man here in the CFA and he controlled that area and he was nothing short of magnificent. Um, so that area there was under attack by the fire head went over and it caught across the lake and continued on and part of that is when, when the fires come and this should be in one um, it's just an, a, 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 an experience you can find hard to describe yeah. and there's a couple of things you need that people know when, when, when it's like that is, yeah, there's the red glow, there's the smoke. But things go black. So red like this? Yeah, that's, yeah, that's how it looks, yeah. And that's about just after 6am on mm-hmm. the New that, Year's that, Eve? Yep, that'll be right. And then black like that, yeah. not much long later? Yeah, not much long, longer, and then the fire head goes over. And the one thing, especially when it attacked around the back here to Terranova that I know that happened too is not only is this black but the noise the noise is like a 747 taking off it's just roaring at you the radiant heat itself is, is hard enough um, I do know from Roscoe who was the first fiery with his truck on the scene to protect the school and without him the school would have gone he did run out of water but um, just fortunately another truck, one of the school, maybe the Scoresby truck came in behind him and backed it up. He's been at my school three times. He walks and he sits down and he cries. Mm-hmm. He, and he's one of the strongest men I've ever met and he's given himself to us. You've given us a sense of the intensity and the trauma and I don't want 
to dwell too much on that because I'm sensitive to um, those memories don't seem to 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 fade no, they don't. in they, the short term. And they can even be amplified, but, mm-hmm. you know, we've done a bit of debriefing and I'm happy to talk around that. The other part that probably would be worth noting is the amount of feedback I got from people who stayed in the hall, and I'm glad I didn't stay in the hall because... So it's it was black. a designated sp- space, yeah, wasn't it's it? Black, but you can't see anything. You can't. You can't see what's coming. Yep. Um, a couple of my mates stayed in the hall, and they said it was just terrible. You know, just it was smoky. It was hot. You don't know what's happening outside. You want to get out to see what's going on. Um, even that one of them had turned around and said to me that at one stage he had his head in his hands and he felt the water on his head, and because he was one of the CFA blokes at one time, he thought it was the CFA surrounding the hall to wet it down because the attack was right on us. Right. And yet it was the Red Cross boys with their little sprays keeping people cool. So, but that's how blinded up people are. It's not, it's not, you, yeah. some, in some cases, I can't see you. Yeah. So it's, and the, it, the power had already gone by this point. Oh, power, yeah, power had gone early. Um, yep. Yeah. And what, we didn't have power for two weeks. And that promoted the next stage, which, which was around fire management and evacuation, and that's something uh, that I'll never forget in terms of what it was. So let's go forward to that point. Mm-hmm. During the course of that day, announcements were made that the Navy, HMAS Tools mm-hmm. and HMAS and Sy- Sycamore would be mm-hmm. sent around. Yeah. Um, that would obviously take some time before they would arrive. Mm-hmm. Um, what was the sense in, in the, the town and the community at that point? I think it's an individualised thing because everyone was focused on what they needed to do or reacting to who they where they were and what they were doing themselves and with their loved ones or family or children. Uh, for Beck and I, we took off around to Terranova Drive to see if we'd survived and we went down the street and there's house after house just flat. And ours stood, well, yeah, we cried. But on the same token, we've got next door because that was still on fire and so started to put that out yep. across the road. The fireys came back again and fought it and, and secured things. And we spent that night at home in the black. Um, and then it was just, Tim, can you go on this emergency management team? And we just went to that straight away, basically. And, yeah, it was interesting. I arrived at that first meeting and I'm the only one in uniform. Not, not in uniform. Not in uniform. <laughs> yeah, everyone else has got a uniform. I'm going, OK. But, yeah, well, actually, yeah, that was magnificently led by the police officer, Glenn Owens. He was, wow, what a man. He, he's a wonderful man and under enormous pressure because the pressure was to evacuate people because we had no water, no power. Um, we had very limited um, internet connection or phone connection and we couldn't get out of town. No aircraft could land um, and the chills, well, yeah, I've got a, a stop bar. A little watch was given to me for my birthday, um, which is a chills watch. That's <laughs> treasured. Um, and they were, oof, they were just magnificent because 20 hours after the fire had went over, we well, got a thousand people. Thank goodness for the foreshore. Yeah. And got and a massive point to get them off into and away, and that helped the town. Um, mm. And there was also about relief. Yeah. You know, and getting the right people, Red Cross, Navy, Air Force, ADF in. So the emergency management plan. Mm-hmm. Had there been an evacuation plan beforehand that you were aware of as yeah. a sort of a contingency? Well, years ago, uh, the local police um, and the local CFA got together and a few other groups, and I was part of that, around what an evacuation plan looks like. And it was always the belief that Malakou would have to evacuate in. You can't really get out unless you leave two days beforehand. And some people did get out, right. but... In the, in the end, you can only turn left or right, and probably there wasn't either option, for this, certainly this time there wasn't. So it's an evacuation in plan, and using the hall as a last resort, using our CFA volunteers, uh, defending the infrastructure of the town. Um, but as you see that map there, the 
it's not wholly defensible yep. under the current structures. So it's got... This is the map that the bushfire recovery agencies produced of the fire scar impact in East Gippsland and indeed all of Victoria. Mm. And Malakut is right at the end of that scar. Yeah. So then in the map of the town, uh, this is the inlet where we saw a number of boats and people leaving the foreshore. Oh, yeah. Is that the, where that the was? Lake, yes, yeah. the lake, yes. And, and I've spoken to a couple of my students around that and yeah, it was a very difficult time for those out in the lake and it got cold. Strangely enough, uh, I'm not a scientist, but I've been told because of the weather pattern stuff that happened. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I've been told by a reliable source that we were going to lose 85% of our town. I mean, it would have been an absolute disaster. And there was a little bit of a cool change, a wind, slight wind change that helped save us. Um, but yeah, out on the boats, from what they tell me, it was quite frightening because it's you can't see, well, you can't see the camera. Yeah. You don't know where you are. Yep. And there's a whole lot of smoke. And you're in a boat, and the weather conditions, I don't know whether it was a flat car or a bit bumpy, um, but it's just a really difficult time. Um, some people would have tied up over the other side of the lake, which is probably a safer thing to do, or around what they call Goodwood Sands, which is over here somewhere, about, out about there, one of the islands across there. But the firehead went over that, mm. and the firehead continued on. Um, up in the Green Cape there, or yes. in, in the area across the lake. And it was there for, for weeks. Just dun, 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 dun. And that's the two pieces that I've spoken to my good mate Rob Boucher, who's the principal of Swifts, around the different context. Yep. See, Malakuta had multi levels. We had people who were here within the fire, right through. We had people who evacuated out. We had people who left before Christmas time and couldn't get back in to help. Um, that, that's a, a whole lot of angst around what that looked like with two weeks with no power mm. and running off the diesel um, with the ADF, uh, all the Chinook helicopters bringing in diesel and the ships bringing in diesel. We were going through, I think, Glenn told us, you know, about 3,000 litres a day. Mm. That was just for the emergency trucks and management mm. stuff and they were down from under 1,000 a, under a litres a couple of times and, you know, it's really touch and go whether it was going to become difficult and the public meetings were probably pretty hard too because Glenn had to lead that with a few good reports from you know, the fireys and management stuff and the question was always around you know, how far have you gone to get out of town? When can we leave? When can mm. we leave? Mm. And, of course... Uh, for the first two weeks was how long's a piece of string. We don't know. Eventually, we, we began a, a strategy around, and we, well, we're up to here, and we'll do 200 metres today, or whatever, or 500 metres today, or 50 metres today. And when they describe it, when they've said that, you know, period of um, lengths of road that they're going to clear, is that what they were referring to? Yeah. The, and what was the problem as you understood it? Oh, yeah. From my point of view, it was just the, the, the enormity of the problem. And I've been out of town twice since January the 1st. And both times when you look at what happened, uh, the amount of timber um, and the amount of unsafeness. And you know, remember, that it's got to have some signage for public. Um, yeah. And, you know, driving to Melbourne yep. uh, is a very difficult drive up drummer. How long a drive is it in normal circumstances to drive from Mallacoota to Melbourne? Oh, if you if you stick within the law, which I'm sure people do, um, it, I don't know, you'd say about six hours with a rest in between, perhaps five and a half if you're really pushing it. But yeah, and it's an extra time now, and certainly was um, you know when there was a, I think an 80k speed zone between here and halfway to almost to Bensdale mm. that you had to adhere to, and the same up the coast to New South Wales to Eden. Um, it, it's a difficult one. And how would you describe the road for those who've not driven it before? <laughs> so my, I instruct my staff I don't want them to travel. To, our, our staff often leave for professional development and stuff like that. But I instruct my staff now you're not to go alone and you're not to travel in darkness. Um, before the fires, uh, driving between here and Albos was like driving through Jurassic Park. I mean, with the amount of bruise, wombats 
And now deer, especially deer, they're a, they're a huge problem. Um, and they feral deer? They're yeah, absolutely. And they're, they're big. And they, they don't move off the road very quickly in your, right. if you're doing 100 k's. Um, and they're wild. And they're even here. The deer were here on the golf course. It's wild. So they're... They're spreading. So, yeah, look, it's... And a, it's a windy road? Oh, absolutely. You know, as I said, driving out of Malakuta and up Drummer towards Orbos is hardly a straight stretch of road. Mm-hmm. And it's also the Princess Highway, which is dealing with B-doubles and semis and things that are on the road anyway. Mm. So it's, it's a very difficult and dangerous drive. So the process... At the time, post the fire, the first round of fire, because it came back, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I had Can you describe really that? So that was on the Tuesday, yeah. and then it came again on the Saturday. Yeah. So I, I, we, we were tearing over drive then, Beck and I, and with all our hoses and dressed up and ready to go, and uh, it came very close. It loomed, I suppose. And luckily, it didn't keep coming. Um, were the but conditions same again? That is not red as bad. and black, or yeah, but red? Yeah, yeah, certainly very dark in the afternoon and slightly black. Um, but from where we were in Terranova, it might have been different at Genoa. Mm-hmm. Um, certainly, we've got people living out of Genoa who they've been impacted very heavily, and out towards what they call the Walligara, which is the river on the other side towards New South Wales. Um, that sort of impact uh, it was was still there, and of course it crossed over towards Marshmead, which is where MLC have their annex there, um, and that was all continually threatened through um, late January. So some people have been evacuated by the Saturday, but there were still those waiting to be airlifted out. Yeah. Um, the, you've described this, the, the fires coming back on, on the Saturday, so still heavy smoke, mm-hmm. still interrupting the, the, the plans, I guess, to evacuate? Oh, well, yeah. Oh. I haven't made a note, and I, did, I went over my notes around, exactly, and you'd be able to find out when the first planes were able to get there. But it seemed to me for a, a couple, number of days that they couldn't. Um, and when they did, um, with the, um, the Spartans, as they called it, the Mini Hercules, and wow, and to see, you know, Chinook helicopters and, and, and even um, all the private charter coming in, uh, twins, twin engine aircraft, and uh, then of course the uh, Air Force brought in a couple of their really quick um, modern helicopters, which uh, were good, and we had a, a fantastic relationship with the boys from the ADF who looked after the, the uh, fuel and the bladders, because the one thing I perhaps didn't mention was that two days before the fire preparation is uh, Telstra put down a couple of generators out of the golf club, which was always the plan. So they came in on big semi-trailers. Right. So the, big diesel generators. Yeah, yeah, and that's where they had to put the bladder down, fill it up, make sure that it got off the ships, and the ADF boys were magnificent um, doing that. Speaking of Telstra, what, what's the mobile communications like out here normally? Oh, so we only get Telstra. So if you come with Vodafone or you come with any other model, it doesn't work. Uh, I don't know if I'm speaking out of school, but at one stage there emergency management, they needed to send a team up to the tower because the generator was failing. Mm-hmm. And that would have been an absolute disaster to have no communication. This is the transmission tower? Yeah. And where's that uh, located well, compared to where we are now at the school? Yeah, there, there's a couple. There's one up on, on the hill up here, and then there's a couple on a couple of the mountains outside and on the way to or boss down that way. But, yeah, the transmission's really important. But Telstra's the only one. And, of course, the other part of internet access in Malakuta, and this is part of my Year 12 problem, um, and my students' problem, is the access is intermittent. Mm-hmm. Um, if, you, if you want to buy a house in Malakuta at the moment, you won't get an internet connection because the portal's full. Right. That's what I'm being told. Yep. And I, I, that's, that's just not satisfactory to us. And the NBN did come for a while, but that's all been burned out, so you know, they're going to have to, to redo that. And uh, that, how long is a piece of string? That'll take a long time. But the part for our students in this remote learning stuff mm. is around if they can have um, quality internet access, we, we can work it. So at our school at the moment, our teachers and staff run foundation to year six are hard packs so they're there all this morning so we've got a Monday morning changeover mm-hmm. drop off changeover and our year seven to twelve are either hard packs by request or 
we are doing something I think pretty exceptional in run, running our normal timetable. So we have a normal, especially our VCE timetable, we have a normal timetable where the teachers are in the window. We use Google Classrooms and WebEx mm -hmm. um, to talk with our students. But again, the anxiety, uh, even this morning I was talking to one of my parents around their U12 student, it dropped out, Mr C. You know? uh, and that's that build of anxiety, and I reckon the other one you don't know is that since the fires... I reckon we've had at least three blackouts and six brownouts. So Malakut is renowned for having power drop out because we're the last on the line. Yep. The tree falls down at Dwarf Boston, Cam River. Bang, the line goes down, power goes off. Can be. And so the backup plans for that happening, if there's a history of that happening, is to have the generators. But th is that enough? Okay, so the school hasn't got a generator, uh, and that's one of the things we've applied for in a new upgrade, is that we have a generator that can keep powering for the school, because the internet connections at this school is probably the, as good as anywhere in the community. Right. And that's why we encourage some of our kids to come back and use that. Um, yep, but a generator for the town in terms of its internet connection, absolutely. Um, I'm not a techie in that regard, but I don't care what it costs, but it's just a given for towns like ours to have something like that. But then, you've, of course, you've got to be able to resupply the, the fuel for to run the generator. Absolutely, yeah, yeah and that's, yeah, that's an interesting thing. Mm. So you said a moment ago about the anxieties that the kids are having with managing schooling in the COVID environment. Yeah. How are kids responding or living in the aftermath of the fires themselves? So take us back to, say, January, then February. You attended the community forum in March. We're now in May. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a good question. What we've tried to do as a school... Um, we have a really strong education support group of teachers here that are well established and without being too glib, it's a bit of the village runs, knows the student pretty well. Um, so we've aligned all our home groups, an ES officer to check on wellbeing and engagement, keep on checking in. We are strong in our communications. We use our newsletter, we use our website, we use Facebook and we text and we meet with, with restriction out the yep. front. Um, so we, we're doing everything we can and I, I can't, yeah, I can't acknowledge enough our, our parents. Um, they're not teachers but they're trying so hard to support their students. Um, and we want them, of course, back at school and they will come back to school hopefully sooner rather than later. But we are governed by our Victorian Health Minister and by what our government want us to do and that's fair enough. But the issue was, it was interesting if you go back to the fires, Dominic, in terms of the first day at school. Um, was really interesting. Oh, kids won't come. They don't want to be here. You know, they've gone through this. Well, we had 85% of our kids come, and they were keen. They were just wanted to see their friends. Mm -hmm. They wanted to get together to tell their story. Mm -hmm. And it's a bit the same here at the moment. You can see that some of them want to get here to tell the story. Sure, they've got the third appendage. They've got their mobile <laughs> phones. But... Um, it's not the same as being here and, and the socialisation of that's really important. What kind of support have you had? Uh, have you had additional resources to, in the aftermath of the fires? So we were lucky. We had, oh, I don't know, the pre one of the preeminent uh, psychologists in Australia, Dr Robert Gordon here. Um, and I'll never forget how he started because it was day one and it's all the staff back, so there's 30 people sitting up in the library and they get Tim's, you know, two minutes and they'll roll their eyes because it's me, but that's good. But it was good to, you know, welcome them back. And I'll hand over to Dr Robert Good, not knowing anything what he was going to do. Yeah. And he's um, a middle-aged man, very softly spoken, and he's sitting next to me. So he stood up. He said, my name is uh, Robert Good, and I'm here to talk to you about what's happening. And then he sat down. I went, oh, what's he doing? And no notes, no overheads, no anything. He just spoke calmly to our staff about the science and the cognitive structures of what kids will go through through trauma yeah. and how that would look for you as a staff to have the, the strategies in place to try and support them. And he spoke. Oh. 
hour and a half, hour and 45, and there wasn't a, a word said. It was just unbelievable. So he was the first part of another psychologist who was here and also some CRTs, uh, relief teachers, who mm-hmm. had three relief teachers here because I needed to gauge how our staff were feeling. Um, you know, some would come in the morning looking pretty fine and by 11 o'clock they'd, they'd, they'd probably need a rest. Yeah. So we had... Um, three of our staff lose everything. Mm-hmm. Uh, we had at least five families who've lost everything and then a lot of fire impacted people too. So we needed to manage that and we continued to have support through January and February. Uh, we had a, a, some really high quality people. Uh, Nusha de Cruz from the department who is a wonderful triple SO was here. The one thing that happened is a bit like the fireys which I draw your attention to. Um, in the emergency management and in the uh, relief support for the school, people come, but they only stay for two weeks. Mm. So there is a rollover of, okay, what does a succession plan look like? And especially in the emergency management team, I reckon that can be improved. Um, yet there's a whole lot of tooling and a whole lot of storytelling, a whole lot of data that these people will be dealing with. But because of oh and I understand that, they have to be rotated, but it, it is that continuity, especially for kids who don't want to keep retelling their story, yeah. who want to make the relationship with their, their person who's supporting them and make it a longer term relationship. Uh, we're very lucky right now with St Vincent de Paul, who um, we're actually talking about this today as a panel, we're employing a psychologist um, which to get help in Malakuta in terms of psych or OT support is just a contestable thing because we're so far away mm-hmm. and people don't apply. Um, is that we're going, looks like we're going to get someone here for the 12 months, which is going to be really supporting our school and wellbeing and, and our kids' engagement. But that's just one part of the strategy. Yeah. Um, yeah. Getting the staff back two together will be really important. That'll look interesting. So it's... You've spoken about mental health issues. What about other health issues in the for the kids and for the staff? Um, there's been a lot of devastation, a lot of homes, a lot of old homes that yeah. have been destroyed. So one of the things that happened, uh, which was a bit uh, probably a not an easy thing to manage, was around the air quality when we came back, uh, and we had to get enlist pretty strongly. My assistant principal Kathy did a great job with that, in, and I, in terms of getting the EPA involved and getting air quality measurement involved. We had air quality measurement outside the school. The air quality looks like this. We still have staff who don't want to stay in their homes because the homes next door are devastated and they are a bit. Um, they're, they're concerned around the quality of you know, the asbestos stuff and things that happen. And I noticed when the teams of Gro- Grocon's a major contractor here, um, and they're working their teams, um, there's a quite a few homes that are contaminated. They need to wet it down, del- deliver that stuff off site. It's a long way to Warboss to get rid of that. Yes. Um, the steel and the concrete, I think, has been offloaded here. But that I think it's a six hour truck return to get rid of that stuff and that's going to take time. Yep. Um, and of course, the rebuild will be really interesting. Um, I don't know the figures on Tartha. Tartha was a town in a couple of years ago pretty hard. They lost X amount of homes. Not many homes have been rebuilt. How many homes lost here about? Oh, over 100. Adam. They say um, oh, 140 odd dwellings and sheds and things. Out of how many is a good question. I'm not sure. You'd have to ask the shire about that. But when you think about a thousand people, there are a lot of holiday homes here. Yep. So that would be X amount of homes. Um, but it's still, a good, you know, when you drive around the top end where where we are here, and up the other end of town around Carbathon, there are a lot of homes. Um, and also around the outside of town as well. So your road is Terranova Drive. There's a lot of homes gone in, around yeah, here Bastion and Point. Bastion Point out, here, to the, out to the wall. There's the there are eight or ten homes just in that little area there, down, down towards the point. And then there's homes up here, and then the devastation of homes in that area, Stanley Avenue, and up the back of Becker Road, is another area. 
and then way over here at Carbathon there's homes and there's a few homes that got into Cools in wet and there's a few homes of course in the main drag coming into town. But where we are, we're, we're not far from where these homes have been devastated in Bastion Point and Terra. No, we're, 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 we're... 100 you know, metres. Yeah, well, a bit more than that, but on the same token up the back of the school here, there's, there's the CFA shed. The CFA shed was under attack. The school was under attack. There's fire areas in the school ground along the fence line that caught. Yep. And underneath a couple of the classrooms up the top there caught. And if the fireys weren't on the scene then... Protecting the, those assets. Yeah, yeah. The, the, those assets they, they tried try to protect. Yep. Yeah. So... Tim, what I want to take you through now is the before, during and after and ask you to think about how things might have been done differently or what can be improved for next time. Just from your own observations, maybe just within your own home, in the school, in the community. So in the preparedness, getting ready for a fire season, what, what's important and what more can, might be done? Wow, okay. Um, well, if I look at it from... If I look at it from sort of like fire management, which was the initial part of it, uh, the preparedness beforehand, um, we have to manage our... and protect our town better. Um, we have to resource strongly resource our agencies like um, Parks and Dwelp and the CFA to make sure they have a chance. Um, and that includes forest management. Uh, I'm not an expert in forest management, but from a personal point of view, the fire breaks that I look at aren't wide enough. Mm -hmm. um, and there is plans by good people to uh, that were actually sent to... Mm, government agencies beforehand that again weren't taken up um, and we need to work strongly with our, our all our stakeholders in making you know, Malakuta that unique place but well protected place too that we can I mean you can't fight a fire like we, we, we're in but you can fight ember attack mm -hmm. um, and you have a chance to defend um, if we have um, good fight good management of our fuel management in our forests, um, the way that looks, um, attracting the right flora and fauna and maintaining our beauty, um, that's really critical. But we need to certainly, fire, I believe, widen the fire breaks that we have existing and maybe create a few more. The recovery or the relief stuff is around you know, the organisations that have come to town have been extraordinary. Um, Red Cross, uh, Salvo, Save the Army... Um, all those people. The coordination of them um, could always be better. They set up at the hall when they moved up to the MDHS and everyone's offering layers of support and for some of our community they probably need better liaison between that, um, not just ring the number and, or not just mm -hmm. access the e email site or turn up and form a queue and wait, for, wait to be interviewed. Now, I don't know what that looks like, but th there's certain ways I think we could do better. We could certainly, um, in terms of recovery, uh, we're operating off a really great document from the department around trauma, mm -hmm. but it needs sustainability. Um, it needs consistency about if, if I'm going to have people come into my school or our school and talk around recovery and build relationships with kids, it needs to be a longer term thing mm. because that's where the, the students will respond best um, and how that looks for them is really important because it's going to be a really challenging year for our year 12s and like everyone in Australia who's been affected, um, it's going to be very challenging. So that's the reco recovery part also for our aged people. Mm -hmm. Now, like does have an aged population um, uh, doubly impacted by COVID-19, which we all are. Um, we need to make sure we have enough support in this town to make sure no one gets left behind. Mm -hmm. you know, no, one, no one's in their house too long alone. Um, all that sort of thing that's really important. Malaku is very good at that. We've got really great volunteer clubs, like the Lions Club is a very active club here, mm -hmm. and they do a lot of great work in that regard. 
Um, so in the long term, it will be we're in uncharted areas. So I think with our VCE stuff, trying to well, this I think I said I don't know if I said it before, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, it, there is a move with the VCAA, which and, and with VTAC around shortening up the outcomes and trying to keep a semblance of the year, given the fact that we might get our kids back soonish. Okay. Mm. Um, instead of trying to go too long into next year, um, our kids need certainty. Our universities will be under extraordinary pressure with their international students. But that whole, <laughs> that, that, that whole nightmare. But that you know, that might give opportunities for my kids at Malakuta. So you know, it's been a bit selfish. I'm being very selfish, but um, that's going to be a huge issue, and it will be an issue not in the next twelve months, but obviously an economic and, and, and human resource issue for thirty years to come. And that'll be interesting. So it's been a very significant year for you as the leader of the school community where do you want the school to be this time next year five years uh, okay um this is a privilege to be here um it's probably the most uh, oh, privileged i've been in any any vocation in any time and anywhere and i can see that the next you know, six months, 12 months, 18 months, five years, will be a really important part. Uh, Malakuta will rise, um, and it is rising now. Um, I have enormous faith in our community, and I believe it will be a vibrant, um, really strong, contextual Malakuta stamp, which is a really interesting thing to say, around what we offer our kids here, because we can micromanage, and we are very successful at doing that. Um, so that's why I'd hope for a whole lot of support for our community and our staff here. Um, our staff are quite extraordinary in trying to stretch, so they'll continue to do so. Mm. Is there anything you'd like to tell the commissioners? Now, you met with them um, on the 19th of March in the community forum. Right. We're now in May. Anything by way of an update? Um, there, there's been a lot of talk around... What does the um, all the donations that have happened? Mm -hmm. and some of the donations you don't need, but certainly there's been a lot of magnificence around that. Some of the earmarking for that we're not sure where it is because one thing I should mention is that there is a local community group formed mm -hmm. for me by which is a, an amazing effort. We wanted 12 candidates or 12 people to serve a Malakuta bushfire relief committee that would have a voice around what this town looks like. Well, we had 44 people nominate. Wow. Which just, again, tells you how wonderful this community really is. That's in the process of an electoral system now, my voting system, so they'll be up and running hopefully in the next couple of weeks. And, uh, the democracy in action. Oh, big time here. <laughs> it, it is the Greek model. <laughs> it is um, it, the people's voice are very strong, and so it should be. Um, and that would that's to be endorsed at all levels. But so it'll be really interesting to see how that coordinates with all federal, state, and other stakeholders around bushfire recovery. Um, and I look forward to being a part of that from the schools. I'm the on that didn't nominate. My job's here, looking after my students and my school community. Do you think there's a there's an important role for the local organisation using local knowledge? You so less top I'm, down and yeah. more bottom well, up. Well, you say important. No, it's, it's vital. Right. Yeah, it, it is what every community, and I'm sure there are other communities around Australia, where we'll be saying the same thing. That context is everything. Mm -hmm. you know, the way people operate in, in, in a town, uh, the way they they grow, live, and be is so important to understand. And yes, I believe, and I can say this because I've been in a few places in my time. Things are different. You know, Malakut is different to Corion. Corion is different to Talangata, different to Sorrento. Um, it's, it's that context we need to embrace and understand. I don't think I have anything more for you, Tim. Is there any? No. Just thanks for the opportunity. Um, there are plenty of good voices in Malakut, and I'm pr proud to be one, but um, not a voice. But I'm also pretty proud to be a principal at my school. 
Well, so we, thank you. We thank you for your time and we should let you get back to the work that you need yeah. to do. Ta. Okay. Thanks very much, Tim. Good on you, Dominic. The Royal Commission has adjourned and will resume shortly.
The Royal Commission has now resumed. Please be seated. Ms Hogan Doran. Chair, Commissioners, this afternoon we are going to focus further on the insights into the impact of the 2019-2020 bush, bushfire season upon people, businesses and the built environment. Tomorrow we will turn to the effect on the natural environment and on Friday we will specifically focus on critical infrastructure, including power and telecommunications. Uh, first up, um, Junior Council Assisting Kes Dubby will take the Commission to a number of documents we have received and which describe the scale of the recent bushfire season and the damage caused. We'll then have three witnesses, um, John Price from the Australian Financial Complaints Authority, uh, Kate Carnell, the Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, and Noel Clement from the Australian Red Cross. But to be clear, our main focus today is on the damage caused by the recent bushfires and the support that has been provided to assist people in recovering from that damage. This baseline evidence is only the first stage of our investigations. It's guided by the terms of reference into, among other matters, how arrangements for recovery from natural disasters might be improved. There are several areas we will touch on today which merit further investigation and to which we will return in future hearings to specifically investigate community and industry and organisational concerns. In particular, these appear to include issues around the effectiveness of insurance as a risk mitigation tool and the involvement of charities and volunteers in response to and recovery from natural disasters. Council Assisting conducted a panel session last week, virtually, with representatives from consumer groups Choice, the Consumer Action Law Centre, the Financial Rights Law Centre, the Australian Communications Consumer Action Network, as well as Mr Price from AFCA. This discussion, along with the detailed review of public submissions and stories of community witnesses, are feeding into our ongoing investigations in this area. The evidence adduced today is not designed to address all these issues, but simply to begin to set the scene upon which the Commission's further investigations will build. Ms Dovey will assist you, Commissioners. Thank you. Ms Dovey. First up, I tender the bundle effect documents, which are in the tender bundle as item 2.5. There's nine documents in that list, and I'm not proposing to read out the document numbers all at the start. I'm going to read them out as we go through each document in turn. But they will be tendered as number 2.5, numbers 1.9 through there. These are materials which we've drawn out to demonstrate the scale and effect of the 2019 to 20 bushfires. I'm going to start with the national picture, then take a bit of a look at some state figures in one particular state, and finally share some extracts of submissions demonstrating the effect at a local government level. Turning to the national figures, as the Commissioners are aware, on the 6th of January 2020, the Commonwealth Government established the National Bushfire Recovery Agency for a period of two years to lead and coordinate a national response to rebuilding communities affected by bushfires across large parts of Australia. The head of the NBRA, Andrew Colvin, the National Bushfire Recovery Coordinator, is going to appear next week to give evidence at the end of this hearing. The NBRA has very helpfully provided, in response to notices, information in advance of Mr Colvin's evidence, which evidenced the scale and effect of the recent bushfire season. I'm now going to bring up some of those documents. The first document to bring up, please bring up document PMC 501-001-0003. This is at tab F1 of the Commissioner's Bundle. It's an animation which runs for a minute and 25 seconds, and it shows the progress of the fires in the southeast of Australia between the beginning of September and the end of February, the most recent season. The active fires are shown in red, and the burn scar left behind is shown in yellow. Next week, when Mr Colvin appears, we'll see a version of this that shows the whole of Australia, but we've started with an up-close version because it more easily evidences a couple of features of the fires. One is that the fires didn't progress at an even pace, but often exploded in bursts across the country, challenging firefighting resources. And another is that the fires often surrounded period, locate, particular locations for periods of time 
and then sometimes went away to come back. And so communities were facing imminent threat for long periods of time and sometimes trying to move to recovery only to have the fire return. So we'll enter that uh, time-lapse animation uh, as an exhibit as you have marked it. It's in bundle 2.5. It will be exhibit 2.5.1. The second document is a document provided also by the NBRA. It's document PMC.5001001. That's at tab F2 of the Commissioner's Bundle. This is to be tendered as item number in Bundle 2.5 as item 2.5.2. Okay, and we'll take that. Uh as an exhibit as marked. Well, I do have a question. Are you going to talk to this? I am going bit? to talk to this, yes. Perfect. I have some <laughs> questions right. on it. So this document is a response to a notice to give information that sets out some statistics in relation to the damage caused in the recent bushfire season. If we can turn to page ending 0002, if we look at the answer to what is question 19 there, and in particular at the table, We've got some statistics in terms of the damage caused, which show us that the information provided says that 3,117 houses were destroyed, 6,310 outbuildings, 291 facilities. Looking at the second dot point under the table, we note that the NBRA says that the data is provided from trusted government sources. However, it's acknowledged that there's no standardised way of reporting the information to the NBRA. For example, New South Wales is the only state that reports on facilities, and so that figure of 291 is largely, if not wholly, and I, I, I suggest likely wholly drawn from New South Wales, um, and Queensland only reports on house destruction and damage. Now, this is a matter that we're going to be investigating further as we seek additional information, particularly from states and territories as we go forwards, to try to pull together a really clear picture of what's happened to the extent to which we can. So, so with that, then there is no Commonwealth agency that it, that has the data across Australia. Noting that there are two states missing from this as well: Northern Territory, <coughs> Western Australia, because they didn't activate under the disaster recovery funding arrangement. You're is absolutely that right. So, yeah. the we'll see later on. One of the documents we have shows each of the local government areas that was activated for assistance under the disaster recovery funding arrangements, and those arrangements are going to be dealt with in more detail at a later point in time when we look at look at the overarching funding arrangements. But essentially, they're a way of providing financial support for relief and recovery activities resulting from natural disasters and terrorist acts pursuant to an agreement between the states, territories and the Commonwealth Government. Now, you're absolutely right. Um, Western Australia and Northern Territory, there haven't been areas, any areas activated. And I'll show you a map what we're coming to before too long, which will indicate that there were fires in those areas. And again, that's something that we're going to look at a bit more as we investigate and seek further information from different parties. If we can bring up just the bit at the bottom of that same page under question 20, we just draw it that the NBRA has set out exactly that, that they acknowledge that this is only in relation to those areas activated for assistance under the DRFA and that significant additional areas were impacted by fire, particularly in the Northern Territory. If we can move on to the page ending 0003, at the top of the page there's a table which shows us the area of land the NBRA has noted as being affected by the fires. And again, we'll see that the Western Australian and Northern Territory are not included in these figures. At the bottom right-hand corner, we can see that the full figure is 8.287 million hectares were affected and that line, the total line along the bottom, shows us the totals across the country for agriculture, almost 1.4 million, forestry, 2.1 million, nature conservation and managed resource protection, making up best part of half of the affected area at 3.5 million, um, rural residential and farm in infrastructure, 10,000, urban intensive areas, 50,000 and an other category at almost 1.2 million hectares. So that, that's the scale of the areas that were burnt. Again, 
only including those areas for which we have reporting, or the NBRA has reporting. If we could move to the next page, ending in 0004. And here, we've requested some information in terms of what the NBRA has on the impact on businesses, primary producers and industries, and what we get is a lot less specific. It is, it is an area where it is far more difficult to get clear figures. You can see in the first dot point under question 23 that the NBRA has had analysis undertaken by EY, Ernst & Young, on behalf of them, which suggests the total economic damage as measured by annual loss of economic output is in the order of $3.6 billion. Um, if we can go further down the page... Sorry, to can the I just uh, clarify certainly. that? Is that against the same standards as previously, which is not all states, or is that across Australia? That I, I think we... We might get them to I think, uh, clarify that. I think it's a that. question which needs to be deferred okay. and put to the NBRA so that okay. we can clarify what these figures actually mean. And I think it's also going to be a process going forwards okay. because the NBRA themselves are relying on information coming from each of the states. Okay. Uh, we'll just let them know that, that, that we would like to have an understanding of that data. Absolutely. Thank you. Moving down to the third dot point, information provided by DAWE to the NBRA we can see that there's an estimate that approximately 2,600 agricultural businesses were directly affected by the bushfires. And, oh, sorry, again, these are located within the local government areas. And then moving down to the next dot point below that, the most affected industries include tourism, forestry, agriculture and horticulture and there's some statistics in relation to some specific industries that have provided information. 1% of Australia's vineyards were burnt. 4% of the wine grape production was lost. Um, some statistics in relation to the apple and pear industry. And also noting that the forestry industry was particularly hard hit, but the full effect isn't known, because, but 17% of Australian productive native forests were burnt and 6% of Australian plantations within, were within fire impacted areas. So that's a work in progress, essentially, that we're going to have to look at a bit more. Just down at the very bottom of that page, under question 24, we've asked a question about specifically looking to small businesses and information on small businesses that were affected. And what the NBRA says that in those areas that were activated, there are approximately 640,000 small businesses. If we move across to the next page, ending 0005, At the top, that first, the first full paragraph at the top, we can see that of that 640,000 in the affected areas, 21,405 small businesses and primary producers have been approved for support in the form of loans and grants cost shared between the Commonwealth and the states. Um, and the NBRA says at the end of that paragraph, that this gives a more accurate indication of those businesses that were severely impacted. And this is a matter of further investigation to seek to clarify and get further information on the number of small businesses that have in fact been affected by the fires and the extent to which they're getting the support that they need. We'll be hearing from Kate Carnell, the um, Australian Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman, later this afternoon, and Syria she can speak to to some extent. We're also anticipating getting further evidence from community witnesses who can speak to their specific experience, and it's a matter we'll otherwise investigate in other ways. Can we please move to document SER 9001 0001 0001? This is at tab F3 of the bundle, and it should be tendered as item 2.5.3. Okay, so we'll receive that as the exhibit as marked. That's right. Thank you. Thank you. This is a response by Services Australia to a notice to give information, and Services Australia again will be having someone attend at the end of this hearing block, and there are questions that we can put to them around the support that they're providing at that later point in time. In order to get a sense of the kind of support that's been given to affected people in the community, I'm just going to quickly describe the three main kinds of payments that Australia, Services Australia has been making. 
The first there is the Australian Government Disaster Recovery Payment, known as the AGDRP, which is a once-off non-means-tested payment for eligible individuals who've been adversely affected. The second up there, and perhaps we could move down a little bit so we can read the text, is the Disaster Recovery Allowance, which is a short-term income support payment paid for up to 13 weeks. And then the third, if we can drop down on the list, is the additional payment for children, the APC, down the bottom. Um, the, the two just above the APC are an ex gratia payment that can be made to New Zealand citizens, but the third one I want to focus on is that additional payment for children, which is a payment that can be automatically paid, or that is automatically paid, to parents, carers who are deemed eligible for that first once-off payment, the AGDRP. If we can move on to the next page, which is ending in 0003, down the bottom we see that Services Australia report that they've paid $261 million, $989,192 to people in respect of these payments. The bulk of that for the first two, with about $32 million of it being the additional payment for children. If we can go up to the top of that page, under the first dot point, this Services, Services Australia has provided information on the waiting times to provide these payments, or at least to approve the payments. And those waiting times average at six days for the once-off payment and 35 days for the 13-week more ongoing payment. So that's, that's the way that that appears to be working at the moment. And there are more questions that can be put to Services Australia next week. Just moving on, finally, on that document to page ending in 0005. In the fifth dot point under point five, we can zoom into that. We notice that Service Australia draws attention to something that's been coming up repeatedly in conversations with community witnesses and across the board, which is that multiple avenues for individual financial assistance require separate applications to multiple agencies. The application process requires Australians impacted by a disaster to repeatedly tell their story in order to meet similar eligibility eligibility requirements. This can be cumbersome, confusing and stressful to those who are vulnerable in an already challenging time. And we're being told that time and time again when we talk to people in the community. And, and that confirms that it's a statement though. It doesn't actually answer the question at the top. It states the problem, not the opportunity to, uh, to improve. So I think we will look to explore that when we talk to them as well. Yes, Chair. Can we please move on to the next document, which is ICA 501001001. This is the first of two documents we've received from the Insurance Council of Australia. We've made two requests of them and they've helpfully responded two times. This first, I'm going to actually the second of the two requests. It's at tab F4 of the bundle. It should be tendered as item 2.5.4. So we'll take uh, that exhibit as marked. And if we can move to the page ending in 0002. At the table at the top of this page, the Insurance Council of Australia has helpfully set out some statistics showing the number of insurance claims and the value, the estimated value of the insurance claims, which is in there at about $2.2 billion at this stage. And you can see it's broken down between domestic building, about $1.2 billion, um, commercial property, $719 million, um, business interruption, $54 million, commercial other, 51 million. So businesses are getting some assistance through this way and we, we can try to track that down. And we try to pull these pieces together to get an overall picture of the damage that's happening to people. If we can go down further down... Closed, closed. Sorry, closed there uh, means that what? Means that the whole of that, the money's been paid and therefore the, the case has been uh, finalised as far as the insurer is concerned. That's my understanding of that figure. Thank you. If we can go further down the page, on in the bottom paragraph, the second dot point, we can see that the Insurance Council reports that 
normally there might be about a th almost a 4% of lodge claims being denied across business, but for this particular event, that the rate of denial is significantly lower. It's estimated as 0.66%. And I just, I just draw that out as something which is, is standing out for this particular event. And we'll hear from Mr Price of AFCA that the sense that they're getting as well is that, that insurers are in many ways responding very well to this particular event. If we can move on to the following page, which is 0003, there's a discussion here about the removal of debris costs for people who, whose houses have been totally destroyed or, or very significantly damaged. Um, the Insurance Council says that the debris can contain contaminants, for example, asbestos, and that is certainly something that we're otherwise hearing from information that's coming in in submissions and from the community, as well as items that can cause injury. Around halfway down, the Insurance Council notes that in an effort to reduce the financial impact of disaster victims, preserving as much of some insured as possible for rebuilding, governments in New South Wales, Victoria and South Australia agreed to fund and manage removal of debris activ activity at no cost to victims or insurers. And so this is a thing that's been going on through the key states that have been affected that probably have the most damage in terms of housing. Two paragraphs down, the Victorian government has identified that the mean cost of this removal is around $54,500. So it's a significant cost that's being saved to people. Well, the, re the, the big effect of saving that cost, as I understand it from the document, is that otherwise it's deducted from the insured amount, so that um, difficult as it is to rebuild within an insured amount, even setting aside questions of under-insurance, it, if, if, you, if you've got a $250,000 bill, um, for removal of debris, then there's not going to be much left for a lot of people to, to try and build again. That's absolutely right. It will depend on the policy. There will be policies where the removal of debris may be sit separately out yes, from the course. insured amount. But sometimes it's not. Absolutely. Do we have any... We have no information at the moment as to whether any other... I mean, it, the, any of the other states impacted by bushfires have taken the same course? We don't have information on that at the moment. If we can please move to the second of the two Insurance Council documents, it's document ICA 500-001-0001. This is tab five of the bundle and should be tendered as item 2.5.5. So it'll be received as an exhibit as marked. In this response, on page 0002, we received information on the information the Insurance Council has on the handling of claims. And just to note that under 2.A, that first dot point, the Insurance Council reports that no material issues have presented to date that have impacted assessment and or settlement timeframes overall. 41% of residential building claims have been closed. However, the following dot point set out various aspects that could cause delay. COVID-19 is an obvious one. And, and no doubt we're all aware of the potential for that, um, that insurance have been challenged by the large geography for the event and the remote natures of some locations. Mr Cashmore described how there was a six-hour round trip to remove asbestos debris from Malakuta because it's so far away from the, lo le the place where you can dump it and then come back again. Um, also notes that while there is a significant financial benefit to people in having the government organise the removal of debris, there has been delays in the ways in which that has done. There are still houses out there that where blocks have not been cleared. And that so the industry's reliance on government resources has meant, according to the Insurance Council, that there are delays in claims handling in many instances, and that delay sits outside the insurer's control because they're waiting for the government to do it. So it goes both ways. I understand from the community forums, Kangaroo Island has a similar issue with uh, not, they can't just clear it, they just can't get it off the island. Uh, and I know that there was mechanisms being discussed to try and uh, resolve that as, as well. So I, I think it's, uh, there's a lot of communities that this has affected. That's right. And asbestos is a significant issue with this and it prevents people from returning to their blocks until such time as... Is there any information on, on what sort of percentage of places that have been destroyed did have asbestos problems? Do we know anything about that yet? We don't have an overall figure for that, but I am... The next document will help to some extent. So if we can, that's, those are the figures that we have on a national level. So if we can now turn to document CJN.001-2.5.6. 
001001. We're going to have a look at a snapshot at the state level, and this is New South Wales. This is produced by the New South Wales Department of Communities and Justice, the Office of Emergency Management. This is tab F6 of the bundle. It should be tendered as document item 2.5.6. Okay, so that'll be received as an exhibit with that number. Thank you. So this gives a bit of a snapshot. Um, as of 24th of April, 2020, and this is a raw document received from the state, and we'll be investigating these figures in more detail as we go forwards. And we'll also be seeking this kind of information from other states to the extent to which we can get it. And investigating the different kinds of things that states record and the inconsistencies between those and the consistencies between them. So we can see here that they've assessed a total of over 41,000 properties. 2,475 houses have been destroyed. 284 facilities destroyed. We saw earlier that the NBRA recorded a total of 291 facilities destroyed. It's very close to this figure. It seems likely that almost all of those are in New South Wales. Um, going further down, there's an estimate of 880 kilometres of roads have been affected. Oh, sorry, still, still up in that table, just further down in that table. Um, that 24 Aboriginal land council and community sites have been affected. Um, 141,755 hectares of Crown land, um, estimated private fencing adjoining Crown land, 10,000 kilometres. The numbers are really big. Moving further down, if we can go down to the animal and agriculture section of the table. Before we go there, I just note there's nothing in the mental health and trauma. Is They're not tracking that or they don't have the stats? Uh, there's a notation. Quantified. The notation, the notation says significant impact. Yeah. Oh, the, yes, I mean it says significant impact, not quantified. quantified. We will be asking them more questions. Okay. I, I, I wouldn't want to hold this against them. It, no, no, no. it simply just... doesn't fit in this in this particular snapshot. Okay, thanks. It yeah. may it may be. I mean, bearing in mind the evidence we heard this morning about the fact that a lot of this research is still ongoing, and we did hear from Professor Johnston as a as to a um, for, well, she had the smoke impact. I don't know if there's I didn't get the impression from the evidence this morning that the work had progressed so far to be able to quantify. I mean, I mean, it's, 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 it's quantifying the impact. It's not quantifying even the cost of it. It's quantifying the impact of it. I don't know whether any such work is, would have been done. And Commissioner, you recall I, mean, I said this morning that um, we've not approached the Departments of Health and the That's states right. and territories yet. We don't have that information, okay. uh, and and we are proposing to give them a. A, a fairly extended period of time when we do ask them for that information, but we will ultimately report that back to you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Looking at the animal and agriculture, um, there's an estimated 88, almost 89,000 kilometres of fencing that's been destroyed, and one thing when we've been talking to people out in rural areas is that replacing fencing is a, is a huge issue. Um, and fencing is sometimes not entirely covered by insurers. Sometimes they'll only cover half the cost of fencing, even if your fences are insured. There are issues associated with that. Just, just um, as a heads up, there's also an issue about fencing that um, uh, goes alongside national parks. That's right, because... And the, the co who bears the cost of replacement of that fencing too. That's right. And g generally speaking, my understanding is that insurers will often cover the whole cost of that because any private property is expected to cover the cost of the fencing between themselves and the land. But if you are uninsured, then you're going to be responsible for the full cost of that fencing. Mm -hmm. Not only if you're uninsured, but, it, I mean, it, you know, when neighbours, you know, if you take the old idea of neighbours sharing fencing, then That's it, right. I, I don't know if it happens when your neighbour is um, not a private person. Yes. Or company. Yes, that's right. Looking down at the bottom of the page, there's a box titled Multi-Agency Building Impact Assessments and Make Safe. And here we come, and here's some level of data around the number of houses that do in fact have asbestos in them, as assessed by New South Wales. Um, so this is presumed tested. So 600 tested and 121 positive is the way I read these figures. But again, we'll be going into more detail with that and we'll be looking at it um, as a bigger issue. Um, it is in any event a material number of people who have asbestos there. 
to move on, that's, that's what I was, I'm going to go to in terms of the state level. I'm now going to move to the local government level. And to start with that, I'm going to bring up a document um, number RCN 900 008 0001. And this is a map, again provided by the NBRA. And this shows in grey the declared local government areas that have been declared for assistance. And the red is the burn scar. So this shows us, and sorry, I should say, it's tab F7 of the bundle. It should be tendered as item 2.5.7. And it will be received as an exhibit as marked. Thank you. Um, so the bulk of the recovery work that the NBRA is involved in in any event is that grey area, which you'll see largely comes down the eastern coast. But there is a lot of other red, and that's something that we're going to have a look at. Interestingly, it's hard to see if some of those LGAs were affected by fire or directly affected. Must the, that they, were, they all were? These are all the ones that have been activated, activated. for support. Okay. Um, and this is information from the NBRA. So that, that is a question that perhaps we can put to the NBRA okay. as to the extent to which, what, what triggers that activation. Yeah, OK. And I'm, I am assuming that different levels of support are required for the different ones yeah. that have been activated. But um, I, I do think there's questions that we're going to be looking at further in relation to this. OK, and the significant burn scar areas that were in LGAs that weren't activated as well. <coughs> Thank you. That's right. Yeah. To have a look at the local government area, we're going to look at just some brief extracts from two local council submissions. The first is that of the Tuong Shire. It's document NND 001010620002 underscore triple zero one. This is document at tab F8. It should be tendered as document 2.5.8. Okay, we'll receive that exhibit as marked. If we can turn to the page ending in underscore triple zero seven. There we are. So this is the Tuong Shire, it's in the northeast of Victoria, and it sits just under the Murray River. The, the top border is the Murray. And this shows the extent of that Shire area that was burnt in these fires. That's a very significant extent. If we can then go over to page ending in underscore triple zero eight, we get some statistics of what the council reports has happened in their shire. Um, 548 properties affected, 71 destroyed, of which 42 were a primary residence, 5,067 stock destroyed. They report 35,000 hectares of pasture lost, 3,000 hectares of plantation lost, um, a bit over 3,000 kilometres of fencing. So that's just a sense of what can happen in just one local government area. The next council, just to get a snapshot from, is the Snowy Valleys Council. This is document NND 00100408 underscore triple zero one. This is at tab F9 of the bundle. It's the last document I'm going to take you to. It should be tendered as item 2.5.9. And we'll receive that as an exhibit as marked. Uh, <laughs> yes. This submission is titled Submission to the New South Wales Independent Bushfire Inquiry. It is, I have checked, this is the submission that was made to us, and I believe that to simply be an error on the front page of the document as, as provided to us. But, but I think um, they also said that they were providing us with the same submission as they provided New South Wales. That may well be right, but this is, this is in effect the submission to us, notwithstanding right. the title of the document. Uh, I won't take it to heart. <laughs> if we can please go to the page ending in underscore triple zero three. And again, this is Snowy Valleys is just north of the Murray from Tuong. And this again is a map showing the area of the fire over the Snowy Valley Council. And they report that the equivalent of 45% of the local government area was burnt. On this map, if you look closely, you can see the locations of two of our community witnesses. Around the middle, you can see Tumbarumba, and that's where Professor Sue Townsend lost her home just outside of Tumbarumba. And over on the far left, you can see Jinjelic. And uh, we have a witness from Jen who will be speaking to us 
likely on Friday, and we'll be hearing from her as well. If we can move to the next, to the page numbered, um, ends in number 0005, we get a bit of a snapshot of how, what the more specific effect has been. 45% burnt, 960 farming properties affected, 182 houses destroyed. Um, down in the bottom half, the Cabramurra School was destroyed. Um, 587 outbuildings were destroyed. Um, moving on to the next page, ending in 0006. Um, we can see two businesses were destroyed, 46 facilities. 44 houses were damaged. They lost the Batlow Cannery, the Only Community Hall, the Union Jack Hall, the Paddy's Fall Toilet Block, um, and 100,000 hectares of agriculture. Um, I probably should have also said this is, this is a local council in which there was a fatality and 12 injuries, which was noted on the previous slide as well. So that's just a snapshot of what it can look like in the local area. Um, these are just figures and they don't tell us what it was like to be there on the ground, and that's also why we're hearing from community witnesses. This, this was one of the areas that the Commission visited and it was uh, quite telling uh, right. right around the area. And from memory, Batlow was one of the towns that was declared undefendable, uh, but people pulled together to defend it. Mm. So, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Completes the tender. That completes the tender, thank you. Thank you. Commissioners, I'm now proceeding to call in fairly quick succession have three witnesses this afternoon and then we have <clears throat> the video evidence of Kirsty Hargraves from Malacuta, a small business um, employee in Malacuta. Um, I'll deal with the documents first. I tender the Australian Financial Complaints Authority response to a notice to give, it's behind tab G1, uh, that's dot code FCA 500 001 0001. And the supplementary data update, which we received this morning, um, that's behind tab G2, that's FCA 501 001 0001, and those will be tendered as exhibits 2.6 with document numbers 2.6.1 and 2.6.2. They'll be received as exhibits as marked. Thank you. I call John Price. Mr Price, will you take an oath or affirmation? Just one moment, Mr Price. We'll just make sure that your um, microphone has been turned up at our end. Will you take an oath or affirmation? I'll take an affirmation, please. Mr Price, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr Price, you're the Lead Ombudsman Insurance with the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. I am. And you've been with the authority for some time, including its predecessor organisation, the Financial Ombudsman Service, is that correct? That's correct. I've been with uh, originally the Insurance Ombudsman Service since 2004, Financial Ombudsman Service since 2010. If you could just briefly sketch to the commissioners, what's the role and function of the of AFCA, if I may refer to it in that way? Yes, the Australian Financial Complaints Authority, uh, AFCA, uh, is uh, the independent external dispute resolution service for the financial se sector and offers a free dispute resolution scheme for consumers and small business. In addition to our uh, complaint resolution service, uh, role, AFCA is, has responsibilities to investigate, resolve and report to regulators on systemic issues. In relation to systemic issues, we'll go to a moment into some of the actual claims data that we've just received by way of update from the Insurance Council and, the, and AFCA's experience of complaints being made by consumers in respect of um, any insurance disputes they have. But in the course of your work since the 2019-2020 bushfires, is AFCA detecting any systemic issues? Not systemic issues in the sense of uh, the insurance industry. We've had 
Uh, five matters referred to us. Four of those have uh, already been cleared as not being systemic. And there is a current matter which we are looking at uh, to determine whether or not we should proceed further with the investigation. The updated data you provided today in relation to claims, uh, if we could go to DOC FCA 501 0001 0001, as I understand it, that gives the most recent available data as to complaints received in relation to the 2019-2020 bushfires. And if we could go to page three, um, just note yes. that that document was received by the Commission today in answer to a request by us on the 25th of May, which I think was Monday. Uh, so we thank you for that um, prompt response in providing the supplementary material. Um, if we could go to page three under the heading update, as I understand it, the claims amount that's been in dispute is in the order of 6.8 million, is that right? That's, that's correct. Um, we have received uh, a total of 68 uh, insurance related disputes with total claim amount of 6 million 840, sorry, 6 million 847 thousand dollars. Now, one of the matters that we've seen um, had reported to us through uh, consumer groups and, and, and also the Insurance Council as well, is that there's some time or some lag in the process of insurance claims being made and any disputes elevating to a level where they might come to the attention of, uh, of AFCA. Is that right in your experience? There, there is a uh, lag in the sense that uh, a consumer who has a complaint uh, first goes back to the insurer for their what's called their internal dispute resolution. The insurer has 45 days in that process to resolve a matter. Um, if they then come to AFCA, we refer it back to the consumer, uh, sorry, to the insurer uh, uh, to give them one last chance to resolve. Um, the reality with the bushfires is that many people have come directly to AFCA and we have referred the matters back to the insurers. And as a result, we've been able to resolve 47 uh, complaints already. We only have 21 live complaints uh, in relation to insurance. And uh, we have paid out or, or recommended compensation uh, of over $3.3 million. And speaking generally, based on the long experience that you have with AFCA, its predecessor FOSS, and its predecessor with the Insurance uh, Ombudsman. Is this the uh, uh, dispute data that you were expecting, or is it unexpected in some way? I, I think what we've seen is a significant improvement uh, in the insurance industry response to natural disasters over the years. We don't typically receive a lot of disputes from bushfires. Um, but uh, in particular since 2009 and, uh, and uh, the Black Saturday bushfires, since then we've, uh, we've had numerous uh, natural disasters in Australia and the insurance industry has uh, become very proactive in dealing with these matters, um, being uh, very conciliatory in their approach, uh, proactive in involving the local communities and uh, working with AFCA and consumer groups to resolve matters. Um, so that has, we've seen that result in a reduction in the number of disputes coming towards AFCA in these type of complaints. And when you say these type of complaints, that's principally in relation to claims handling, is that right? Principally in relation to claims handling. Uh, claims delay is a, uh, a typical complaint. And you will see from one of the examples in our paper, uh, reference to a claims delay. Um, the actual delay was really minimal, um, but it highlights the anxiety and stress that people feel when they're faced with uh, uh, issues in particular surrounding their accommodation. One of the, you set out a number of case studies in the first response. Um, I don't propose to take you to them, but and the first one I note though was concerning claim studies. But the second one concerned a claim for business interruption insurance. And um, one of the matters that um, can be, it appears to be an issue, and I'd ask you to confirm this, is that um, 
the coverage that is offered by a policy may be limited in its terms. For example, uh, a business might have its business earnings fall dramatically because the small business is, um, uh, is unable to be um, accessed because of road blockages, but the policy might not necessarily respond. Is that the kind of thing that comes to AFCA and has in these instances? We, we haven't seen many uh, uh, business-related disputes uh, at AFCA uh, arising from this uh, disaster. But yes, these type of exclusions exist or limitations on policy coverage exist, uh, and they do come to AFCA. This was a, um, uh, in terms of the particular example that we have given, um, the matter was uh, expedited to a panel to consider whether or not there was a, a basis for payment, and the panel made a decision that there wasn't in this case. Um, it is important to realise that uh, AFCA's decisions are not binding on consumers or small business, and uh, that uh, the particular business is now able to pursue the matter through a court if they wish to. You mentioned about exclusions <laughs> so the coverage might have might be limited in some way or that certain types of damage might be excluded under the policy. Um, we had some evidence this morning about smoke impacts on people. Uh, what about smoke impacts on, on businesses or um, business furnishings or, or, or things like that? Is that often covered by insurance or an excluded item? I suppose the best answer I can give there is that it's not something that we're seeing as a complaint. Right. So whether the policies are specifically excluding it and the insurers deciding that they will pay those claims is something that I really can't comment on. Um, I think our total number of uh, commercial property disputes received is two. Right. Is it it's possible, is it, that those kind of complaints might be pursued in other forums, other forum, it's or other bodies? It's certainly possible that that might occur, although uh, AFCA has the ability to deal with matters uh, involving complaints of up to a million dollars uh, and award, uh, uh, in general insurance, award compensation of up to $500,000. So you would expect most of these matters if there is a dispute, will come before AFCA. All right. This example we considered just a moment ago was uh, a claim in relation to business interruption insurance, but um, ultimately a consideration of the terms of the policy suggested that the claim that was made was outside the terms of the policy. Are you seeing any issues in relation to consumers' understanding of the terms of their policies and what might be covered or not covered when they either purchase insurance or when they ultimately come to look to make a claim on their insurer? Yes, I think the biggest single issue that we have in general insurance is disclosure. Uh, not disclosure by consumers, but disclosure of the terms and conditions of the policy. There have been numerous uh, studies um, by the Insurance Council of Australia by the Financial uh, Rights Legal Centre, by ASIC, and there was a Treasury discussion paper uh, that commenced in January last year uh, that acknowledged that consumers do not understand the extent of cover uh, under policies. The PDS that's provided to people, product disclosure statement, uh, is in reality a complex legal document. Um, questions is about whether the policy is a defined events policy, an accidental damage policy, whether it excludes cover within a certain distance of fire or, uh, um, or, or not, uh, are all not things that people are looking for when they're purchasing a policy. It would appear that people purchase on the basis of price and advertising. I think we're all guilty of that. Um, uh, and I really do think that there is a need now to uh, have the debate around standard levels of cover uh, that can't be contracted out of, standard uh, definitions that clearly uh, explain to consumers what they're entitled to, uh, so that people can understand the type of cover that they've purchased. And if an insurer is going to step away from that cover, that they make it very clear 
uh, not hide it within the body of the policy, but make it very clear and upfront that this does, no longer covers that type of policy. You might there's just... been discussions. <laughs> sorry, there's been discussions around having it something similar to um, what we see with medical insurance, having three levels of cover: a basic, a, a silver, bronze, or I should say bronze, silver, and gold levels of cover. That type of description. Um, I think the debate needs to, to really uh, be accelerated there so that we can overcome these problems. One of the matters you spoke about is standard levels of cover. What about standard definitions? You've spoken in the past and there's been a substantial work in the industry, as I understand it, in relation to bringing consistency to the definition of flood, floods for the purposes of flood insurance. What of the position in relation to definitions of fire? We don't, we don't see a lot of disputes relating to the definition of fire, but we've certainly seen the benefit of having a standard definition of flood. Um, when uh, Wyvernhoe Dam uh, uh, burst in, or was released in, uh, in 2011, AFCA received some 1,300 complaints. Um, Cyclone Debbie, a bigger event, 2017, after the, def uh, after the standard definition of flood uh, was introduced, we received only 430 complaints. Townsville, uh, in 2019, we've received 161 complaints. I think it speaks for itself. It's, it's factual. What about um, any issues in relation to affordability of insurance? Is that a matter that comes to the attention of AFCA, either um, individually or on a systemic basis? It, it, uh, it can come to AFCA on a systemic basis occasionally, although we are limited in our ability to look at uh, actuarial data. Um, but I think affordability is likely to be an issue that we will see going forward. Um, anecdotally, the insurance uh, companies have uh, uh, indicated that uh, there may be issues with reinsurance going forward. Uh, which will uh, lead to an increase in the cost of insurance across uh, the, uh, the board. Um, we are seeing uh, with COVID-19 uh, issues arising and, as, uh, and in the case of Australia, um, we've had seven major natural disasters in the last 12 months and that will impact on uh, the affordability of insurance for everybody. The last matter I want to raise with you is um, what appears to be, from your response or the authorities' response, the emergence of a, a new uh, development, which is a rise in a fee-for-service claims management bodies, that is people essentially acting as an agent or broker in relation to assisting people to make claims, but charging a fee for that and taking that from, uh, deducting that from any successful claim. Is that something that's of concern to AFCA? It, it certainly is. It's something that has developed over the last couple of years and we are increasingly seeing people come to AFCA uh, assisted by claims management or, or fee-for-service uh, claims management uh, bodies um, where really they, uh, they're not required. Uh, AFCA is an investigative uh, process and uh, people are able to come to AFCA without assistance. We uh, are finding that in the claims management service area, there's very little assistance provided by the claims management service provider, yet they could be charging anything up to 30%. They're un uh, of a cash settlement. They're unregulated. Uh, at the moment, and we think that, uh, and along with other uh, consumer groups, uh, consider that uh, there should be special regulation to bring these people into regu uh, under regulation and protect consumers. Thanks very much, Mr Price. Is there anything else that you think may be of assistance or benefit to the commissioners to know? I think in terms of the uh, I've made the comment about the industry being proactive, and I think it's instructive for the Commissioner to understand that AFCA as a body in the last 12 months or thereabouts has received close to 100,000 disputes in the last 
financial year, we've received over 14,000 um, general insurance disputes, yet we have only received 68 uh, general insurance disputes related to this bushfire. I think that indicates to me at this stage that the uh, insurance industry has performed uh, reasonably well and proactively in dealing with a lot of these matters. Mr Zinn. Yeah, thank you, Mr Price, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. We appreciate that very much. I've got a couple of okay. questions for you. It's more, they're more process questions. And you talked about floods and uh, how that's improved over, over time with insurance. But is there any... Is there anything dictating that insurance companies have to tell you if you live in a bushfire affected area when they uh, when you take out insurance? There is in a flood affected area, but it, sometimes bush, bushfire affected areas aren't as obvious to to people living in suburbia. No, there's nothing. Yes, sorry, Commissioner. There, there's nothing that I'm aware of that requires an insurer to inform a person they're in a bushfire affected area. Um, uh, and uh, I appreciate, in particular, with uh, the change in climate, uh, that more people are likely to be impacted by bushfires in, uh, in the past. Yeah, especially, I guess, if someone has a, an on, a, just a rolling policy that rolls every year, and during that time, the classification of your property changes, but you may not be aware of it, uh, is one. And I know that, that uh, from some community engagement, that has been uh, one of the issues. The other one I think came up early in our community engagement uh, was where some affected people early on in the fires, noting this fire season went for about six months. Early on in the fire season, took an early, chose to take an early payment, uh, payout that included removal of debris and all that. And then later on, governments came out and, uh, and chose to cover that, uh, that removal of debris. Is there any comeback for insurance policy owners in that, or is that... The deal's done and uh, and everyone moves on. Now, under the General uh, Insurance Code of Practice, uh, if a person's received a cash settlement, uh, they can come back uh, if they believe that cash settlement's inadequate within 12 months. There's no such time limit on AFCA. Uh, a person could certainly come to AFCA uh, any time if they believe that uh, the settlement was inadequate. Um, it's certainly one thing that has occurred, and I perhaps should have raised this when talking with the, uh, Ms Hogan Doran. Um, part of the issues we receive are around delays, um, and there have been uh, questions raised around delays caused by the failure to remove debris. Unfortunately, the government-sponsored program um, has often been... The, uh, the catalyst for that delay, preventing the uh, insurer commencing the repair work. My understanding, uh, uh, when the government uh, undertook the, to remove uh, the debris, is that the insurance companies would apply the money that would otherwise have been spent by the insurer in removing uh, the debris. They would apply that to the sum insured. Um, I think uh, what we do need is to have some clarification around that to ensure that uh, consumers are being properly compensated and that uh, the uh, removal of rubbish has occurred as promised by the, uh, by the government. Thank you. I appreciate that. I'll just go to the other commissioners and see if they have any questions. Commissioner Bennett. Thank you. I just have one, one small question. I understand you said there were 68... Uh, only 68 uh, complaints that have come to Africa in relation to the bushfires. And I understand that it's difficult geographically because the bushfires w were not evenly spread throughout the country. Is that, but um, in terms of the nature of the complaints, is, are you, is there any geographical um, comment that you can make in relation to them? I mean, is there any kind of complaint that has been uh, more closely identified with a part of a state or a, a particular area, or is that just not something you can really deal with, or it doesn't really apply because because we had so many more bushfires in Victoria and New South Wales, for example? Well, the uh, obviously we, we have in our um, submission provided a bit of a uh, map to show the distribution of the complaints. Um, 
But uh, look, the reality is they were in the major affected areas and it's the same type of issue that, that arises uh, from these uh, areas. One of the problems, uh, and, and I think it's created by the obvious and understandable level of anxiety and stress that people suffer, is that if you have a, uh, an insurance assessor go out, and I had a particular example um, uh, in Batesman's Bay, whilst uh, the area around Batesman Bay was uh, still burning, after received uh, an email or uh, an SMS, I should say, uh, from a person that was barely uh, intelligible, um, that uh, I rang that person late at night, concerned for their, what was happening, um, the person was able, was quite articulate. Um, they had already received 12 months temporary accommodation payment from their insurer at their request, uh, but they'd had an assessor come out who indicated they would require three quotes um, before they could get uh, their total loss insurance payment. Now, that clearly wasn't the insurance company's policy. I rang the insurer that night. The following morning, they had somebody go and visit that person in Batemans Bay, despite the fact that there were fires everywhere, uh, and the matter was resolved. It is that communication piece during these uh, events that is so critical to everybody uh, to try and ensure that we don't get people unnecessarily upset. Thank you. That's a very thank you for sharing that story with us, uh, Commissioner. The the map that was referred to by Mr Price is at FCA 500 001 0001 at 0005. Just get that up and then Commissioner McIntosh will have a question. Now, as I understand it, uh, Mr Price, just if I may, Chair, just to clarify, um, that was the complainant's postcodes plotted on a map to give a visual representation of where the complaints have arisen. That was based on the initial response uh, from April by AFCA of about... Um, I'm just trying to work out what, what's the denominator. 78 complaints at that point. Um, but nothing that's been provided by way of update indicates that there's any material change to that distribution of complaints. Is that as you understand should clarify it? The, yes, I, I, that's right. I should clarify. We've, AFCA has received 110 complaints in total, but only 68 relate to general insurance. I think my question, though, was whether or not there was any, whether there was a, the nature of the complaints varied particularly. Um, across locations rather than the numbers? No, the nature of complaints doesn't vary. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr Price, for your evidence. Uh, quick question. What's the uh, best way of finding, finding out how many claims have been handled by claims management providers, either in this event or in previous events? Um, I'd love to know. Uh, the um, I, I, I think probably through the insurers um, who would be seeing those. AFCA is keeping uh, a record of, uh, uh, of what's coming in now, um, and we're closely monitoring uh, the performance of the claims management services. We have under our rules the ability to not accept a dispute from a claims management service if we believe that they are not engaging in proper conduct. Um, but otherwise, we're, we're quite limited uh, because of the, the fact that they are not regulated. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mr Price. Chair, that's all I have for Mr Price. Thank you so much, Mr Price. Might Mr Price be excused? Mr Price can be excused. And thank you very much for joining us. appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner... The next witness is Ms Carnell. I'll just take this opportunity. No, I won't. I'll just call Ms Carnell. While Ms Carnell is coming to the uh, through the video conference waiting room, I'll take steps to tender her statement. 
which was provided in answer to a notice to give. Uh, that's code CAR.500.11, sorry, I'll withdraw that, I'll start that again. CAR 500 001 0001. Okay, we'll take that, uh, receive that exhibit as well. Ms Carnell, would you take an oath or affirmation? I'll take an affirmation, thank you. Ms Carnell, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Ms Carnell, you provided a statement to the Commission in answer to a notice dated uh, 22 May 2020. That's right. And are the contents of that statement true and correct? Yes. Just a moment ago, we heard uh, some evidence from Mr Price from the Australian Financial Complaints Authority. Uh, the Australian Small Business and um, Family Enterprise Ombudsman uh, to what extent is it a similar uh, uh, organisation or authority to AFCA and how is it different? Okay, it's, it's, uh, it's very different. AFCA has a capacity to give compensation uh, where there are complaints against people that are members of AFCA, um, are, are registered financial um, operators, banks, insurance companies and so on. Um, the act that sets up my office gives us two roles. One is an advocacy role, which uh, allows us to have inquiries to provide advice and input into government policy direction uh, to um, to advocate on behalf of small to medium businesses. It's that's defined as under 100 employees in uh, um, in our in our act. And our other um, role is an assistance role where we look after individual small businesses that have got problems uh, with big business or alternatively with the federal government. We work quite closely with the small business commissioners in each state who have coverage of um, issues surrounding state governments um, and issues that are that are based in that state, shall we say. So we all work together to ensure small businesses um, are covered and supported. How big is the small business community in Australia? Uh, that's an, it's always a very interesting question, but there are about 2.3 million trading small businesses in Australia if we don't talk about uh, um, self-managed um, super funds, you know, a range of... Uh, of uh, non-operating ABNs or whatever. Mm. So there's 2.3 million. And interestingly, 97% um, of those have fewer than 20 employees. And of those, 75% of those have fewer than five. So a very large percentage of small businesses in Australia are really quite small. Do we have a good sense yet of how many small businesses were um, affected by the 2019-2020 bushfires? Look, it's hard to make it's hard to make a comment, but the sort of figures that were, I suppose, um, thrown around a bit was that we were talking about 200,000. We we're talking about a large number, but remember that's not surprising if, on the basis, there's 2.3 million small businesses in Australia, and in that area that the bushfires are. Uh, um, burnt through. Um, there was a large number of, of towns and so on and um, rural areas that often have lots of small businesses. What are the kinds of issues that you've been hearing in your role as Ombudsman from small business after these bushfires? Look, what we, um, I suppose what we heard initially uh, was a uh, a range of small businesses who were literally overwhelmed by the whole situation. Um, as you can imagine, that not only did many of them or a, lot, a number of them lose their homes, but they lost their business uh, as well. They lost their, their farms and so on. Um, and in the first instance, the great dilemma here was lack of um, consistent information. So there was information coming from state governments. In some cases, there was insurance companies on the ground. There were charities. 
There was the federal government. There was, you know, the the bushfire uh, volunteers. There was all sorts of people, but what they were after was it was uh, consistent information to tell them what they could do, where they could get some some help and support, and how they could get on with running their businesses. And. The location of a number of these fires was down the coast of New South Wales and in Victoria and, of course, also up yeah. through to Queensland and, and in areas such as Kangaroo Island and, and, and the Adelaide Hills. Um, the kinds of uh, impacts on those, on those businesses, not just fire-affected but indirect effects, is that right? Look, that was the major, the major issue here. If you think about those areas, they are predominantly... Um, rural but often tourist destinations uh, and if you think about the time when these fires burnt through it was when they were about to experience um, probably the busiest not probably the busiest time of the of the year uh, for them and uh, so for lots of them the challenges here was that they had lots of stock uh, uh, they um, were geared up, for the tourist season and all of a sudden there was absolutely nothing. And then there was the um, significant issue between those um, businesses that were directly affected and those that were supposedly indirectly affected. Mm. The fact is for the businesses involved, they had, they even if they weren't burnt, they had no customers. Uh, they were often... Uh, the highways were closed. There was nobody there. A lot of the uh, the stock, the uh, the um, cool room stock, all those sorts of things, um, uh, went to went to waste. Even if they didn't lose power, and I'd have to say, in many circumstances, they did. And of course, the other issue was that in lots of cases, the internet went down as well. So the capacity to actually communicate or get a sense on what was happening um, was really difficult and really hard to put in an application online if there's no online. So just after the bushfire season, as it came to an end, there was a small period of time before the COVID-19 restrictions started to impact. Are you seeing um, the, how are you seeing the impact of COVID-19 on top of the bushfire experience for small business? Devastating. You know, one of the things that I think kept a lot of the small businesses uh, positive and directional after the, the bushfires was that the communities pulled together and in many cases started to talk about running local events, uh, you know, getting the tourists back in town, you know, buy from the bush, you know, visit the, you know, visit the uh, um, holiday locally. There was a range of campaigns running to encourage um, uh, us all as Australians to have our holidays um, um, locally in these places uh, and then COVID and so then nobody could go anywhere so the work and effort and lots of, and lots of times expense that had gone into uh, organising local events for the, you know, to get the tourists back uh, all went for nothing as well uh, so the you know the devastation for the people involved was was significant, and so was the complication of this. Already we had the scenario where it was incredibly difficult for many small businesses to work out in the first instance whether they were directly affected or not directly affected, whether they could get uh, one of the uh, the loans or not, um, whether they could get the fifty thousand dollar. Um, grant or not um, and then there was you know then after that there was a ten thousand dollar grant for people for businesses that weren't directly affected and then on top of that you end up with the COVID scenario um, with a whole range of other information and challenges that they had to get their head around so really difficult. So we heard some evidence uh, <laughs> earlier this afternoon from um, uh, 
the Commonwealth governments in, in terms of the amount of money that has been paid out already. Uh, you've mentioned the $50,000 cash grant and the uh, additional 10000 for those indirectly impacted. You mentioned co concessional loans. Are they up to up to 500000 Is that correct for, for small right. business right. who've suffered either significant asset or revenue loss? Uh, just for clarity, are all of those uh, grants and loans and cash payments still available to small business? Um, look, they are. Um, the I mean, yes, they are. On, as well as the, the the new COVID the new COVID ones. Some of the challenges, though, if we, if I could just focus on the fifty thousand um, dollar grant for a moment, because you know lots of small businesses weren't confident enough to get a, to to put themselves further into debt, even though the loans were incredibly generous. But it still meant debt, and it still still meant you had to be confident enough you could pay it back. So they were really, on the whole, at least in our experience, looking for the for the grants. Um, they were looking for them quickly, so that they could get you know they could get up and running. They could start the process of uh, getting their businesses operating. The fifty thousand dollar grant um, to start with, in the first instance, it was challenging to work out where you applied who you applied to, and in the initial instance, there were some very complex forms, you know, different levels of government doing different things, different places to apply to, all those sorts of things, which was really difficult. And then for the $50,000 um, uh, grant, um, the first sort of, que the first questions were, well, what are you going to spend it on? Um, can you please um, get a quote um, a number of quotes. Could you please attach the quote? Could you, you know, there was a whole range of scenarios like that. And when you think about it, these were people in towns like Mogo, um, you know, that half the buildings or a large number of the buildings were burnt. You know, um, they were struggling to find anyone to get a quote from and to be, um, to be that specific about what they were going to spend the money on, um, probably um, forgot that these were really little businesses um, and it was a bit challenging for them to get their, their head around that. And then as I spoke to one business when I was down visiting a range of them, he said, well, we got it all together finally. We found all the documents we needed. We got them all. And then we couldn't find where to send it to because there was no email address. Um, I know that sounds silly, but that's the level of challenge that we saw for a range of those businesses. So those challenges you saw, have they started to be addressed during or perhaps because of the COVID experience? Absolutely. COVID has been lots uh, more streamlined, shall we say, than, than the bushfires were. And of course, for COVID, because you know, as it would be quite we're all in this together, that um, everybody was sort of is being treated similarly in particular um, in, in particular industries. You know, restaurants, cafes, and so on have the same rules. The dilemma with the bushfires is there was this mixture of affected, um, directly you know, directly affected, not directly affected, um, not sure whether you're affected at all. Um, so there, there wasn't the level of ease of information because it depended a lot on, um, on where you actually sat. One of the recommendations you made in your, um, in your statement is uh, an improvement for the future would be to have the overarching frameworks with the approaches that are going to be delivered thought out and in place in advance before the crisis actually yes. hits. An aspect of that, what kind of communication channels or what kind of things could be improved by way of facilitating that processing, sorry, application and processing and payment process? Well, look, we think that the National Cabinet approach has been really successful when it comes to COVID-19, brings together the decision makers from the various states and territories with the Commonwealth Government and decisions can, um, can, um, can be made um, and and distributed uh, reasonably quickly. And we think a similar approach could be done, you know, with appropriate governments, um, you know, where there isn't other forms of natural disasters, whatever they might be. We think that worked pretty well. 
Um, but the, the thing we'd like to sort of stress is that when things are announced, it's really important to announce them either with timeframes or when they are about to be delivered. The thing that um, causes small business a, a problem is they hear that something is announced, there's going to be, you know, job keeper or there's going to be a $50,000 grant, they hear it on the news, they hear that, um, the appropriate politician say it and then you can't find it anywhere. In fact, it's really not available now um, and it's a bit hard to work out when it will be available. Um, now that might not sound like a big deal, but if you're trying to run a business, if you're trying to keep the, the show on the road, having clear knowledge of um, when things are going to be available and who's going to be eligible is pretty important. The last matter I want to raise with you um, is a web portal that was designed uh, and is referred to on your website called My Business Health. We had some evidence this morning from uh, Professor Gibbs who spoke to uh, and, and, and others, in the, um, including Dr Penny Burns, of the impact on people of their mental health issues that they might experience in the immediate aftermath. And you said earlier that a number of these um, small businesses are going to be 20 or less employees. Um, what, what kind of intersection is there between personal mental health issues and the, and the issues involved in running a small business? huge uh, interface, as you can imagine. You just put your, try to put yourself in a position of a small business on the south coast of New South Wales that went through um, the bushfires, didn't have a Christmas, um, you know, didn't have any Christmas trade, was just starting to think, you know, maybe we're going to make it, maybe we're not, and then COVID happens. That's They've been in the business for 20 years. Their house is, you know, their, their loans are secured against their home. So if they lose the, their business, they lose their home, um, it's pretty stressful, you know, to put it mildly. It's a bit hard to work out how something could be more stressful in many ways, apart from maybe losing loved ones. So the issue the issue of mental health and the, the, the balance of business health and mental health and wellbeing are really important. So my business health site attempts to bring together what a small business needs to do to keep their business healthy, and it focuses on things like what grants are available, what does cash flow look like, what do you need to do to keep your business going, with you have to look after yourself, and gives a range of um, support lines like the Beyond Blue COVID support service, a range of other um, other support services that are available. Because you know, the thing about small businesses, small business people is that they'll look after themselves last. They'll look after their, their families and their staff and they'll try to get things happening, you know, happening again and so on. And then they'll think they should be tough and strong. And the fact is nobody's that strong. So the challenge for, we believe, based upon evidence and based upon research, is that it's important to not make it about mental health as such, but to make it about how you get your business back on track, how you can actually get through this um, scenario where you bring together wellness and mental health with your business health and try to uh, encourage that to happen. I'm um, also Deputy Chair of Beyond Blue and was CEO of Beyond Blue for a while. And one of the things that Beyond Blue learnt during the Victorian fires is that... Um, for lots of people, and small business people particularly, it's not the first couple of months that are the problem. It's when things calm down a bit. Um, it's, it's when they're not running around trying to clear the site, trying to, you know, get new stock in, all those sorts of things. It's, it's at about three months where all of a sudden it just becomes overwhelming. Mm. And so the challenge with mental health services in these natural disaster scenarios is not to assume that this is about, you know, the first six weeks, the first eight weeks. It's actually 12 months to look after people and to make sure services are available, potentially even longer than that. But certainly, you know, uh, it's longer than you think is the story. Uh, and we've got to make sure services are available um, at six months, 12 months and potentially 18 months. 
Thanks very much, Ms Carnell. Commissioners? Oh, Ms Carnell, thank you very much for, for taking the afternoon or time in the afternoon to, uh, to, to talk to the Commission and your comprehensive submission. It was uh, very detailed and very good, got straight to the point, which we appreciate. I don't have any questions on top of that just yet, but Commissioner Bennett, no? Commissioner McIntosh. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Ms Carnell, for your statement. Um, I just had one. In, in your statement, on a number of occasions, you, you really pushed the point on uh, the need for a single point of contact for small business. And I just wondered whether you'd given any thought to how such a system might work given that natural disasters occur at, at a local scale, they occur at a regional scale, they, they occur at a state scale, and then sometimes they occur at a national scale, how we could design a system that can accommodate natural disasters occurring at different scales and, by virtue of that, the fact that you run into different government agencies and also charities working in this space? Uh we believe that the best outcome is for this to sit with the federal government in terms of the planning, you know, along with um, state premiers and then have a rollout mechanism through local councils um, where, where appropriate. So there needs to be buy-in by three levels of government. But somebody has to be responsible, shall we say, which needs to be the federal government, because in most cases that's where a chunk of the money flows from. In fact, almost all cases, it's where a lot of the, the dollars flow, um, flow from. And so have in place a mechanism prior to natural disasters where it's really clear what the communication mechanisms will look like and what the organisational mechanisms will look like. So if you're having a, um, a cyclone and floods in Queensland, then um, the same mechanism comes into place, but it's a matter of the Queensland Premier um, and the Queensland infrastructure, along with the federal disaster management approaches, which will include, um, you know, which will in the, in, in the end include banks and the ATO and others. But we've decided, you know, how this works before it happens and how you roll that out in a way that there's not mixed messages all over the place. And it's also important to make sure that, that the way we do it is fit for purpose one of the, when we first rolled out the $50,000 grant, it was being run through um, Services Australia, I think, in the first instance. And um, it was being almost seen as a, um, as a welfare payment, but it was a payment to small businesses. And so the, the whole, you know, these were people who'd never actually filled in a wealth, you know, a, a Centrelink form in their life in many circumstances. So we have to think through what it actually looks like for the people who are at the other end of this and what's fit for purpose um, and what isn't. And we'll only do that if we plan early. Thanks very much. <laughs> Appreciate that. Uh, Commissioner B, do you have a question? Yes, I do actually have a question. Thanks, Ms Carnell. Um, with the idea of having a single point with the federal government, state government and roll out through local government that you suggested, do you see the charities being, being put through the same um, organisational framework or, I mean, rather than, I mean, with, under the inverted commas control, close inverted commas then of, of government? Is, is that part um, of your look, scenario? Look, I think obviously... Look, obviously they, they, they need to be, particularly um, particularly the charities that are really involved in, uh, in disaster management like Red Cross, uh, they have um, a great mechanism, a great rollout capacity to, you know, to get people on the ground um, quickly, um, providing, you know, basic support in those scenarios. So, there's, you know, they would need to be part of that, but it just means that they're, you know, in the meetings, in the loop, know what they're supposed to be doing in the first instance. Um, and, you know, it just seems it just seems really logical. And the importance of having buy-in from... So what do the banks do in that scenario where there's no... Um, where you can't get money out of the bank, there's no terminals that are working? You know, there's just all those things that can be sorted out um, prior to the event, not at the last minute. That just raises it. That leads in a little way to the second question I had, which is um, I'd understood that there was also um, some activity from the from big business, um, from the business council. Mm -hmm. um, have, have you seen uh, whether any impact from that for small business? Oh, look, um, um, 
Uh, the Business Council has rolled out a program of they've uh, they've got some um, some containers, you know, that uh, were made available by some of their members, and they've they've taken those out to areas where businesses got burnt, and um, so sort have of provided some capacity for the businesses to get up and running again, which is which is which is great. Um, it's fantastic, but. The dilemma comes is that to get those sort of things happening, that that probably happened in the last month, and for a lot of the, the businesses that are burnt, they burnt on New Year's Eve. So, I mean, I'm not saying, it, you know, I think it's fantastic what they've done, but, but the challenge um, in getting this right, getting this, you know, getting support out quickly is that is actually getting support out quickly and helping small businesses know what they can um, ex- what they can hope for, what they can expect. So if they know they're going to get the $50,000 grant, so they know that, um, even if it takes, you know, a couple of weeks to get it, they can plan around it, um, which is the single point of contact approach Thank so you. that you can get information, you can know what's happening and you can get it quickly. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ms Carnell. Appreciate that. Ms Hogan-Dora. I have nothing for Thank Ms Carnell. Might she be excused? Yes, she may be excused. Ms Carnell, thank you again. We appreciate you taking the time. Thanks very much, Commissioner. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Commissioners, you've heard just then some evidence from Ms Carnell concerning charities in answer to a question from Commissioner Bennett. The um, Just by way of update, one of the matters that the um, Commission team has been pursuing is the... Um, uh, the donations that have been received uh, by charities and their distribution of those those donations. Uh, on the 1st of May of 2020, uh, the Commission issued a notice to give information to the trustee for the New South Wales Rural Fire Service and Brigades Donations Fund. Um, quite promptly received a response from the fund uh, uh, informing the Commission that on the 16th of April the trustees had filed a summons in the Supreme Court of New South Wales seeking orders uh, for judicial advice to assist them in relation to the administration of the donations that had been received in recent months by the fund and subsequently we received a detailed response to the notice um, which identified amongst other matters that approximately $114 million had been um, collected from um, in the uh, during the 2019-2020 bushfire season from individual community and foundation donations and bequests. Uh, just yesterday, um, the New South Wales Supreme Court gave judgment and advice uh, in relation to that application. Uh, that matter is being considered uh, and at this stage uh, we don't propose to proceed examining with any of those matters in the course of this hearing block. Uh, but we just note that is part of the, con con the Commission's continuing considerations. Our last, wit uh, last live witness today is... That's an unfortunate word to use. Um, our last witness today is uh, Noel Clement from the Australian Red Cross. Uh, I tender Mr Clement's witness statement, which is dated 22 May, uh, and the documents are next to it, 1 through to 10. Those will be document bundle 2.8 with document numbers 2.8.1 uh, through to 2.8.1.10. And I'll have those read onto the record of the conclusion of the day's proceedings. OK, and I'm happy to read those onto the record and we will take those as exhibits as marked. Thank you. I call Noel And I Clement. think we'll also read on, there's a couple from Miss Carnell that we didn't address leading into her. We'll read those on later as well. Is that the plan? Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Yep. I call Noel Terence Clement. Mr Clement, will you take an oath or affirmation? Uh, an affirmation, thank you. Thank you. Mr Clement, do you solemnly and sincerely declare and affirm that the evidence you shall give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. Mr Clement, I'm not sure whether you heard everything that I said to the Commissioners just before. Could you hear what I said in the I waiting did room? Not, 
I did not, sorry. All right. I just indicated to the commissioners that there were matters that were under continuing investigation by the commission, so I don't want to deal with in respect of other charities. And to be fair to you, I don't propose to deal with all those matters of relevant that you might touch upon today. Um, the Australian Red Cross has provided a very detailed uh, answer to a written notice and you've also provided a very detailed uh, statement which incorporates much of the matter in that. Uh, in light of the evidence that we've heard today, um, there's a couple of matters that I'd like to take up with you that have emerged from the witnesses both this morning and this afternoon. Um, the first is the Australian Red Cross um, uh, clearly has a very um, involved and deep connections with disaster relief in Australia and internationally. And you've been involved in the Australian Red Cross now since 2001, is that correct? That's correct, yes. And you're presently the director of the Australian programs. That's correct. What does that involve, just, just to give the Commissioner some idea of the scope of the responsibilities that you have? Sure. So my responsibilities include all of our uh, program, humanitarian program operations across Australia, so ranging from emergency services, migration support, I work with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander programs at a range of community programs. And is it right that, that to say that the, the, the Australian Red Cross is relatively unique and that it's, it's quite embedded within the um, disaster response pro program or processes in Australia? Is that right? Uh, so we are embedded in uh, disaster arrangements in each state and territory, that's correct. And, and what does, I've said embedded, what, what does that mean for, for the uh, So Red what that means is we, I beg your pardon, so we take on formal roles in each of the state and territory disaster plans or sometimes local government disaster plans um, that stipulate the sort of role we'll undertake when disaster occurs, in, particularly in that response phase. All right. And um, we've heard some evidence this morning of... Uh, the Red Cross being involved in local coordination centres uh, and also re uh, relief and recovery centres, for example, in Malakuta. Um, was Mal yep. You say you deal something with in your statement about the particular circumstance of Malakuta for your volunteers and workers, and I thought it might be of assistance mm. to the commissioners having heard the evidence of the principal of the P12 uh, Malakuta School College today. What were some of the issues that were faced by um, the Red Cross workers and volunteers uh, in Malakuta in the uh, New Year's Eve fire? Uh, so at New Year's Eve itself, we had a small number of volunteers who were local community members that were in that community um, and effectively isolated for the first couple of days and providing support. So they were community members uh, who defended their own homes and then put on their Red Cross shirts and uh, supported community and did a lot of the initial setup of support um, that happened for those communities. And then two or three days later, we were able to get additional volunteers in and other agencies were able to come in as well. Was there any uh, dealings or coordination between the Australian Red Cross and the Australian Defence Force when they, um, in both the planning to bring uh, Defence Force personnel and supplies into Malakuta and then the evacuation? Uh, so the planning that I understand occurred was uh, around the evacuation. So we were certainly actively involved in uh, planning, designing the evacuation uh, with the Defence Force and I understand the state authorities as well. Um, and we also provided support to people uh, during those evacuations. So we had uh, volunteers providing psychological first aid, uh, both during the uh, ship evacuation and uh, at reception centres in the two locations uh, where people were greeted when they arrived back um, closer to Melbourne as well. One of the things that we heard this morning was um, that uh, the great distress that is experienced by uh, people and families in the immediate aftermath of, or during the course of, in the immediate aftermath of a disaster is being lost uh, or, or losing contact with loved ones uh, and their wider uh, family and support network. Does the Australian Red Cross have a particular um, a program or, 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 or plan to deal with those situations? Uh, we do. So uh, Australian Red Cross delivers the what's called Register Find Reunite on behalf of uh, state authorities. So uh, it's a service developed by the Commonwealth Government made available to states to use and under each state arrangements uh, we register people who've been evacuated um, and then in the event that families have been separated, uh, there's an opportunity through an inquiry line for people to check whether their family members uh, have been registered um, and are somewhere safe. So that's a service that we provide in disasters. How well does, did that service operate in, um, over the Christmas break? 
Uh, so that, that service uh, operated, uh, we used, I understand, a lot of paper-based forms. So there were some uh, challenges with uh, data and with technology, particularly in a place like Malakuta, I understand. Uh, but the paper-based forms is a backup method that we've got that works quite effectively. Um, so we were able to get those registrations and undertake those registrations as part of the process. How much does uh, the obviously the, the International Red Cross has a as a broad footprint in humanitarian aid and humanitarian work? To what extent is that experience used to inform the uh, relief and recovery work of the Australian Red Cross in Australia domestically? Uh, so we certainly learn from our uh, what we call sister national societies. So over many years, we've exchanged uh, experience, particularly in providing uh, psychosocial support. So that's particular strength uh, for the Red Cross movement. Um, so we share with other national societies our experiences and theirs. Uh, we have a particularly close relationship with New Zealand Red Cross, where we'll actually exchange uh, volunteers and uh, support each other around building our capacity. So um, certainly in sharing experiences and our methodologies, there's a fair amount of that occurs. And, and how many people approximately did the Australian Red Cross assist during the 2019-2020 bushfire season? Uh, so we've registered about 65,000 people uh, and about 50,000 people we provided some sort of support to. So that would be largely psychosocial uh, support through relief, evacuation, recovery centres, etc. All right. Now, um, as I understand it, um, Australian Red Cross is out in all communities or all communities in bushfire affected areas or um, uh, what kind of impact, if any, has COVID-19 had for the ongoing provision of support by the Red Cross? Uh, yes, so COVID-19 uh, has certainly created additional challenges. So firstly, uh, for Red Cross, it's meant that uh, our teams that would have ordinarily been undertaking outreach, um, and we're undertaking outreach door-to-door -door visits of people in communities, uh, that had to cease because of COVID-19. So that was about 19 communities we were doing that in. Uh, it's meant that our grants team providing uh, support for people applying for financial assistance have gone to work from home arrangements. Um, and it's meant that we've had to uh, be really creative in how we try and reach out to people who haven't contacted us before um, and how we undertake that early recovery support to the communities that have been impacted. Um, you also mentioned uh, your recovery centres. Have those continued to be opened or have those closed down? Uh, so my understanding is uh, recovery centres have either been uh, significantly scaled back or closed down, most closed down. So uh, there were quite a few of those open before COVID occurred. So appreciate that's in the face of the restrictions uh, that have been mandated because of the public health issues. What happens to those people when the Red Cross is not able to assist it in the, in the ways that you did before? Uh, so the relief and evacuation centres uh, is one of the ways that we provide support, but uh, we've also been reaching out through recovery networks. Uh, there are Facebook pages in some of those communities um, where you know maintaining contact with anybody who's applied for grants. So we've got a range of other ways that we're seeking to make that contact, but it certainly increases the difficulty and the challenge and makes it harder to reach people who haven't yet reached out for assistance. How's the Red Cross's workforce holding up in the face of all of this? Uh, so, look, we, we've had a couple of thousand people uh, deployed and supporting this uh, who have managed very well. Um, certainly, we have fatigue issues, and given we were responding to disasters for many months, um, you know, Red Cross people, uh, like anybody, was ex were experiencing fatigue. Um, but they are a, a resilient, uh, incredibly giving uh, group of people, and uh, they continue to want to do the best for the communities that they're working with. And one of the things that you were asked to address, and we thank you in your response, was uh, to identify to the Commission how much, by way of donations, the Red Cross received. And I disclose I was one of those people who made a donation to the Red Cross. Um, you indicated it was something in the order of $216 million. Uh, and in addition, pledges having been received of $126 million, which I understand are from, largely from corporates. Is that... Uh, sorry, if I can clarify... Sorry. Please. Uh, no, so the pledges are a part of that. So we've had pledges of 136 million in total. We've received 126 million of those pledges. Oh, I see. So is, is the 126 that. million that has been received a subset of the total of 216 million? That's correct. I see. Thank you. Um, and what what has the Red Cross done with that money, just generally? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. So uh, we've provided uh, support to communities in a number of ways. So uh, $5 million of those funds have supported uh, our emergency response work uh, this year, which is what we originally commenced fundraising for. 
Uh, we've put additional money into immediate support grants. Uh, we've also started distributing medium to long term support. Uh, and we've uh, provided a three year recovery program um, to support communities in that long term uh, recovery that we know is necessary from major disasters like this. One of the matters that you said in your response was that you, you distributed 83 million to date and that most have been distributed to people in four states, that, the, the four states that experienced the greatest level of impact. Um, one of the questions I had uh, out of that was that 64 million was distributed in New South Wales, uh, just under 11 million in Victoria, six and a half in South Australia and 1.5 in Queensland. Is, is that done on a needs basis or a response to, in a, in a sense, request basis? Uh, so it's very much done uh, based on requests for assistance. So we've reached out to all of those communities. Uh, we respond uh, to people who've sought assistance. Uh, so that is on the basis of uh, applications that have come to us or that we've supported and we've been able to pay. So one of the matters that came up in during the course of the bushfire season is that um, uh, the uh uh, there's a number of media reports and uh, information that you've included in your statement, thank you, uh, as to the statements that were made. Um, if you, if, I'd invite you to exp explain to the commissioners um, the, the, the challenges in both distribution of uh, funds but also the, the challenges in communicating um, those decisions. Okay, so you'd like me to go to distribution first? Yes, thanks. But yeah, sure. So, uh, so probably our, our main challenges in distribution uh, have firstly been uh, identifying people who've been impacted. Um, so there's been no uh, single or shared list uh, that we've been able to access uh, that indicates to us, particularly you know those greatly impacted, such as those um, whose homes were destroyed and damaged. So. Uh, the various methods we need to use to reach out to make sure we're getting to people. Uh, that's the first thing. Uh, the second challenge would be we know that uh, disaster recovery is long term and we know that people uh, need support at different stages, immediate, medium and short and longer term. Uh, and we know we need to work at the pace that people are ready to seek support. So um, trying to work at that pace and make sure the support's available. Um, and probably the third and one of the most significant challenges for us has been uh, lack of access to good information to be able to verify um, that the people we are paying uh, are those who've been impacted and particularly around things like destruction of property mm. um, and trying to minimise the impact on people through that verification process. In fairness to you, one of the things that is going to be um, addressed in the video evidence that will proceed uh, will be following yours is that of uh, the experience in Malakuta, where there was no central list being created and maintained by any government agency or any other official agency, but instead was by um, indeed uh, the employees of the local real estate agency. Um, I'm not sure if you've actually turned your mind to this, but but who might be the appropriate entity to 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 take to create that list of lost homes so that the relief and the donations that you've gathered can be deployed sooner? Uh, so I, I have, we have turned our mind to it. We think there are a few opportunities, but one of the opportunities I guess we would highlight is the Register Fund Reunite system that register, registers people who've been evacuated. Um, it is often uh, the uh, largest source of data on who's been impacting in the community that could be added to to determine mm -hmm. what was those what were those impacts. Uh, that's one opportunity, but um, really, it, it, there are a number of ways. I think for us, the most important point is that uh, there is a point of information that uh, you know relevant agencies are able to access to be able to uh, both contact people and verify impact. Mm -hmm. Oh, just bear with me one moment, please, um, Mr. So, while you're asking that question, or you're looking for the next question, just <laughs> follow on. I, how, Mr. Clement, how have you identified much uh, in the way of uh, fraudulent claims or the the like, uh, or any cyber activity against the Red Cross during this process? Uh, yes, Commissioner. So we had uh, very significant uh, cyber activity from the outset. Um, so what we call bot applications. Uh, and the latest number I've seen is uh, close to 900 um, of those received. So they're electronically generated. Uh, we uh, refer to other applications as suspicious until we're clear that they are fraudulent. 
Uh, so we've had a very large number of applications that um, are either suspicious or we've been unable to verify the information that people have given us. Um, so that's uh, been a fairly significant um, effort and uh, to work through in the applications as well. I appreciate that. And not having a single database would make that difficult to, to be able to, uh, to compare. Okay. That's right, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, Commissioner McIntosh. Just following on from the Chair's comment there, do you have systems in place where you identify suspicious claims to pass that information on to the police or to other charities or to other government agencies to ensure that they're aware where you've identified people who are making false claims? Uh, Commissioner, so we absolutely have been passing some on to the police. Uh, what we've been very focused on is, to be honest with you, is to get funds out to people. So where applications are suspicious, we continue to work through those with applicants. Uh, where we identify that there is uh, fraudulent intent, we are referring those to police and we uh, have been doing that. But we intend to go back through uh, more of those applications um, to determine if more of them should be referred. And any, any sharing with other charities? Uh, we've not shared that information with other charities. Uh, we've shared it with police. And I don't, couldn't tell you what police have been, whether they've shared it. That then provides a segue, if I may, into one of the questions <laughs> that I have, if I might, Mr Kemmers. Um, this is not about fraudulent claims um, or matters such as that, but I was interested in having you describe, if you would, um, having said that you're, you're embedded to some degree in the planning for this and other charities aren't, I'd be very interested in having an understanding of how the Red Cross liaises with other charities um, on the ground and in particular um, both the large charities and some of the ad hoc smaller ones that sort of have rose up, for example, during the bushfires, you know, um, uh, by, by means often of social media. How uh, did you, if so, how did you, and, and to what extent was there a sharing of data? Can you, in a general sense, if you could describe that for me, I'd be very grateful. Sure. C Commissioner, if you don't mind me just clarifying, so there are other charities also embedded in those okay. arrangements? We're not well, whether the they are one. or not. Um, yes, yes. Um, so, so charities that are embedded in the arrangements, uh, we have uh, quite a bit of experience uh, working with those charities and fairly clear who's undertaking what roles. Um, there absolutely are always smaller charities and local organisations in a disaster that will provide support, which is fantastic in those communities. Um, we seek to connect to those communities, uh, those charities, wherever we can at a local level. So it happens very locally. Um, and particularly as we move into the recovery, a lot of the work that our recovery workers are doing now is actually connecting with those groups um, and often what we do is we're able to bring those connections together, identify the gaps um, and really leverage what those charities are already doing. So that's what we try and seek to do in the communities. Does that mean that there is a, uh, a, a more or less comprehensive or at least significant exchange of data um, with regard to uh, local, local individuals and um, businesses and people who've been impacted by the fire between the charities? No, not data. So data, uh, we all face the same restrictions on how data is collected and the use of that data. Um, so it is information on the sorts of impacts on who is doing what within a community, what sorts of supports agencies are providing. It's that sort of information. Do you think it would be helpful if there was, a, do you think it would make a difference on the exchange of data if there was a provision um, <coughs> Uh, so far as, um, you know, privacy and all of the other legislation that's involved in that, if there was a provision exempting you from uh, being, being prevented from exchanging data with other charities and other people on the ground? Uh, so, so we, yes, we do believe that an arrangement would be uh, positive. We would uh, though add to that that some sort of data sovereignty and people's rights uh, to be able to protect their own data should be considered in such an arrangement. Or if there was consent, for example? Yes, absolutely. Okay. And my other question, if I can take that on, just one more, one more, if I may. Um, you, you were talking about the, you know, the the long term, the need for long term planning because of, and we've heard a lot about the length of time it takes for recovery in a real sense. Does the Red Cross have some sort of a strategic plan in place for the distribution? I don't mean of every last penny because you can't have a plan when you don't know what's happening. But do you have a strategic plan generally in place for the distribution of all of the monies that you've received? Um, uh, for the purposes of impact on the, of the bushfires in Australia? 
uh, for this event particularly. For this event. Mr. I mean, you received a great deal of money yeah. for this event. Yes. Is there a strategic plan for the distribution yes. of all of those monies um, for the purpose for which, you know, it was given in effect? Yes. Yes. Over so, time. so we have a high level... Yes, we, we have a high-level disbursement strategy that's been endorsed by the panel that uh, we established in January um, that looks to immediate, medium and long-term needs um, and seeks to map out what those sorts of needs might be. Uh, that's something that, you know, is regularly uh, used by the panel in making decisions about the sorts of grants that we uh, then release in other supports. And the plan, the plan over in the end, depending on the length of time and the fact that you can't be precise, of course, with who needs what when, is that there will be a, a distribution of the funds that the Red Cross holds um, to that end. Uh, uh, so there will be distribution. We will provide support to communities, yes, with those funds. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr Cummings. That's very, very helpful. Thank you. Ms Hogan-Doran, back to you. I have nothing further for Mr Clement. Uh, I just wanted on behalf of the Commission team to thank um, Mr Clement, uh, the Australian Red Cross and the other charities that met with the Commission team. Uh, um, I can't remember if it was last week or the week before. Mr Clement probably has a better recollection. Yes. But we have been much... Before. We have been much assisted by the um, by the charitable sector in relation to the preparation for these hearings and for the ongoing work of the Commission and we thank them. Mike, for what I was going to add, from, I think I speak for everyone, for what it's worth, I think that it, there's been a broad recognition that the, um, the charity sector as a whole has had a profound impact on the um, recovery and well, the, the, uh, the immediate response and recovery um, in the bushfire affected areas. And I think we're all appreciative of that. Thank you, Mr Clement. Might Mr Clement be uh, released on his summons? Uh, released under summons, Mr Clement. Don't take that the way it sounds. Yeah. Uh, we appreciate you spending the, the, the time with us, but we'll, uh, we would like to explore more uh, in the, the charity area and in particular the Red Cross into the future. But thank you very much for the submission and, uh, and the participation so far. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms Davy has elected <laughs> to Dovey. deal with the uh, exhibits. That's delegation, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Commissioners. Um, turning first to the documents associated with the evidence of Kate Carnell. Um, these, I think we're up to bundle number 2.7. That's right. There are four documents in that bundle. <clears throat> They're in the hard copy folders, mm -hmm. as I understand it, at tab... No, I'm going to miss the tab number. Um, I do have, in fact, the document numbers, though. The document numbers are CAR 500 001 0001, CAR 501 001 0005, CAR 501 001 0003, and finally, CAR 501-001-0001. And those should respectively be, as I understand, we're up to 2.7.1 through 2.7.4. OK, and they're all received as exhibits as marked. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the documents associated, the bundle associated with Mr Clement's evidence. These are at tabs... I1 through I11 of the hard copy bundle. We're up to exhibit number 2.8, so bundle of documents mm -hmm. 2.8. The first is the witness statement of Noel Clement, and that's document ID ARC 501-001-0001. That is item 2.8.1. The following 10 documents, if it's acceptable, I will read out the beginning and then I'll read out only the last five digits, sorry, the last four digits of each because that's the only thing that differs. That's acceptable. So they all start with ARC 501001. The first of the ten documents, which is document 2.8.1.1, ends in 0031. The next, which is document 2.8.1.2, ends in 0148. The next, which is document 2.8.1.3, ends in 0150. 
The next, which is document 2.8.1.4, ends in 0157. The next, document 2.8.1.5, ends in 0162. The next, 2.8.1.6, ends in 0165. The next is document 2.8.1.7, ends in 0170. Then document 2.8.1.8 ends in 0179. Document 2.8.1.9 ends in 0187. And document 2.8.1.10 ends in 0202. And that is the end of the, the tender. Good job. So they're all received as exhibits as marked. Thank you. Commissioners, the final matter today is the uh, second community witness uh, video. On the 4th of May, um, Ms Dovey and I travelled to Malakuta in Victoria uh, where we met with um, Mr Cashmore and Ms, uh, our next witness, Kirsty Hargraves, who's a young woman who works at Malakuta Real Estate and, as, the, as you'll hear shortly, in her mum's cafe on the main road in Malakuta. Uh, she and her partner lost their home, as well as her nan and pop, who lived in the sa on the same block, lost their home in the fires on the 31st of December 2019. Um, I tender the video of Ms Hargrave's evidence, RCN 703 000 002, and the transcript of her evidence, RCN 500 001 1863. Those are to be tendered as bundle 2.9, consisting of documents 2.9.1 and 2.9.2. So they'll be received as exhibits as marked. Thank you. The video evidence runs for approximately 40 minutes. I note the time, it's four o'clock now. Um, we thank Ms Hargraves for her assistance and commend the video to you. Thank you. We'll watch the video, then we will adjourn. Uh, after the video and reconvene tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. Canberra time. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. So, Kirsty, how did you come to be in Malakuta? Um, well, we moved here when I was in grade two, so year 2000, with my family, my mum, my dad, my sister. We used to live in Bensdale and we had family in Melbourne and family down here. So we just decided we want to be close to family, so we moved here. Family being my nan and pop on my dad's side. And did you go to school here? I went to school here <laughs> in Malakuta P12 College. When did you finish? Um, I finished in 2010. And you stayed in Malakuta working since you finished school? Uh, no, I went to Melbourne for oh, one or two years and then I moved back. Okay. So since you've been back, you've been working in your in the real estate agents? No. I mostly just worked in hospitality because my mum owns Cafe 54 in the middle of town. So I've always worked for her and helped her out. And then I like floated between the pub and IGA. And I've only been working in real estate for probably just coming up 12 months now. Okay. So in the lead up to last summer, you've just been working, just started working for the real estate agency. For a couple of months? Oh, I started in Easter last year, mm -hmm. so it was going to be my first summer and I was just like so nervous because it gets so busy here over like Christmas and all the holiday rentals and stuff, so I was ready. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was, but yeah. yeah. So in the lead up to Christmas and New Year, where, whereabouts is your house and your Nan and Pop's house compared to your Malakuta where we are today? Um, so I'm about from here, three or four K heading back out of town. Uh, the easiest way to describe it would be when you're coming in on just the Genoa Road, there's a dirt road, the very first dirt road on your right you can take and I'm down there, I'm down near the waterboard. Are you right in the thick of the bush? Yeah. My house and my Nan and Pop's house was on the, it was two dwellings on the one property. Mm -hmm. They were both owned by my Nan and Pop. So we, me and my partner just lived in their other house and we like, you know, looked after Nan and Pop and because we were in the process of building, uh, well, starting building. <laughs> so yeah, we were just living there until we could eventually build and move in. But I've always lived in the bush because about down a hill, up a hill is my parents. So, yeah, they're also in the bush. So, 
living in the bush, have you made plans or preparations for what you would do in the event of a potential bushfire? I personally did not because I like have never really understood a bushfire. I didn't understand. I, when we got told it was coming, I just thought it was this big scary monster that just ripped through everything and you literally had no chance unless you ran. But I always remember when I was younger, my dad prepping like a bushfire was going to come. So he had sprinkler systems on his shed, on his house. He had um, two trailer things that he'd set up, rigged up himself with like a bulky. So he used them as a firefighting tank sorry, um, and things like that. And he cleared a lot. I don't know how to how distance wise it would be, but he cleared around his property. Where me and Nana Pop were, there were probably, it was probably a bit thicker because they didn't really clear trees around their property. So how did you find out that the fire was coming? Um, oh, I don't know, just word of mouth probably from locals. And Dad, Dad was very switched on and so was my partner. Um, but yeah, I think that there was a bit of an issue with advertising and um, community notice about the fire. I don't know if you want me to go into it now. But... Well, tell me about that. So were you working when that first heard about it? How did you find out about it? Well, well I was working in the cafe and it, so it was super busy. It was, and we have about eight staff on when it's super busy. And you could be friends with all of them. My mum was there. And there was a community meeting on. I can't remember if it was two days or one day before it was expected to come through the front. And um, I didn't even know it was on. And I'm quite active on social media. And like, I know mum being a business owner, she had no idea what was on. None of us or our staff had a chance to go to the meeting or anything. So I found that, so we just kept working and we got told pretty much what happened in the meeting by tourists coming in that were packing their stuff to leave and getting obviously coffee and stuff. Right. So. I don't know, so then continued on from there. I felt like we were all going home to die. <laughs> it was just like, it was just this weird feeling. And then um, still didn't really know that much about it because me and my partner like packed a few things, got Nan and Pop packed. And then, oh, we put like sand in socks in our gutters and wet down everything um, and just left. But I remember leaving a heap of stuff behind because I'm like, I'll come get this in the morning. <laughs> Um, my boyfriend was already hosting here at both my and Pop's house and ours and yeah, doing the sand in the guttering to uh, flood it, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Uh, we moved all of our stuff inside, like in certain comments, in our bikes for some reason, I don't know why. I uh, got my grandparents in the car and we took them to the cafe. Mm -hmm. At that stage, me and my boyfriend still didn't really have a plan, I suppose. He has a boat, so we put, he put that in the water earlier on during that day. Yep. And we were going to go out and wait it out on the lake. I personally didn't want to leave my mum and dad behind. Mm -hmm. And he, like, he doesn't have family in town, so he was happy to just chill with me. So... So did you stay in the cafe? Uh, we ended up, yeah, we did. So uh, the initial thing was my mum was going to stay in the cafe and my dad was being stubborn and not going to leave. And I was, we went around there and helped him get everything and he ended up being like, oh yeah, we'll go. So mm -hmm. we all went down the cafe. Dad brought his um, <laughs> big bulky system so that was uh, passed out the back yep. to host down things. Mm -hmm. um, and then we ended up having about 20 people in the cafe, it's like tourists, uh, a family that work also in the cafe. Mm -hmm. Sheltering. Six dogs. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> my dogs scissors. So put them out the back, but yeah. Okay. We had a um, generator there as well, so we stayed open to people that wanted coffee and fire. Right, because you'd lost power to the town. Yep. So you had a generator already in place? All right. You, you pretty much need a generator in town. So. And why is that? Uh, the power goes out a lot because there's only one power line in and out. Right. So especially uh, being a business in town, it's really beneficial. I see. So what about phones and you're talking about having access to social media? Did, yeah. you, could, did you still have that we still at that need, point? Mm -hmm. The um, service was slow, but you could still load everything and things like that. And what kind of things were you looking at? Uh, Facebook, 
the big emergence here. Mm -hmm. That was uh, good, but I remember it telling us that the front was coming through at five, like five p.m. on the day of the third year. Yep. So it's just like, oh, we've got to go, we've got to go. But then, because it didn't come through until the next morning. Mm -hmm. And also, with the updates through the night, we'd be like, oh, the fire is approaching right spots, which is right near where we're building. So I'm like, oh, God. And then it went on to Mirabuka. I'm like, oh, God, it's moving towards our build and stuff. So it was stressing, but it was also good. I don't know. And eventually it did go through those areas. Yeah. And you and your Nan and Pop lost your homes? Yeah, me and Nan and Pop did. So there's about four, five homes but four lots along that strip. Yep. And, yeah, ours and Anna Pops were the only ones that went. And you waited it out here in town at your mum's mm -hmm. cafe on the main street. Yep. Did you get down near the foreshore? No. Right. No, we um, stayed from the tourists coming into the cafe that day after the community meeting. Mm -hmm. They had said that a safe place to be was the centre of town because the CFA was always going to protect that area. So mm -hmm. we considered staying in the cafe to be the best option. And and in, and they did protect that area. There's yeah. not been any From loss. memory, there was a, always at least one CFA truck parked at the uh, roundabout. Mm -hmm. Every now and then that would probably take off. We so were you inside the cafe when the fire came through in the sense of it went early in the morning had you stayed there overnight we did yeah yeah we had like like i said before we had about 20 people in there um but it was really strange because out the front was my dad and my boyfriend and they were just watching and i never knew what to expect and I normally get really um, anxious and stuff, but I was like going outside and we had the bulky system at the back and we were putting buckets everywhere in case they um bamboo type happened. Mm -hmm. So then I went and put buckets through down just in case it fell because also RJ across the road was open. Yes. So we were constantly talking to them, which was nice to have a bit of community people around. Mm -hmm. um, and also at the back of the cafe, we had some tourists that were looking after all of the camping stuff. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was kind of nice. Like, they had the back, we had the third and then I was here the other side of the road. This was, like, company. So all the community was actively defending yeah. all of your businesses and yeah. each other? Yeah, mm -hmm. so it was good. So the morning came. Mm -hmm. What was it like? Uh, what was it? Black. Mm -hmm. <laughs> really scary. It was really hard to breathe. Okay. Yeah, and hard to see. And then into New Year's Eve. What did you think your role was going to be at that point? Uh, did you think about that? Not really. No, I just, to be honest, was so heavily fired by my dad. Yeah. Yeah. It was like you're so nervous, but you just see how calm he was. So that was really nice. And then after the front went through, it was, yeah, we could get in the car, go and check everyone's properties. Yep. So you went around checking properties and you would have seen that a lot of properties have been lost. Yeah. Um, you've been working at the real estate agent. Did you think it was going to be part of your job helping those people find somewhere to live? Uh, it crossed my mind on that initial day. Mm -hmm. It was that to ask um, And I was constantly texting Kerry because we're also quite close outside of work. Yep. Because she's my boss. Mm -hmm in the real estate and um she like she initially went out and looked at all of the holiday and uh, owners properties right which was just amazing like i can't believe that someone could think to do that right away uh but i personally went because i was with my dad we went to my sister's property and drove like out to ours mm -hmm. and then our build and things like that obviously noticing other houses along the way i would Relay messages to people in IGA if their house was okay because I knew they were concerned. So, was, so is it right to say that, from what you understand, that some of the houses were houses of people who live here all the time, yeah. and some of the houses were houses of people which were holiday rentals? Yeah. Okay. All our favourite ones that we have listed for sale, 
Things right. like that. Yeah. Okay, so quite a mix of different kinds of properties. Definitely. All right. So at some point, did somebody make a list of all the properties that have been lost? We we sat down and we compiled a bit of a list mm -hmm. uh, of the holiday houses that were um, destroyed and also the houses that we had listed. Yep. And then as we started kind of moving through procedures, we're like, oh, maybe we kind of need a list of people that have actually lost their homes so we can get in contact with them to see if they found somewhere to go. Mm. Uh, so we started compiling this list and then we found that we didn't know... We even wouldn't know someone's address, yep. but we'd know their last name. So we just put down their last name. Or we wouldn't know their name whatsoever, but we knew the address. So we put that down. So there was nothing official yep. about this list at all. We didn't know if we had missed anyone. We didn't mm -hmm. know if we had gotten anything wrong. Mm -hmm. um, that's okay, because we were kind of just using it for our own personal use. But then we got asked by a lot of other agents. Well, not agencies, I suppose it's like groups. Okay. Uh, let me ask you some more about different parts of what you just told me. The first part is how, I mean, there's over 100 homes that have been lost in this. So did your list grow over time as you were um, adding it in the way that you described? I suppose, yeah, I suppose okay. it did because we would remember this one. And there was just so much going on, so it was really hard to get everything right the first time, yeah. if that makes sense. And, and, as, and how long did it take to sort of start, to, to get this list sort of put together in the way you've described? Uh, well, I remember the day after the front went through, uh, I went up and me, Kerry and Jenny, who's the other lady that works in the office, we sat down because we had to go through people that we had, guests that we actually had in a holiday house. Mm -hmm. We had to call them and make sure that they were okay. Mm -hmm. So from that day, um, I remember the list started. Yeah. So we were just slowly adding to it down. It was probably a week, mm -hmm. a week and a half after that that we started really feeling like, oh, we have to have a list ready for these things, like noticing that we needed a list. So we yeah. do one. And then that was probably when we also were starting to get asked by, uh, mm -hmm. like, Doug. And, uh, okay, so that's just that's just so you were asked some questions by Delp. Now Delp is the department, mm -hmm. and you also mentioned some other organisations. Yeah, so uh, I'm pretty sure the local cops did ask us for a if we had a list or something. The Lions Club wanted a copy of a list mm -hmm. um, for I think donation reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so that was scary too because. I would have had to have forgotten someone on that list and then not get a donation. I understand. You know? Yes. So, uh, I felt like that could really be addressed. So, so, so with the list, um, what about the people who were still here in town but now had nowhere to be? Because their home had burnt down or the holiday house had been had burnt down. Yeah. Did you have a role in trying to help those people find somewhere to, somewhere to live? Uh, yes. Yeah, I believe we did because we're pretty lucky in Malakuta. We're a small community and we're all friends. Or we all know each other. And when it comes down to it, we're all going to help each other out, really. Yeah. So I suppose, like, those first, like, even that initial night after, you, if you knew someone had lost their home, it would be like, do you have somewhere to go? This was more as a friend role, I suppose, mm, mm, not as a mm. real estate role. So you would say you've got somewhere to go, you just make sure that everyone's okay. But yeah, after that, it was starting to tackle those things. So we did end up housing some locals in mm -hmm. emergency housing, mm -hmm. which was good. How many people do you think needed, needed emergency housing? Look, there was a fair few. Mm -hmm. um, we probably put emergency housing locals about... 12 or 15, maybe a lot of people we approached initially didn't want somebody to go to had a friends to stay up. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a list of properties that had landlords had contacted us about in this initial week after the bushfire saying, I want my property to be cleared of holiday bookings and you put emergency people in there. Right. We actually found that the people really utilising that those offers mm -hmm. was tourists that were staying in the hall because yep. that's where a lot of them went. Yep. So the Red Cross had set up down there mm -hmm. and the Red Cross would put, for example, we had this uh, young couple, 
that had a, a girl colleague who an a newborn, mm-hmm. and they were on this list to be maybe uh, ever there. So they, instead of sleeping in the hall, they went on a list and we all put them in emergency housing for a couple of nights right. until they could get out of the bed. So you've set up, um, you've provided the list to the different organisations yeah. and you're continuing to use the list as you're going on through the days and weeks after the after the fire's gone through. Yeah. What about money to help people pay for rentals? So obviously some were, were given rents in effect for free, it sounds like, or yeah. just have access to properties. But longer term, what kind of assistance was there for people who were left without, with nowhere to live? Yeah, so we kind of have discovered a few little things that are kind of brought up an issue that would have been better to not handle with. For example, we were putting people in emergency housing that um, probably didn't have access to grants and that due to lack of uh, ad- advertisement of these grants. Yep. Like I mentioned to you before, the DHHS grants the 12 weeks rent. Mm-hmm. So that one was where they would pay for a tenant's rent yes. for 12 weeks, three months, and also their bond. Now, there was, like, to the best of our knowledge, no uh, kind of advertisement of that. There was no way for the tenants to really find out. The DHHS did ask us for a list mm-hmm. of people that lost their homes, but it happened, like, a few weeks after. I see. And that's when we could go on to this grant, and then we contacted all our tenants and help that happen. Yeah. All right. So with the grant monies, how do you recall how the grant monies were distributed? Yeah. So in the case of that particular grant, um, it was the rent was paid into the tenant's account mm-hmm. and the bond was a, a check sent to us, to lodge with us, here they are. So the grant money is deposited in the tenant's account, but yeah. then yeah. presumably... The landlord needs to wait for the tenant monies to come yeah. across. So what we found a lot, um, it's kind of like we've set up all these tenancies and we're still waiting for rent. <laughs> so it's like you're waiting, 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 and these landlords, and some of them, we had to really, really, not, we had to really ask them if they would consider doing at least the 12 months mm-hmm. thing. Some, were, some offered up their property straight away. Right. Hands down, they wanted to help out anyway they could. And landlords have been excellent, really, for the most part. Um, but yeah, they were like, well, why haven't we seen this full amount of rent yet? And it's like, well, we haven't been paid. So, so there's some the delays in that. So of trying to chase up these people who have already been through hell to ask them for it. So we decided to call the DHHS to see if they have been paid the money because it was maybe a delay in them getting the grant. Mm-hmm. Maybe they couldn't afford it. That would makes sense, but they had mostly been all paid this rental amount. Well, do you know why they were not paying? Uh, I don't think it was... it was different for everybody? Yeah, it's different case to case, but I don't think that any of them purposely did pay it. I think that it was because um, uh, the bank is was not really open at all, or very sporadically through the whole thing. Uh, a lot of them were pretty old school in banking checks, so that, you know, could... Um, a lot of them, maybe more of the elderly tenants, right. mm-hmm. they had no access to online banking. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There was this one tenant that I had to go around and help her set up a whole internet banking, and she still doesn't really understand, but it's, yeah, it would be difficult. Uh, and you didn't have power for a couple of weeks either. No. And you didn't have internet uh, service. Yeah, that was hard. I see. Yeah. So those, those levels of complexity and 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 um, difficult yeah. for everyone to manage. We were pretty lucky. All the tenants that we had previously rented to before the bushfire, they kept paying their rent there. We are lucky. It's a small town, so you don't everyone in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you just kind of... Everyone's pretty good. Were there any troubles... Uh, getting everybody into a property or were, was there any problems with um, particular groups of tenants uh, finding it harder to find places to stay? Yes, definitely. We found that we had a lot of trouble housing single middle-aged men 
for some reason, there's just this stigma, and I don't know why, uh, that they're not good tenants. Okay. We are, we still are having trouble. Okay. Yeah. Um, but does that mean they're homeless? Uh, no, not really. In particular, we have this one gentleman who has to be out of his property and we have nowhere to put him. I see. So it's not that he's homeless, it's just that he has to be out and we don't have any way to offer him. I see. So... Um, has, so has it ultimately meant that it's just taken longer to place those people or those men or they've uh, gone elsewhere? It's taken longer, mm -hmm. definitely. Um, and it is harder because some landlords just think that they're not good tenants, mm -hmm. even though you can provide evidence that they are, in fact, great tenants from a real estate, like from an agency point of view. And then it was also quite like, Maybe the house that we had available was a full bedroom house right. and they can't afford the rent there. Mm. Like, then I know there was talk. There was, all, there was this talk of these portables being brought in for people, like that for single people or uh, maybe a small couple or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, but the portables were saying like 15 squares, like they were tiny, which right. is perfect, I suppose, when you do have nowhere to go, but it can be pretty down in the pressing being somewhere mm. that small. Yeah. Um, so we are tossed around the idea of, well, like, why is there no kind of incentive given to landlords to mm. take on a renter? Like, can't there be some kind of promise? I'm going to make sure that you get 12 months rent. May it be that um, some kind of organisation matches the, like to say your rent was two twenty a week, like maybe they add on it. Yeah, oh, that's mm -hmm. half or whatever, so that your the landlord is guaranteed to have that continuing rent, and maybe it means any damage is done will be rectified straight away. Did cool. you have any? Did you have any dealings with insurance companies in this process? Yeah, they're constantly contacting even now still mm -hmm. the office for claims and um, pictures and stuff like that. Organising with tenants the time when they can go in. Mm -hmm. yeah. And has that has that been a complicated process, or is it, or has it been okay? No, not not overly. Okay. Uh, mostly for our role in that dealing with the insurance company is just uh, corresponding for email. So All we right. have. I've heard uh, hard things with certain people dealing with their insurance. We did have insurance personally, so I don't know. So you didn't have insurance for your home or no. your contents? No contents. Insurance. So your surfboards and... Yeah. But we did get donated surfboards, which was lovely. Oh, that's... <laughs> By the Melbourne Board Riders, so that was, yeah, that, that was good. <laughs> so what, what have you done to... Um, have you had uh, any government or charitable assistance yourself, you and your partner uh, and your grandparents? Yeah, so I suppose when... With Nana Pop 2, the main issue was because we were two dwellings on the one property, I wanted to make sure that they got access to everything. Yeah. And I wanted them to have the first, I don't know, priority. I wanted, yeah, I would never want to take away from them. So it was a collective effort of the family kind of helping them mm -hmm. move through mm -hmm. uh, grants and things like that. So mm -hmm. we were fully aware of what we could go for. It was so busy after the bushfire. Uh, working the real estate like that could sometimes finish at nine or ten. We make at night. situations and you just get a call to go and these people, so you go down. So it was really hard time wise to kind of get financial help or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But when things started to slow down, it was a lot easier to because I requested documents and you didn't have the documents because they were and stuff like that. So that was easier to do when things slow down. So when the recovery was underway in the way you've just described where was your office located did you stay in the in the main road or were you at some other location uh when there was no power mm -hmm. we were operating from the Belkuda golf club because okay. they set up the large industrial generators and they are like golf club and summer town had power so we brought all of our computers there we worked from there every day and um, who else was there with you it was Kerry Warren, so my boss, mm -hmm. and then also Jenny Warren, who works in the office. 
And what about the other businesses or, or government agencies? Were they with you there as well? Uh, the golf club stayed open for people to come in and charge their phones or somewhere to chill out. We mm -hmm. also, because the generators were at, being kept at the golf club, they had to be monitored regularly by the army guys. So they were there, they were in the golf club. They actually slept in the golf club for a few weeks. How did, speaking about the Army, so the Australian Defence Force were deployed here with um, HMAS Tools and HMAS Sycamore as well as the um, uh, 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 aerial support as well. Um, did you have any dealings with them yourself? Only uh, when I was in the golf club and they would come in and chat mm -hmm. with us and also because they did have cars over here you like letting your car to go drive around it or things like that. So they were really lovely in the cafe. They came in all the time and it, uh, it was really good because it kind of kept business ticking along for my mum in that sense because mm -hmm. they did, they came in. And the they purchases were, coming, were they? Yeah. <laughs> and then also there was this uh, really awesome initiative, the World Central Kitchen. Oh, yes. What's that? Tell us about that. Uh, I'm trying to explain it the best I can. They're like an organisation that go to areas affected by an actual disaster and they even cook for everyone to come and get and things like that. But what they kind of initiated in Malacuta was this little card system that was given to locals and you could go into any of the eateries in town and one whole punch was $20. So to say that you had a card, you could go in and spend... Up to, and you get up to twenty dollars free, but you got that in five purchases. Yep. So that really brought a lot of locals and that back out supporting the local businesses. So it worked out really well. You, so you met with the commissioners on the nineteenth of March, yep. and it's now the fourth of May. Yep. Um, what's changed, if anything, in that time um, for you? Well, uh, no, from a real estate point of view. Yep. Where. Um, I'm kind of dreading in 12 months' time because we did a lot of tenancy agreements for a 12-month period. Right. Uh, so that's back in January and February? Yep, January okay. is when most of them started. Uh, and the issues that we will probably encounter at the end of these 12 months is landlords wanting to convert back to a holiday rental. I see. Yep. Uh, so you will in turn have the tenants be having to rehome the tenants. How would you describe what the work is on in terms of rebuilding? Oh, uh, so you hear some stories that it's moving quickly and you hear some stories that it's not. Personally, like my grandparents are going to rebuild mm -hmm. up where we were mm -hmm. and the GroCon is there at the moment doing the clean-up, so that should be done by the end of next week. Okay. And they're rebuilding through GJ Gardner Homes. It's uh, going to be the quickest and easiest thing, I think, for them because mm -hmm. they'll handle all the soil testing and things like that. And they've been told they'll most likely be in before the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So I feel like that's a fairly quick thing to be happening. Yep. But uh, some people, that's not the case, I suppose. They might be waiting a bit longer. So there's a possibility that in January, February next year, landlords wanting to move back to holiday rentals, hoping we're past both bushfires and yeah. COVID-19 season. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but there may be a lot of people left without yeah, places to stay. Mm -hmm. And you'll be doing what you had to do beginning of the year, potentially again. With no homes. <laughs> Yeah. Has there, um, are you aware of any planning going on, any department planning or any communications with the recovery agency about how to tackle that issue? But I've heard that the councillors are letting people live on their blocks uh -huh. in a, like a shed or a dwelling, so that's like in, stuff that we're In like temporary accommodation? Yeah. I so see. I got a call from uh, Windermere, I don't know if you've heard of the Windermere organisation. Uh -huh. They're kind of a, like agents for people who have lost their homes or been bushfire affected and they will help you find grants or they'll and just help you through certain processes. Mm -hmm. And they called and offered me and my partner a portable to put on a block. But we were like, we're one of the lucky ones that have shit to I see. live in. Um, so that's something I suppose. Is an agency like that, do you think, a, a, a helpful um, Definitely, yeah. tool? 
They were. They also were uh, initially assigned to the property being my grandparents. Mm-hmm. My grandparents, like, are lucky because they've got my dad and, like, me and my sister do. Ooh. We would do everything for them that Win and me would do for people, and I feel for people that don't have the support of their family. Mm-hmm. I think that Win and me have done really well. Okay. Yeah. And there are a lot of charitable organisations that were in helping in the immediate aftermath of the fires and the relief and then longer into the recovery effort. How do you, either just from your observation or talking with all the friends you've got here in town, how do, you, how do they deal with the, all these charities that, are, that have come to help? Um, some people are more willing to accept help than others. Mm-hmm. So that. Um, can I be honest with you, I went to one organisation with my grandparents and they were so uh, keen to make an emotional connection with them that they made them cry. Like mm-hmm. it was really overwhelming and overbearing and it was just so inappropriate. Some organisations have been great, like just took a step back, really understanding that the last thing you want is someone to be in your face and they've been really helpful but some were just trying to cancel you. And I think that, um, like, the access to counselling and services like that that are available after this sort of thing is, like, pretty expensive. Like, mm-hmm. you have every opportunity to go see someone if you want to. Yep. And I feel like that's a good thing, but not for it to be literally forced upon you. I see. I see. All the time. And it was. I would, you'd go somewhere and someone would be like, do you want to speak to a counsellor? I'm like, no, please, I'm just so fine. I've got it all sorted. And they'd be like, what about in three months? And I was like, I don't know how I'm going to feel in three months. Can you come away from me? Yeah, it's just really overbearing and uncomfortable. So you've already mentioned a, a whole lot of a lot of things. But looking back, are there any other things that you think maybe um, was important to try to fix or try to do better next time? Do you know what would be kind of... I don't know, if you look into it. But maybe a, um, no group, maybe making like a paid position, or two paid positions, because the position would involve ongoing training in how to react in ways that would help your particular community prior, during, and post natural disaster. So obviously bushfire would be one thing because we're a bushfire prone area. Mm. So like a community person from the community who's trained to deal and liaise with your community. I see. Because, like, for example, at the last forum, it was brought up that a lot of, uh, I suppose, at-risk people, like maybe elderly, dementia, things like that, uh, it was brought up that they were maybe left in their home or things like that. No one really... And I don't know if it's true or not because obviously I don't have anything to do with it, but this is what was said was that they were left in their home. Like the, this paid position or this role could be like they actually have a list there of uh, people at risk so that if anything like a flood, a bushfire happens, they can then delegate out to their correct uh, officers or departments to go and do that. You know, it's just... So that would help the recovery because you'd be better prepared yeah. in advance. And just they would kind of, through extensive training, I suppose, develop these procedures that would help things run more smoothly. Because it sounds a lot like you did that, untrained, but making the best of it. <laughs> I have no idea what I was doing. <laughs> That's uh, Yeah, well, I suppose, yeah, everyone did really well. It's just, it's always like hard stuff, hey? I think that also a lot of things, and I also don't know because I wasn't there, I was in the cafe, obviously, but I had friends that stayed on Turnover Drive yep. to fight the fire, and they had said that uh, the, the CFA were told not to defend past this point. Mm-hmm. So you had a lot of locals that were defending it with, themselves. Yeah. Right. And to my understanding, they were getting uh, instructions from an organisation of, like, out of Malakia. So I feel that maybe giving a bit more 
power to locals or, you know, something like that, it, it could have been more beneficial, I think. And where do you think, where do you hope Mallacoota will be this time next year? Um, How do you think the community would best be placed? Uh, well, I hope that we have the COVID-19 stuff is not this true, but I don't know, I feel like right before the regulations got brought in, it really felt like things were going back to normal a little bit. Uh, everyone was starting to go back to work. Um, it was starting to just feel a bit more normal. Mm -hmm. So I hope that we can get back there. I hope that I'm seeing a lot of people rebuild and be in their homes. That would be lovely. Mm. Uh, I hope to not see locals internally fighting because everyone's quite verbal on their opinion <laughs> of what should be cleared or not. <laughs> like, you know, I just, yeah, just hope that we are all kind of getting together. It'd be nice to, yeah, maybe see certain things implemented to create more of a local uh, presence surrounding uh, bushfires and I suppose management of uh, just trips to the forest, forestry and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Mm -hmm. It'd be nice to have more local knowledge because really decisions are made in an office somewhere else than mm -hmm. here. Is there something you'd like the commissioners to know, something else you'd like them to, them to know or to, to remember about Mallacoota? I suppose, like, a lot of people holiday here for how beautiful it is and how kind of data oriented it is. Like, we have a, a large area that's national park and it's just mm -hmm. beautiful. We have so many species of birds and just natives. And it's like, I would just like Mallacoota to keep that kind of integrity because it would be very sad to see everything kind of destroyed through, I don't know how to say it differently, but you know what I mean. <laughs> I don't want everything to be cleared out completely because that's why people come here. And at the end of the day, I do feel like a bushfire is a natural disaster, so it's going to happen. Certain things fry from it. Mm. It's just trying to implement procedures to make it less traumatic for people and maybe less damage. Well, thanks very much. That's okay. It's been really good to speak with you.